And uh, Janine, at this point, I'll probably just go ahead um, and let's go ahead and get uh, folks in the waiting room admitted and worry about getting them renamed later, okay? Okay, at least get the ones that are at least for a public forum. I'll probably just go ahead and let's go ahead and get folks in the waiting room admitted and worry about getting them renamed. N not a problem. Later. At least get okay. the one. At least get the ones that are okay. the public forum. At least get the ones that are at least for a public forum. Point, I'll probably just go ahead. Uh, Janine, I think you have a loop going on. Chair Escavel, I'm not sure if you noticed, but you do have a quorum, and if you'd like, I think we're in a position to go ahead and proceed.
Yes, thank you, Mr. Laffer. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joaquin Esquivel. I'm chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. Today is Tuesday, May 18th. It is 9.02 a.m. and I would like to call this meeting to order. I'd first like to begin by quickly introducing my fellow colleagues. With me today is Vice Chair Doreen Diadamo, Board Member Sean McGuire, and Board Member Laurel Firestone. With us today is also our Chief Counsel, Michael Laffer, our Executive Director, Eileen Sobeck, our two Chief Deputies, Eric Oppenheimer and Jonathan Bishop, Joining us today is also Janine Townsend, the Clerk of the Board, and assisting her are Margie Ardell and Courtney Tyler. I want to begin by the obvious. This uh, webcast is being uh, recorded and um, uh, webcast, obviously. And so please do speak uh, clearly into the microphone uh, or your phone uh, when you uh, come up to speak. Uh, you will, everyone is currently muted and off camera. Uh, we do have today, I will note, Somewhere on the order of, it's looking like uh, nearly 80 public commenters for all of our items. That includes about 20 public comment uh, items here at the top. So in a moment, we'll uh, discuss how best to uh, walk through those. But as you can see, this is a remote uh, meeting. We're here in the Zoom platform. You're either tuning in one of two ways. You're looking, uh, viewing through one of our webcasts on the Cal EPA website or YouTube Live, or you're here on the Zoom platform with us. If you intend to comment on any item on today's agenda, you need to be here on the platform with us. There are instructions at the top of today's agenda on how to get a password and uh, enter in a speaker card so we can appropriately match your name with who you are and call you up uh, when your time is uh, ready to do so on your item. Well, with that out of the way, uh, let's just go ahead and move into public forum. Um, as we've been indicating on our agenda for a few meetings now, um, it is at the discretion of the chair uh, to take at this point 30 minutes of public comment and then uh, have to, and I apologize for this, likely move a number of folks either to, and I, I notice on public forum here, uh, there may be a number of folks wanting to discuss drought and or current operations or, or everything that we know is uh, complicatedly happening currently. And um, I would say that um, it, it is best to discuss that at the drought item. Um, if there are other things um, that uh, folks want to bring up now in public forum that aren't going to be discussed later at our drought item or likely to be or um, maybe best fitted, I would just ask uh, folks uh, look to try to move their public forum comment to item number five. Um, and that is scheduled to begin at about two o'clock. Uh, we may have to reorder today's agenda. Uh, we have a, a SACWIS update here, uh, our once through cooling policy. There, we have a pretty large tranche of folks that are looking to comment. And so we'll likely, you know, take us into early afternoon uh, just uh, to get through those. So I want to be quick here with public comment. I, I apologize, you know, public forum is here um, as a, a courtesy to allow folks to bring things up to the board that uh, we wouldn't necessarily hear otherwise, or that we don't have calendared or are going to speak to at another moment. Uh, so as to allow everybody to be prepared for various discussions. I know the drought item, was a little vague and was you know, hard to, I think, for most folks understand if it's going to be about operations or Sacramento River temperature management or, you know, all of it. And, and it, we're going to do our best to try to bring folks up to speed with what has been a lot of discussion since certainly the, the governor's um, executive order just last week. Um, and then uh, otherwise, um, a, a lot of drought activity happening. So um, that being said, we can uh, move then into public forum. And again, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to limit it to about 30 minutes. I see here, at least at this time, we have about uh, 23 public commenters. Um, and so we will just take them in order as received. And as I call you up, if you do feel, and you know, please do, um, if this is more appropriate to be part of the drought item, just let us know that and we can move on to the next person who may be uh, flagging something that won't be part of a discussion later today. Um, with that, let's begin. I believe our, our first person up is uh, Davis Harper. Chair, Chair Esquivel, I just, uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, just wondering if you had a time, um, time limit that you wanted to establish for the public forum speakers today. Yeah, we can go ahead and say if folks, I mean, if, uh, if people can keep it to three minutes, that'd be best. And then otherwise, um, even two minutes um, would be very helpful to everybody. We have, um, it's not just here in public forum, we're, we're hearing from folks. Uh, we again have um, 
uh, a number of items. We have 75 individuals today that will be looking to speak before the board. So I, I'm really asking everyone to please try to be succinct um, and, and try to be additive as well. Um, and thank you for that board member. So uh, three minutes uh, and, and otherwise, you know, try to keep it to two, please. Um, and so we'll start well, with Mr. Davis Harper. And as you can see, uh, for those of you on the platform with us, uh, there is a scroll here. So it can help you sort of prepare and know kind of when you'll be coming up. And at some point here, I'll, I'll, we'll be just watching the clock um, at about 940. We'll try to transition uh, to uh, actual board business here. Mr. Harper, good morning. Glad you can join us. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Esquivel and board members. Uh, my name is Davis Harper. I live in Stockton and, and I'm here to express my concern about proposed management of the Delta as we face a severe drought. Uh, with extreme heat projected to continually increase in one of the hottest parts of the state here in Stockton, toxic algal blooms are proliferating in our waterways, especially in the summer. And this is far more than just an aesthetic or a you know, recreational issue. It's a water and air quality crisis that would be exacerbated by installing new salt barriers. Um, a significant, significant number of unsheltered people who live along the waterways here in Stockton are exposed to these algal, algal blooms. Um, and they admit neurogenic toxins that make it harder to breathe. So I'm sure you're aware that formerly redlined communities in Stockton already endure some of the most toxic air quality and highest rates of respiratory illnesses, poverty, housing insecurity, and unemployment in California. Uh, suspending Delta water quality standards would lead to further air and water pollution for communities who live in and around the Delta. And we understand the need to share drinking water with San Joaquin Valley communities, and especially those who lack access to clean water, but Southern California has enough water in stores to temporarily fill that need. Our water rights system was designed in an era with a drastically different climate to serve the interests of an unsustainable uh, cattle empire. We relied on a full Sierra snowpack to melt in the spring and summer to feed streams and meet irrigation needs. That reliability no longer exists. What we're left with today is an inequitable, inefficient system that leaves communities with polluted air and water, devastated fisheries, and a biologically depleted estuary. To address these concerns, I'm requesting that the State Water Board implement the first phase of the Bay Delta Plan passed by this board at the end of 2018 to establish standards to protect our communities because drought conditions are the new normal. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for joining us this morning, Mr. Harper. And thank you for your comments. Next, we have Barbara Berrigan Perea. Uh, good morning. Thank you, um, Chair Esquivel. Um, and uh, board members Barbara Berrigan Perea with Restore the Delta. Um, I would like to say that we want to echo the comments that was made, um, uh, the comments that were just made by uh, Davis Harper. And uh, you know what? I think I will hold my comments for the two o'clock session. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Ms. Berrigan Perea. And um, then we'll see you uh, then at two o'clock. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Matt Holmes. All right, there it goes. Uh, thanks, Chair Escobel and members of the board. Um, oh, I'll start my video as well. Um, yeah, thanks for this opportunity to comment. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm commenting as a resident of Stockton and uh, someone who works in the nonprofit sector in South Stockton on environmental justice issues. And so I, I'm not surprised that um, our side of town and our region of the state seems to be uh, a lower concern than many of the other parts of the state when it comes to this agency's decisions on how to allocate water quality. Um, so, and I'm also a member of the Delta National Heritage Area Advisory Committee. And so, you know, I'm, I'm on the one hand trying to advocate for the preservation of the Delta and its historic uses. And at the same time, seeing this uh, looming drought crisis come to a head here in California. Uh, and I'm, and I, I, I go back to the Bay Delta plan and I'm thinking, oh, there, there is sort of a solution for prioritizing this region. And so, you know, actually Davis made a lot of the comments that, that I would probably make about water flows and harmful algal blooms. I just want to highlight that um, those of us that live here don't really get to access the Delta, but it seems like the Delta is freely shipped all over the state to address other people's problems. Um, and, you know, we're all in this together. We absolutely appreciate that Delta water is necessary for, you know, our fellow communities around the state as drinking water. Uh, but when it comes to profiteering industries like nut ranchers and, you know, beef, beef uh, rate, you know, uh, cattle ranchers uh, and the wine peddlers, 
you know, uh, business, if everybody else has to come to a screeching halt, maybe business does too. And I actually think there's some, some missing cost benefit analysis and all of this. We know those guys are, um, you know, they're in it for the money. So it might be easier just to pay them and have them forego their water this year, or at least help them trigger their insurance. Um, I, I, I think this estuary that you see behind me here um, has so much more potential and it's being used as sort of a, a credit account that people get to draw down on and ship off to other folks that are just pocketing their cash out of this region. And, um, you know, I'm just here to let you know that we're, we're taking a greater interest in our Delta. Uh, and we want to be seen as one of the uh, first class regions of California. We're tired of being a second class California. Uh, we're an environmental justice community. We deserve equal treatment with, you know, Imperial, Fresno, Los Angeles, and the Bay Area. And so uh, here to lend my voice to this cause. We're, uh, we're starting to watch the ball. Thank you. Glad uh, for your participation. And thank you, Mr. Holmes. Appreciate your time this morning. Next, we have Susan Little. Thank you. Um, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, board, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Uh, I'm here. Hold on. Excuse me, I'm sorry, some technical thing. Okay. I thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Um, I'm here to express concerns about the board's handling of lead service line removals in California. We raised these concerns in a letter to the board dated May 11th. First, I'd like to re reiterate the well-documented effects of lead exposure. Small amounts of lead in children can cause lasting neurological harm and learning and behavioral problems. It can also slow growth and damage hearing. Lead in adults can also cause an array of problems, including cardiovascular, kidney, and reproductive problems, as well as high blood pressure and higher cholesterol. Again, the terrible effects, health effects caused by lead are well documented. I think we can all agree then that we don't want lead in our water or plumbing system, but how we go about removing the lead from our pipes and fittings is the challenge. If leaded parts are not removed in a health protective manner, lead can dislodge from the pipes, fittings and corrosive materials and, corrosive materials and contaminate water during and well after replacement activity. Depending on what's replaced, lead can continue to contaminate water for many months. If a partial lead line replacement is done, in which part of the lead line remains in the ground, then lead levels can remain high for as long as 18 months. And we fear both of these things are happening in California right now. Although the state law requiring systems to inventory and plan to replace their lines does not impose any health and safety requirement on systems, State law does require systems to, quote, provide a reliable and adequate supply of pure, wholesome, healthful, and potable water. We've asked the board and its division of drinking water to ensure that systems comply with this very reasonable mandate. I'm here today on behalf of the Environmental Working Group and others to verbally ask the board and the division to do so. Because the board and division did not fully inform or engage the public in its decisions surrounding lead service line replacements, the Environmental Working Group and the Natural Resources Defense Council submitted numerous Public Records Act requests to the board and to individual water systems to find out more about lead service line replacements occurring in the state. What we've discovered from the Public Records Act responses greatly concerns us. First, the Division of Drinking Water's approvals of more than 96 systems lead service line replacements imposed inadequate and inconsistent health and safety requirements from one system to another. Some systems were required to notify customers about replacements and others were not. Some systems were required to provide filters and then only three months of refills to customers and others were not. Some systems had to receive prior approval from the division to perform partial replacements and others did not. In whole, the approvals arbitrarily provided health and safety protections to some communities, but not to others. Secondly, because the, because the division did not direct systems to comply with any health and safety protections, protections until the summer of 2020, over three years after inventories began, some water systems began replacing lead lines without any directions. Sacramento in particular is an example of this problem. The city's many lead service lines are now gone, but it appears that citizens were not informed of the lead line removal activity. 
Over 5,000 lines <clears throat> were recently removed or investigated in East Sacramento, and that homeowners association representing the community has informed us that residents were not made aware of the activity. Finally, the information the board and division relied upon when approving the lead service line removals was sparse. All of the lead lines and fittings, more than 100,000, were categorized as unknown. As a result, consumers cannot ascertain their level of risk when reviewing the lead replacement timelines or maps. Overall, we, we view the board's and division's management of the state's lead service line removal effort as more than problematic. At this point, given the inconsistent approvals, lack of public health protections and incomplete information, as well as public um, engagement about public risk, we would consider the effort to be a failure. It has not protected public health and it does not comply with state law. But changes can be made to ensure that the remaining replacements occur in a health protective manner. We would ask that the board and division one, stop any partial lead service line replacements, the most dangerous activity. Funds are available to ensure that all of the lead in the service line is replaced simultaneously. That this is until funds are available to ensure that all of the lead in the service line is replaced simultaneously. And the board should also support our budget request for more funding for this. Also ensure that any more replacement activity be done in a transparent manner with public notice, notice happening well in advance, the provision of filters and many months of refills. Finally, we would ask the board to place the issue of lead service line removal in California on the board's next agenda to discuss publicly. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to make these comments. Thank you, Ms. Little. Really appreciate your comments this morning and, and bringing this to uh, my attention. It's, I think, the first time I had uh, heard that there was such systemic concern with uh, the program. So really appreciate the flag and look forward to hearing from the Division of Drinking Water about the issue and uh, look forward to further discussion with you as well about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Evan Fern. Hello. <laughs> uh, so Chair Esquivel and board members, I'm Evan Fern and I work for Little Manila Rising uh, and I do environmental justice work in South Stockton. I live in Stockton uh, and I'm present to express my disappointment over management of the Delta as the drought crisis worsens. Much of your focus has been on the profits of companies that use large quantities of water unsustainably uh, and are essentially shipping it out of California when we need it the most. Uh, but you should focus also on the people in California who need this water for all other uses. When you suspend water quality standards in the Delta, you cause a direct negative impact on the people who live here. It shows a lack of care for our well-being in many cases. People in Stockton deserve water that we can enjoy using, let alone be around safely. We should be able to swim and ride boats and fish, but we're surrounded by water that we can't even use. There aren't enough flows, so a buildup of harmful algal blooms can make us sick and even kill our most vulnerable. When you only think about agricultural economic interests, you're ignoring every other Californian who deserves clean and safe water, especially in environmental justice communities like most of Stockton. I'm asking that you enact the Bay Delta Plan. Drought measures without a plan or funding for the Delta's air and water quality crisis will continue to harm us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fern. And I do wanna say that um, I, I know that it can seem, or at least I'm hearing from a couple of our public commenters that this board is overly concerned with any one sector or any one impact, uh, particularly in the middle of this drought. And just you know, for, for, for record, uh, at least very personally to me, take uh, the balance that we're called to, 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 to make and strike as a whole, but certainly in these tough conditions where uh, the drought is causing extreme circumstances, not just in California and the West, um, but I'm hearing the frustration. And so take uh, the criticism um, well as well. But just do know, uh, I think for, for me particularly, it is um, an incredibly difficult balance. Um, but and we'll uh, certainly talk more about it uh, on item number five. Uh, next, I'd like to call up uh, Natalia Barasa. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Chair Esquivel and board members. I am Natalia Barraza and I'm a climate water advocate with Restore the Delta. I've spoken to the board twice before about the need to pass the Bay Delta plan and this plan is important now more than ever. I'm speaking here today to ask that you please move forward with finishing this plan and stop waiting for others who don't live in the Delta to make decisions about the Delta's water quality conditions. Our fisheries are crashing and the water quality is getting more toxic and harmful for the communities in the Delta and for the animals that live in the water. Despite the declaration of a drought that Governor Gavin Newsom 
Hughes and stated, the governor and the Department of Water Resources are making crucial mistakes in the management of the Delta. The state of California has violated water quality standards in the Delta three in the last 10 years using drought emergency orders, but three, but seven of those 10 years, the state has violated water quality standards. Harmful algal blooms worsen year after year, and yet the governor's drought plan has no funding to deal with this water and air quality crisis in the Delta. In Stockton, black and brown communities have the highest rates of asthma and have will only worsen the air quality. We are the ones who have to live with the pollution. Orders to suspend water quality standards for the Delta shows how little the state cares about the people of the estuary. Saltwater barriers during the last drought made water conditions worse. The board needs to implement and complete the Bay Delta plan because without proper water quality, there will be a mass extinction of the fisheries in the Delta. Our people and communities matter and we understand the need to share the drinking water with San Joaquin Valley and environmental justice communities during this drought. We need this board to be courageous to enforce the law and to follow the science and to stop caving to political pressure. My generation deserves better. California deserves a restored and protected estuary. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Ms. Barasa. I appreciate it. Much of uh, the comments and concerns that you shared with us here, we'll be exploring further and actually discussing on item number five. And so um, just want to know that uh, it's not a for a lack of desire that I'm not wanting to respond um, to, to some of your concerns and know that it will be central to our discussion uh, later today. Uh, next, we have Dylan uh, Delvo. Hello, Chair Esquivel and uh, board members. Um, my name is Dylan Delvo and I'm the executive director of Little Manila Rising in Stockton. I'm here to comment on the Bay Delta plan as well and echo some of the uh, thoughts that have been shared and uh, the management of Delta water. Uh, my comments are rooted in the fact that residents of South Stockton die years earlier than the rest of the state as a direct result of environmental pollution. As a member of Stockton's AB 617 Community Steering Committee, we know that decades of chronic air pollution are made worse by harmful algal blooms that are a direct result of water exports. HABs worsen air quality. Our people already live with the highest rates of asthma in California. And so we're asking, where is your plan to protect us? Um, and yet somehow the current plan has no funding to deal with this constant water and air quality crisis in the Delta. I understand that Delta water helps provide emergency drinking water in the San Joaquin Valley we seem to get Delta water pumped out every time there's a crisis because ag interests never have to tighten their belt. Uh, we do not object to deliveries when it comes to drinking water for people um, and our brothers and sisters, but thirsty corporate in interests should not outweigh our community's health. Here at Little Manila Rising, we fight for the dignity of the human lives who live in South Stockton. We come from a history of marginalization and racial injustice it is a history we don't wanna take into our future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delvo. Appreciate your time this morning. Next, we have Catherine Perea. Good morning, Chair Escoval and board members. My name is Catherine Perea, and I am a climate water advocate with Restore the Delta. As a resident of Stockton, I am here speaking today to express my concern regarding the current management of our Bay Delta estuary during the worsening drought crisis and the lack of implementation of the Bay Delta plan. Each year we witness an increase in the toxic algal blooms and worsening air conditions, and yet the government's drought plan addresses neither of these issues in the Delta. Orders to suspend water quality standards for the Delta shows how little the state cares about the people of the estuary, and yet we are the ones who have to live with the pollution. Stockton residents recognize the importance of sharing our water with other impacted environmental justice communities of San Joaquin Valley. However, urbanized Southern California currently has a record 3.2 million acre feet of water in reserve, enough to serve the population's needs for most of the next two years, which begs the question as to why we are sending 650,000 acre feet of Delta water to exchange contractors due to a water rights system meant to maintain institutionalized racism from the reconstruction era. To Stockton residents, it appears that our state government, and by extension this board, are perfectly fine with maintaining systems of oppression that will severely impact our black and brown residents, both economically and environmentally. For many Stocktonians, their lives and the existence of the Bay Delta are intertwined. And without aid, we are at risk of a serious environmental and public health crisis. Furthermore, if our fisheries and water quality are destroyed, these issues will not only be contained to Stockton, but will spread throughout the Delta. So I would like to ask today if that's what you have all decided to represent, 
I think it's time to prioritize residents over profit and frankly for you to care about us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perea. I appreciate your comments this morning. Next, we have Mike Berry. And Chair Escobar, we have asked uh, Mr. Berry to unmute. He appears to be on a phone. Uh, so Mr. Berry on the phone, it would be, I believe, uh, star six to unmute. Chair Escavell, I'd recommend moving on and maybe yep. we can try Mr. Perry again. Yep, thank you. Uh, next we have Jasmine Leak. And we've likewise asked and provided the opportunity to unmute And I would probably move on to the next speaker at this point. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Alexandra Beering. Um, good morning, Chair Esquivel and board members. I will defer my comments to the drought section because they primarily deal with operations during drought. So thank you. Thank you, I'm much appreciated. See you this afternoon. Next, we have Davis Harper. Oh, I apologize. Mr. Harper is actually twice on my list. So we do not have uh, Mr. Harper. Again. Or this is a different uh, David Harper. So I apologize a second time. And perhaps yeah, I don't no, know what happened. If I, yeah, I OK, think I, think I think it's just on there twice. Oh, sorry about that. OK, oh, OK, then it's Moro, uh, Moro Kut Oi. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chair Esquivel and board members. Thank you for um, giving me this opportunity to make a comment. Uh, my name is Morkat Uy. It was a good try. Um, I am with Third City Coalition in Stockton, California. Um, I am here today commenting um, as a resident of you know, the Delta communities. Um, I am with Third City as Rye Stockton Engagement Coordinator. Um, Rye Stockton Coalition is a coalition of environmental justice organizations in Stockton. And so I am very, very well aware and very well informed of the environmental justice concerns in, in my community. Um, and some of those concerns are being brought up with the management of the Delta, um, especially as the drought crisis worsens. Um, you know, in, in my work, we have we've come across a lot of reports. Um, the Delta Stewardship Council released their Delta ADAPTS um, vulnerability assessment of the Delta. And so, you know, there, there is science, there is research around the, the disproportionate impacts that EJ communities in Stockton face, whether it's from the drought crisis, whether it's from flood risk, um, a lot of the concerns that Stockton residents have already voiced around harmful algal blooms, um, air quality pollution are, are also mentioned, you know, in this vulnerability assessment. And so we are well aware of like the, the high health risks that people in my community face. And so um, I would just like to see the, the health of my community, the needs of my community prioritized. Um, I, I reiterate what people have already mentioned um, in terms of the Bay Delta Plan being an existing document that that identifies and outlines, you know, enforcement standards um, for flows of the San Joaquin River um, that would protect my community. And I would I would like to see this board, and I would like to see the state take into account already existing assessments and measures um, that would protect my community. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the time this morning. Much appreciated. Uh, next, we have uh, Francisco Arago. And Chair Escobel, uh, 
Francesco appears to have submitted a speaker card for public forum, but it appears to be actually related to item number four. So I'm going to okay. confirm, um, we'll provide Francesco the opportunity to unmute at this point, but I believe you wanted to speak on item number four, the cooling water intake issue. Is that correct? Uh, good morning. Yes, that, that is correct. Okay. okay. So we'll get you into the queue for that item. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you both. Uh, then I believe next we have Conrad Fisher. Hi, thank you. Um, trying to fix this. Um, so at the last at the last meeting, we all heard heartfelt uh, testimony about the impacts of inadequate flows in the Klamath River and Klamath River tributaries. Um, I kind of wanted to follow up on that and ask the board what it will take to take action on this. This has been going on for 30 years um, in terms of science being going on and the water board being asked to take action. Um, and I would like to request that you put it on the next agenda or explain what it will take to get it on the agenda to take action. The science is on our side, the law is on your side. So please let us know what is left. Um, Chair Esquivel has rightfully quoted Martin Luther King in, in previous meetings, the arc of the moral universe is long but bends towards justice. Um, in this particular case, uh, there is a historic injustice in terms of how much water was allocated in California. So if we, if we need, want, are going to have justice now, this body needs to take action. Um, it is up to you to address the historic injustice. Um, and there is one example where there, it's, it's on your doorstep on a silver, silver platter um, on May 3rd, California Fish and Game gave you a letter uh, summarizing all of the science and saying, asking specifically, historically, please take immediate action on the Scott River. It goes dry every summer. Uh, three days later, the Water Board sent a notice of unavailability to certain water users, but that was not intended to, nor will it keep the, the river flowing. That notice of unavailability is a great first step. It will not keep the river flowing. Please take, use your existing power to make curtailments um, to keep the Shasta River flowing. Um, right now, today, there is an insane amount of waste going on in the Shasta River. It's almost as if people are using more just to spite California and to spite people. Uh, I would encourage you, take a drive to Fort Jones, take a drive around there, see what's happening. Hopefully it will impact you. Also right now, Sigma implementation is occurring on the Scott and the Shasta, and it's not happening properly because you have not quantified in-stream flow requirements. So now it's up to the local GSAs to try to guess what the law requires. Well, it's your job to say what the law requires, so please, please do it. Um, and the same goes for the Shasta River and there are opportunities in the upper Sacramento, there's waste and unreasonable use going on. So my question, can you answer, what will it take to have this board put it on the agenda and take a vote and take action on what everybody was asking you to do at the last meeting? What will it take? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Fisher. Regrettably, it's not as easy as a vote for the board currently, but those notices of water unavailability are a first step to curtailment and a really important one. It's ministerial, but it is really important because we have to do that to get to then a space where we're curtailing. And we're doing our best with the resources we have to really try to drive what are a number of issues with throughout our watersheds through this drought. Um, Mr. Lawfer, is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, it was more a housekeeping issue. Uh, we do have uh, both Mike Berry and Jasmine Leak appear to have been successful in unmuting. So if you wanted to resume with them when you get a chance. Okay, thank you. Yes, let's, uh, let's transition back to them. And thank you, Mr. Fisher, for your comments this morning, though, and for continuing to be a partner in the watershed. So I think we can uh, go back to, uh, I believe it was uh, Mr. Mike Berry. Hello. Good morning. Can you hear me now? We can. Good morning. Uh, hi, I'm Mike Berry. I'm a retired senior environmental scientist with California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Water Resources. I just wanted to talk a bit about uh, cooperation instead of regulation. Um, you know, in, in years of drought like this, there's not enough water to go around, period. Uh, for fish or ag or human consumption. Um, you know, one of the things that we've done over the years is restoration projects on the upper river uh, to mitigate for the lower flows by opening up 
uh, several miles of side channel, which creates several hundred acres of juvenile rearing habitat. And by reaching out to partners uh, like the water users, uh, GCID in particular, uh, we found that we can put a team together, uh, educate uh, the, the irrigation districts on what fish need, uh, work with them on uh, you know, why it's important to cooperate uh, instead of just be regulated. And um, to that, we're also learning more about the ag community and what they need. So, you know, when we get into our camps and, and each one 100 percent and try to do it through lawyers and regulations, et cetera, uh, I found over 30 years of doing restoration projects that it's a lot better to reach across the aisle, find the common goals uh, for each industry from ag to fish to uh, the regulatory agencies, and uh, really just wanted to uh, express that, uh, you know, during during these droughts, we we all need to come together and learn about each other's industries, uh, what's needed. Uh, folks like GCID have been great partners, um, you know, in this, and I think we need to reach out more, uh, you know, to that type of thing. Thank you, Mr. Barry. I appreciate your comments this morning. Um, yeah, I think for me, I think you hear a lot of, about collaboration, certainly from from this board and from from this seat. But um, but just caution that it's not a it's not a false dichotomy between collaboration and, and regulatory approaches. I think it's always about all the tools that we have, and um, always premised on common outcomes amongst us all that we can better drive to by knowing each other's self interest, but importantly understanding what it is above all our self-interest it is that we're driving toward. So thank you, Mr. Barry. Next, we have Jasmine Leak. And in the intervening few moments there, uh, Jasmine appears to have dropped off the line. So. I, apologize, I apologize, Jasmine. Um, do try to get on back if you would like to uh, make sure and comment. I'll flag now, we are approaching 940. Um, when I would said, and when I said we would uh, begin to cut uh, folks off, and I apologize, we'll have to either take the rest of the comments um, at some point interspersed here uh, in our items. Once we, you know, get through a, a few items here and get to our agenda, and we can see where where things are landing. I, I don't mean to. Um, hopefully, it, it won't be pushed toward the back here. Let me quickly just count up how many folks we have. I think left, starting with Linda Webb. It's like one, two, three. I mean, if um, it looks like a couple of these may be around drought, and then I again, I encourage folks to really join us for our discussion on item number five, because it'll be a little more fulfilling than just uh, kind of hearing you here at public comment. Um, it looks like there's about six or so folks left. So let's, if we can um, kind of commit to about two minutes or three minutes a piece, I'm fine just uh, quickly getting through these so that we can uh, get onto the rest of our agenda and not leave folks hanging out. Um, but ask that uh, we, we move through quickly. And if it is, again, about drought, about operations, um, then let's please uh, tuck that into item number five. Uh, so we'll go ahead and quickly go to, um, I think next was Linda Webb on, uh, yes, on the comment cards. Yes, hi, good morning. Thank you, Chair Escobar. Um, I'll be brief and I could come back at two because I am talking about the drought in the Shasta River where I live. Um, it's my best to deliver them now. I think we're, it's gonna be maybe more Delta focused. So um, yeah, so okay. please, please take your time now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, uh, my husband and I bought a, a piece of property at the mouth of the Shasta River years ago. Um, because we could see that wildlife was going to need a place where the water rights were um, left in the river rather than taking the water out. And this year that has certainly come to be true. We were down there at our place a couple weeks ago where we've given access for scientific studies to the tribes, numerous universities, uh, the USGS has its station, gauging station there. California Fish and Wildlife have their rotary screw trap there. We were at that trap and watched juvenile coho and Chinook salmon 
trying to get out of the river, some of them dying because of the high water temperatures that have led to the algal bloom, which is choking the river and choking the fish. They're dying before they can get out. Those coho salmon are threatened. They're hanging by just a thinnest thread. And I don't want any of us to be standing by while we watch another species go extinct. I'm here to ask you to make sure that doesn't happen on your watch and demand an interim in-stream flow now for the Shasta River, please, um, before it's too late for one more species. Right now, we are watching water diverted, sitting in the sun in cattle fields, getting hot, getting dirty. What tailwater is allowed to return to the river is filthy and too hot for the fish to survive. And now we have a river that used to be uh, one of the highest producing salmon streams on the West Coast. And now it's barely surviving to put any fish out into the ocean again. We need an interim in stream flow requirement now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Webb. I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, let's, next, we have Larry uh, Domenehi. Domenehi, I apologize. Oh, that's OK. Can you hear me? We can, good morning. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board for this opportunity to comment. My name is Larry Dominigini. I'm part of a third generation family farm in the Willows area. We raise rice, corn, wheat, alfalfa, and almonds. Part of our family farm is in the Glen Clusa Irrigation District. I'm speaking today in support of the efforts of GCID and its fellow irrigation districts in the Sacramento Valley in managing their operations in order to balance the diverse needs of our region. Let me be clear, we all recognize and support the efforts to provide water for our environmental needs. How that is achieved is a question to be answered. I've been around long enough to remember when Phase 8 and CalFed were going to be the solutions to our need to balance the demands of both agriculture and the environment, but here we are today. However, I have been around long enough to see the development of a flexible partnering and collaborative approach to solve our needs. Water managers have learned how to better manage critically dry years and avoid redirecting impacts to communities, the environment, the species, the farming, and the groundwater in the Sacramento Valley. Solution-based environmental organizations are also leading efforts to provide results through a collaborative approach. This has enabled the various agencies in the Sac Valley community to work together to improve our fishery and waterfowl conditions. This partnership approach is showing results and it must be continued. It is the solution that has demonstrated that flexibility will work. We embrace a flexible approach and must move away from a confrontational us versus them or a rigid either or type of framework that is ultimately counterproductive. I'm the board president of the Calusa Glen Subwatershed Program, part of the Sacramento Valley Water Quality Coalition. For almost 20 years, we have been implementing the requirements of the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program with much success. This has been achieved because of the flexibility in the implementation of the program. Flexibility has been the key to success. It always is. I use the phrase Sacramento Valley community. We are a community in the valley with many various components that need to be taken care of. Besides wearing a farmer hat for my day job, my other job is as the mayor of the city of Willows. Agriculture is a $1.5 billion industry in Glen County, provides over 5,500 jobs, and is a vital component of the Willows economy. The communities in the valley are economically, socially, and culturally dependent upon agriculture in various degrees. Willows and the Sacramento Valley as a whole require that the needs of our environment, our industry, and our communities be met in a balanced, flexible method. I have heard that in the military, there is a saying that, quote, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy, unquote. I would alter that to say that, quote, no rigid regulatory framework will survive contact with mother nature, unquote. I urge the board to embrace a collaborative, innovative, flexible, and solution-based approach that GCID, the other Sac River settlement contractors, and their environmental organization partners and governmental agency partners have been engaged in. It is the approach that is showing positive results in the Sacramento Valley. It is vital to the eventual success of our Sac Valley community that this is how we approach not just Sacramento River temperature management, but all of the many complicated issues before you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your time this morning. Much appreciated. 
Uh, next, we have Lorraine Marsh. Hello, my name is Lorraine Marsh. I'm a retired economist from the California Department of Water Resources. I'm also a family farmer in Arbuckle, California. About 20 years ago, my husband and I would grab our one-year-old child after we got home from work, put her in a playpen while we fixed up an old rental house. We were able to trade that rental house for a small old orchard, which we tore out the old orchard, installed state-of-the-art for the time irrigation equipment, a new, new trees, and we began our journey to our currently medium-sized commercial farm. I'm here to speak in support of how GCID and other districts up and down the Sacramento Valley manage operations to, ban, to balance the many important needs for water. Much has been learned from the last several droughts. I have been involved on both sides, both with the, with the Department of Water Resources and as a farmer. The key to solving our water's problems um, is for both the environmental groups, the cities and the agricultural community to work together. We all know there isn't enough water for any one group to win. And if we are, spend all our energies focused on winning, we won't solve any of the problems. We strongly support efforts to provide water for birds and environmental uses. Our own operation has engaged in several habitat restoration projects with the Natural Resource Conservation Service and the California Department of Food and Ag. Um, GCID has, has been a leader in this. We've been encouraged to see a shift towards uh, occur that identified critical priorities to move water conservation conversations from an either or framework that pits farmers against fish into more productive solutions and projects. And these efforts have included creating practical multi-benefit projects that allow for a more reliable water source for communities, wildlife, farmers, ranchers, and rivers. I would ask and encourage the board to consider solutions that are collaborative and rather than, than generating winners and losers, look for win-win solutions that can benefit everyone. We, have, we do have an agricultural community up here. We are part of the entire state. The entire state is our community. And with courage and determination and imagination, there are ways to get through this drought while um, minimizing the harm to all communities in the state. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marsh. I appreciate your time this morning. Next, we have Darius Waiters. Morning. Oh, can you see me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, hi, I'm Darius Waiters. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak today, Chair Esquivel, as well as um, other board members. I am a climate and water advocate with Restore the Delta. And today I am again speaking um, to you all um, to encourage you to move forward with the Bay Delta Plan. Um, as many of my colleagues and um, supporters have stated today, um, the drought is really um, emphasizing the algal blooms that we are experiencing in the Stockton area. Um, people in our community are dependent on the water that is here. There are homeless people and encampments that are along these water um, bodies and they're very unhelpful to even, um, very unhealthy to even physically interact with. Um, our community has been consistently overlooked consistently not attended to. And I am imploring you to move forward with the Bay Delta Plan so that the environmental justice that our community deserves can be given to us. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, Water is that here is really, I feel being mishandled Mm -hmm. um, we definitely need to increase the flows that are present within um, our water body, the Delta, 
and stop giving it to um, political bodies that are outside of our Delta that are not here to support us and really don't care about us. Um, another example of that would be the almond industry, which contributes less than 1%, actually less than a third of a percent to our state's GDP, yet is also responsible for taking an immense amount of the water from the Delta. And if you were to just think about that, that's just not a very environmentally or even economically um, intelligent position for us to be in. And I do implore you to move forward with the Bay Delta plan and to explore other ideas for increasing the Delta flows so that communities can get what they deserve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Waiters. I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Next, we have Jay Smith. Chair Esquivel and board members, thank you for having me. I am Jay Smith. Can everyone hear me? We can. Good morning. Okay. Good to see you. Good morning. Um, I'm with Restore the Delta. So the past few years of environmental efforts towards the Delta have been extraordinarily unbalanced, and it's time to really acknowledge that we are truly running out of time. Um, who is being represented when work isn't being done to solve Delta water, water quality issues? Toxic waterways are filled with algal blooms that make water unhealthy for the community and fish. The fish matter and so do our communities. The governor is spending big money to fix infrastructures for the industrial age, but there is no planning, funding, large scale science or efforts for HABs uh, mitigation to, or to protect our water quality during this drought. The Bay Delta plan has never been implemented. Our fisheries are collapsing and we have crumbs of sand left in the hourglass. Youth like us starting out in our careers do not have the power to sign off on these decisions. So we say to you today, solve the unsolved. Show us that you really care about our water source, the fisheries and our home. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Really appreciate your time this morning and for addressing the board. Thank you. Next, we have uh, David Webb. Well, thank you. So I'm here uh, representing Friends of the Shasta River. And while I want to speak to the Shasta specifically, no doubt our issues are shared by many other small streams throughout the state. I worked for over 25 years pursuing voluntary measures to try to restore the salmon productivity of the Shasta River while minimizing impacts on agricultural water uses. During those 25 years, I was the primary, primarily instrumental person behind securing over $25 million for a, what amounts to a little more than a stream. And despite the fact that we did make substantial progress in some areas, the one area we were unable to make a real dent in was securing in-stream flows. And if there was one lesson learned from those 25 years, it was this, this despite massive efforts, huge amounts of money, that trying to negotiate to secure water from a position of weakness simply isn't sufficient to overcome the economic forces hanging on to the water as a way to make a living or as a way to make money. And, and so what I've concluded since then is that we need to balance the equation to bring more to the table than just voluntary measures. And so that was what was behind forming the Friends of the Shasta River. And we are now here to fight for the needs of that river and, and really need your help to restore some balance to how water is used in the Shasta. As the governing body, you have the laws, you have the science, and you have the ability as you've demonstrated by your actions to return a defined percentage of in-stream flows to the San Joaquin River do the same for a smaller stream like the Shasta, where the, the law, the, the, the need is the same, the laws are the same, the opportunity is the same to, to create an interim in-stream flow measure while we wait for the findings of the California Water Action Plan that will help us do a better job of it for more long term. But the Shasta River needs water now, not in a few years. And at this point, I have to point out that with the Shasta, this is not a drought issue. The Shasta is in a drought every year. 
because more than 90% of the water is taken out of the river at some point in nearly every year. And the Shasta isn't just now hanging on on life support. The Shasta is being strangled, strangled by overallocation of water, strangled by the return of manure-laden tailwater, strangled by hot water flowing across fields back to the river, strangled by inaction that needs to, to now be rectified. We really need your help to, to bring back some balance to the use of water from the Shasta River and every other small stream in the basin. And I want to echo the request by Conrad Fisher. We need a open discussion at this board explaining why and what more is needed before you can take those actions. We need to understand that so that we can do our job of providing the information you need or the support you need or whatever it is you need to help us and help you restore the balance that we need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webb. I appreciate uh, your time. Thank you for, for commenting here at the board. Uh, next, we have Mr. John McManus, and then um, looking like just a few more folks. So thank you, everyone, for the patience. Oh, Mr. McManus, I, I apologize. You're still on mute. You should be asked to unmute here. There we are. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Thank you. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Uh, I would like to defer the afternoon, but I'm afraid I can't. We're being called away to another meeting. So real briefly. That's fair. Yeah, thank you. I, I would just like to flag a comment uh, just made by David Webb that uh, actually struck me about not being able to get to uh, a just settlement up on the Shasta uh, voluntarily without some action on behalf of the board. And I think we're looking at the same thing in the Central Valley with phase one and no, actually with phase two. Uh, water quality standards need to be set. We need you guys to take some action. If there's any hope that voluntary agreements might ultimately uh, get us out of this mess, uh, it's, it's not going to come voluntarily without some kind of regulatory action on your part. But I want to address a couple of other things this morning. One of them is um, the need for carryover storage this summer. Very much concerned about what we're going to be looking at next year if we find ourselves in another really bad drought year. And I don't know that California has any other agency other than you all to save us from ourselves next year if we let too much of the water go that's currently in the reservoirs. So um, that's perhaps uh, one of the highest priorities. Uh, but I also want to flag a couple of other things. You've heard quite a few speakers this morning out of the Delta, and I'm hearing it all up and down the state, and certainly with our membership, that what's happening with water allocation here is starting to look like uh, a series of uh, social injustice actions, whereby um, there are downstream communities that are on the receiving end of social injustices. Um, certainly uh, on the salmon fishing side, we've got people again this week out on the high seas risking life and limb. We've got the wind coming back up starting today and it's gonna blow hard all week. There's gonna be people out there trying to make a buck because they have to they basically have an economic gun to their head. Um, but it's not just us downstream users that are being treated unjustly. You've heard from people in the Delta, and I think we know from the uh, history in this state that we can expect later this summer to see drinking water wells in the San Joaquin River go, I'm sorry, in the San Joaquin Valley, go dry as some of the big growers down there punch their wells ever deeper and basically take their neighbor's water. So, um, water allocation and balance throughout this state kind of look Machiavellian to quite a few people. Might appears to be right. You all are in a position to do something about that. Uh, we very much hope that you do um, because it's hard to imagine that social injustice on downstream users really reflects the values of this board or this governor who's made a big deal about uh, caring about social injustices. Um, one other comment and I'll wrap up. Um, one of the earlier speakers said there's not enough water for everyone to win uh, in a drought. We completely agree. And I just want to flag that where we're coming from, we're simply trying to survive. We're not trying to win. We're just trying to survive. No one has made the case that uh, rebalancing water allocation this summer is going to put irrigated agriculture out of business. Uh, but it could easily put others like in the salmon fishing community out of business. So I'll stop there and I, and I appreciate you. Oh, one other comment, your chief counsel, uh, when we see him from time to time, he looks really lonely in that gigantic room all by himself. But thank you for giving me the time. 
Thank you, Mr. McManus. And not to break any news, but we'll we'll definitely be looking to transition back into that room, uh, I think, here in the month of June. Um, so thank you. Um, and I uh, appreciate that, that you won't be able to join us for two o'clock. Do know that we will um, go into the issue of how we're looking at the system and how it's being balanced out and actually have uh, the directors from the projects and the Fish and Wildlife Agencies here to, to discuss with us. So thank you. Um, next, we have Peter Dreckmeyer. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Esquivel and board members. Good to see you. Um, it's been almost two and a half years since the Water Board adopted phase one of the Bay Delta plan and it's been stalled. It's very disappointing. I think the last activity was the release of the draft goals and objectives. That was more than one and a half years ago. And meanwhile, the Tuolumne is getting in worse and worse shape. You know, historically there were well over a hundred thousand salmon this year, barely 1000 worst river in central Valley. And the voluntary agreements have been a real distraction. Um, appears to us to be a, a stall tactic by the water agencies. Doesn't sound like they're cooperating too much. I um, sent you a response that I provided to Bosca um, on the Tuolumne River Voluntary Agreement. Their general manager gave a presentation to the board in December. I found it so incredibly misleading. We submitted 15 pages of response and all they could say is, well, you know, this is over our heads. We'll send it to the SFPUC and maybe they'll respond. And obviously they didn't. The, <clears throat> you probably have heard San Francisco has now sued you over the water quality certification for the relicensing of Don Pedro and licensing of LaGrange dams. And earlier the irrigation districts had petitioned FERC to waive your authority to issue that water quality certification. It's really crazy, the information that's coming out of the SFPUC, it's just wrong. And whenever we get an audience and have a chance to present our narrative, we get unanimous votes supporting uh, the right path forward, which is the Bay Delta plan. For example, right now, the SFPUC has four and a half years worth of water in storage. And if next year is an average water year, they'll have water for that year and they'll end the year with full storage. They have really good water rights in average and wet years. And in dry years, they've got a buffer because they have a, you know, Hetch Hetchy is a quarter of their storage. <clears throat> we can show that the SFPUC could manage a repeat of the driest six year period on record 1987 to 1992 with the Bay Delta plan in place without requiring any rationing and without bringing any new water online. But I think you know about their design drought, double drought that combines the two worst droughts from the last century. Uh, they got caught two months ago trying to cook the books on their urban water management plan. They were trying to use the sales cap, contractual obligations as demand. And we caught them and they were forced to change it. That reduced rationing by 27%. Um, and yet still people listen to them as if they're a credible source. You have the authority to restart the Bay Delta plan. And I implore you to do that. The river and all the critters, the salmon based ecosystem depend on you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Dreckmeyer. Appreciate your time and comments this morning. Next, we have Nathaniel Kane. And then last we'll uh, have Jasmine Leake. I believe Ms. Leake is, is here with us again. Good morning, Mr. Kane. Good morning, um, Chair Esquivel and members of the board. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Kane. Um, I'm here with Environmental Law Foundation. Um, I'll try to keep it quick. Um, I'm here to talk about the unfolding emergency on the Scott River. Um, there's there's a little bit of water in the river right now. There's a, a a decent return of fish from the 2018 cohort that's up there right now. Um, it's already getting hot. There's almost no snowpack and flows are gonna drop very quickly as the irrigation season gets going up there. Um, and it's gonna be a disaster for the fish. Um, we're gonna see disease, we're gonna see strandings, we're gonna see the stream disconnect. Um, it's gonna be a disaster for the fish and the communities that depend on those fish. Um, I was really heartened to see the board issue the notices of unavailability um, a few weeks ago. I think that's a really good first step. 
it's not going to fix the problem by itself. Um, uh, for many reasons, including that um, senior water users can just continue to divert um, and that won't protect the Forest Service right. And groundwater users outside the adjudication zone will be able to continue to extract water. Right now, no agency has taken the role of overseeing ground, uh, groundwater and surface water use from the entire Scott Basin uh, because the adjudication cuts the basin in two. Um, this just leads to a tragedy of the commons in the Scott. Um, this board has the authority to act. Uh, the courts in recent years have confirmed that under um, drought, emergency drought regulations, under the public trust, under waste and unreasonable use, this board has the authority to take action. Um, CDFW, as has been discussed, has given the board an interim stream flow um, target that should be adopted. Um, and I'm looking forward to engaging with the board and staff over the coming weeks to talk about um, all of these options. Um, but ultimately, action needs to happen. My, you know, my uh, first priority would always be to see voluntary reductions in use to preserve these species. But I think that voluntary reductions are a lot more likely to happen if it's backstopped by uh, regulatory action by this board. Um, so we're, we're asking for action. I'm hoping to be in touch. And thank you for your time. Thank you as well, Mr. Kane. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. And then last, uh, we have Jasmine Leek. Ms. Leek, uh, thank you for your patience and glad hopefully you're still here with us and can comment. I am. Thank you very much, Chair Esquivel. My name is Jasmine Leek and I am the Managing Director at Third City Coalition. We're a civic nonprofit based in Stockton, California, um, formerly Northern Valley Yogurts Land. Um, I'm here today really to um, to advocate for my community. I'm a community organizer in Stockton and I've for the last seven years, um, work to better understand the issues of the people here in Stockton and um, was fortunate to be able to participate in the Delta Leadership Program. And um, currently our organization heads up an, uh, an organization called, a coalition called Rise Stockton, where we are advocating for um, and working with our environmental justice community in Stockton. And I just really wanna express my, um, disappointment and also concern and and as a community member who's involved in a, a multitude of issues just the questions that we as residents have about the work that you all are doing and um, just want to remind you that in Stockton I think someone earlier mentioned that you know we have a lot of um, unhoused and unsheltered folks living along the waterways and while we consider this drought crisis I just want to remind you all that there's a, you know, when we were dealing with multiple intersecting crises. And so it's of the utmost importance that you prioritize the folks who are, who are here in Stockton and in their Delta, um, the harmful algal blooms, which I know everyone has been talking about this morning, keep getting worse. And I think from my perspective, something that I would like to see change is, you know, further investment in community groups who are actually on the ground, who can um, try to help implement some of these policies and ideas. I realize that you all are one agency and you're tasked with this enormous state and all the issues, but um, folks on the ground are dealing with the impacts and they there is a lot of untapped resources um, here in our communities that can help alleviate the problem. So I just you know want to make sure that it's clear um, that the water quality in, in our Delta is extremely important, not just for the health and safety of others, but um, you know, some of us have like places like Stockton who are on the water, depend on it for our economy and have a lot of um, people who, who want to be able to recreate but have never even had the opportunity. And so I think when you start to think about, um, you know, people who, who have the luxury of, of recreating on our waterways and the people who are actually using it as necessities, I think that's going to be what you all should consider as you begin to address the drought. Thank you for the opportunity to make these comments this morning and apologies for the issues earlier. Oh, no apologies in the least. And thank you for your time this morning as well and your advocacy. Um, you know, it's it definitely not lost on me that uh, the success of, of any effort 
is always incumbent upon the local leadership and we're here to support. Uh, we can't replace that uh, at the state level. And it's always about the partners uh, we have in our watersheds to uh, help balance out. Um, it's not just the board that's called to balance these resources, it's in our state constitution. Us in common all are here called to um, figure out how we uh, deal with very difficult circumstance. And certainly um, looking forward to item number five, and being able to, to explore uh, a little more deeply amongst us how, how we do just that. Thank you, so thank and you, I, just one more quick thing, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanna thank the groups like Restore the Delta who have been doing the hard work on the ground with community organizations that have completely unrelated missions. I think um, you know every community should have someone like Restore the Delta in their, in their backyard. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, that concludes public forum. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I know I was tempted to try to um, limit for the first time, I think, uh, but we, uh, I think, appropriately got through them all. And uh, again, much of the comment I heard, uh, we'll actually dive into in more detail on item number five. So thank you, everyone. We can now move on. Uh, and I will just say that um, because of the number of folks we still have um, remaining to comment on item number four, and then also an item, item number five, and our agenda generally, I will, um, I will try to break, but everyone should um, feel very comfortable to uh, take care of uh, their needs here as we try to get through a thick agenda. So thank you everyone. Okay, item number one, it is uh, consideration of adoption of the May 4th uh, board meeting minutes. Do I have a motion or any comment or edit from folks? Uh, I'll move to adopt item one. Thank you. I'll second. And uh, do I have, and can we do a roll call vote, please, Ms. Townsend? Certainly. Board Member McGuire? Aye. Board Member Firestone? Aye. Vice Chair Diadamo? Aye. And Chair Esquivel? Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well. The item carries and the board meeting minutes are adopted. I apologize. I actually before meant to just launch into our items, uh, kick it over to uh, Mr. Lawfer because we have some housekeeping items to help us here with uh, both identifying individuals in our list. And I see we have a couple of hands up. So uh, Mr. Lawfer, if you can. Sure, I appreciate that. Thank you, Chair Esquivel. And I also appreciate the call out for Mr. McManus. It is kind of lonely here at times. Um, so we do have a number of people who have called in today and, and whose phone numbers were not, or the last three digits of their phone numbers had not been provided when they registered for the Zoom meeting. So if you have a phone number ending in either 977-531 or 600, if you can please send an email to uh, Janine Townsend, clerk of the board. She was the one who emailed the credentials for the Zoom meeting. We need to know what your name is so we can make sure you're assigned to the correct item. Otherwise, you may not be called on today. Um, and if you have a hand up, uh, if you can just send your question uh, to Ms. Townsend as well, uh, we will deal with it offline so we can keep the meeting moving. So appreciate it, everybody. Thank you so much, Mr. Law, for, for helping uh, continue to have uh, very productive meetings here for us. So thank you. Uh, next, okay, so we took care of item number one uh, on our agenda that brings us to our tranche of uncontested items on item number two and three. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Townsend, do we have any public commenters for those? Are they still uncontested? They are still uncontested. Great. And I just want to thank uh, at the top, of course, all the great work I know that went into these. Uh, the fact that you know we aren't talking or hearing about them doesn't mean that they aren't critical or important to us. Um, but at this point are uncontested and so can be taken uh, both uh, and or if any uh, uh, board members have any comments, they can also make them. Move adoption of both of the uncontested items. Thank you, Vice Chair. Is there a second? I'll second. And Ms. Townsend, can you please call the roll call vote? Yes. Vice Chair Diadamo? Aye. Board Member Firestone? Aye. Board Member McGuire? Aye. And Chair Esquivel? Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well. Uh, items two and three are passed and um, adopted. So thank you, everyone. That now brings us to uh, a tranche of informational items. Uh, and the first being on the report for the statewide advisory committee on cooling water intake structures with recommendations regarding Redondo Beach generating stations compliance state. 
I believe we have um, our folks uh, from the program to give a, a brief um, uh, presentation. And then we have a panel of um, representatives from the CEC, uh, the Air Board, the CPUC, and uh, other state agency partners. Good morning. Ms. Fitzgerald, are you gonna kick us off here then? Great, uh, hopefully everyone should be able to unmute. Here, let me. There we go, okay, great. Well, good morning, uh, Chair Esquivel, members of the board. This is item four, my name is Rebecca Fitzgerald. I am an environmental program manager on your staff in the Department of Water, Division of Water Quality. This is a report for you on the Statewide Advisory Committee on Cooling Water Intake Structures, also known as the SACWIS. Um, providing recommendations regarding um, how the once through cooling policy um, and the compliance dates associated with that policy may need to be considered in light of grid reliability needs, energy grid reliability needs throughout the state. Um, I'm going to turn over, actually, I'm going to turn over um, the majority of the presentation to Colleagues in the energy agencies, Mr. Ed Randolph from the California Public Utilities Commission and Mr. Neil Miller from the California Independent System Operator. Um, Alicia Gutierrez is also available from the Energy Commission. And then um, the last part of our presentation, I'll turn it over to a senior environmental scientist on your team, Kat Walsh, to talk about what is likely to be an amendment upcoming for the once through cooling policy. Um, can you please advance to the next slide. I just wanted to uh, take a moment to what I already kind of touched on, an outline of the um, presentation um, focused on the information that we've gotten from our advisory committee from SACWIS, followed by staff presentation. There'll be questions and opportunity for discussion after as well. I do wanna take a moment and highlight that our representatives from the CPUC and Cal ISO both have a legislative um, commitment this afternoon and they'll be available to um, have a discussion after the presentation but may not be able to stay through all of the public comments. Um, so with that, Mr. Randolph, Mr. Miller, I will turn it over to you. Okay. Um, um, you know, good afternoon, um, chair and board members. First off, sound check. Am I, you're hearing me okay? We can. Okay. Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. Um, um, thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, I do actually apologize that we have to uh, be in front of you on this um, again this year. Um, I'll go through the timeline of, of events here. Um, but I know this was a, a very tough decision when we were talking about OTC um, extensions last year. Um, and we had talked about some reasons to come um, where we may need to come back and look at further extensions. Um, but just to set this up, um, those reasons haven't actually uh, materialized, but um, due to events of last summer, um, other analysis, other events materialized where we've had to do a deeper focus on um, the OTC plants and specifically on Redondo Beach. Um, but going through a quick timeline here, um, you know, on this back in August of 2009, SACWIS, that is the State Advisory Committee on Cooling Water Intake Structures, um, which is made up of um, representatives from multiple state agencies um, to um, look at reliability needs um, combined with the um, directives to um, um, shut down or uh, repower uh, power plants using once through cooling technologies out there. Um, the SACWIS identified a local capacity need in the LA basin. This is back in August 2019. Um, um, and based on that uh, local capacity need and an emerging um, um, system capacity need recommended an extension of two or more years um, for Alamitos and one or more of the other once through cooling resources um, to meet those, um, those capacity needs going forward. Um, in November of that year, uh, my agency, the California Public Utilities Commission, um, 
issued a decision um, ordering uh, the utilities and um, uh, community choice aggregators and um, energy service providers in California, oftentimes referred to as the load serving entities, uh, to procure 3,300 megawatts of um, new um, uh, energy resources to be online in 2021, 2022, and 2023. Um, um, and um, recommending an extension of uh, the permits for Alamitos, Huntington Beach, um, Redondo Beach, and Ormond um, as a bridge while that other procurement was coming online um, out there. Um, and then in January 2020, the SACWIS um, recommended um, extensions of Alamitos, Huntington Beach, and Ormond Beach um, for three years and Redondo Beach for one year. Um, then in August of 2020, last year, um, we had um, severe westwide heat waves um, that resulted in, um, on August 14th and 15th, um, what is oftentimes referred to technically as a load shed event, um, when the California system operator ordered the load serving entities um, to um, um, to reduce their load uh, because there was not enough generation available to meet that. Um, most people know load shed events um, as the term rolling blackouts. Um, we also, not noted in this deck, but on the, uh, the 14th and the 15th were a Friday and a Saturday. On the 17th, 18th, and 19th, um, while there were no additional load shed events, um, uh, forecasted demand on each of those days you know, far exceeded our uh, planning um, reserve margins that we plan for in advance. Um, and we, have, uh, we only avoided additional load shed events those days because of massive um, statewide um, um, uh, conservation um, and a number of other efforts, including um, a number of entities that have um, uh, fossil fuel generation, diesel uh, backup generation, um, firing up those resources to meet their own loads and reduce the impact on the grid. Um, then uh, shortly after that in September 2020, um, um, you approved extensions um, according to the SACWIS recommendations of the once through cooling plants. Um, in January of 2021, and I'll get to some details on this in a second, um, the joint energy agencies, that's the Public Utilities Commission, the California Energy Commission, and the California Independent System Operator um, released a root cause analysis on um, the causes of those uh, rotating outages in August um, and the, um, the, the near shortages of energy we had on other days. Um, and then um, on March of 2021, um, the SACWIS adopted the 2021 report on SACWIS, which we'll talk a little bit more um, today on the specific recommendations. Uh, next slide, please. And then the SACWIS recommendations. Um, SACWIS recommends the State Water Board amend the once through cooling policy to extend the compliance date of Redondo Beach units five, uh, six, and eight for two years from December 31, uh, uh, 2021 uh, to December 31, 2023. The extension would help meet uh, system reliability needs in September of 2022 um, at the hours ending at 8 p.m. Um, as demonstrated by uh, system-wide uh, grid shortfalls in the 2022 stack analysis, which we will talk about later in this deck. Uh, the second year of the extension is necessary to address the uncertainty of the 2023 uh, resource supply and the CECs forecasted 500 megawatt increase in demand between 2020 and 2023. Furthermore, a two-year extension would minimize the regulatory risk of returning uh, to the state water board uh, should the power generated by Rotano Beach be needed in 2023. Um, should it be determined there is no need for Redondo Beach in 2023, the unit may retire earlier um, than its compliance uh, date deadline. Next slide, please. Um, so talking a little bit about the findings from the joint agency root cause analysis. 
um, the, that joint root cause analysis um, had three main conclusions um, on what the, you know, what led to the rotating outages and then to the uh, tightness in the other days during that west white heat wave. Um, first, climate change induced extreme heat wave across the western United States resulted in demand for electricity exceeding existing uh, resource adequacy planning targets. Um, to put that in context, that was a one in 30 year heat um, event um, based off of um, 35 years of weather data that we have. Um, and our planning targets um, um, at that point uh, did not account for, did not plan for a one in 30 heat wave uh, event. Um, second, in transitioning to reliable, clean and affordable resource mix, resource planning targets have not kept pace to ensure sufficient resources that can be um, relied upon to meet demand in the early evening hours. This makes balancing demand and supply more challenging during the extreme heat waves. Uh, put a little bit more in um, English and a little bit more detail behind that. Um, the challenge is um, in late August and then in getting into September um, when um, solar is less available um, at, you know, in those evening hours, since the sun is going down earlier, um, you continue to have um, high uh, demand during heat waves that you have that time of year. Um, and thus, we need to rely on other resources other than solar um, at that time frame um, um, and need to, you know, over time, look for a more diverse resource mix um, that can meet um, um, those targets. And then finally, um, some practices in the Kaisos day had energy market exacerbated uh, the supply challenges under high stress conditions um, and that and um, uh, Neil can get into more detail on those um, and some of the corrective actions we've taken on those um, in later slides. Um, slide six, please. Thanks. Um, and then looking at responses to the root cause analysis, what are the agencies doing to make sure we don't have a repeat of what happened in, 20, um, in 2020? Um, first, the California Energy Commission is, is focusing on additional reliability actions in 2021. Uh, in the 2021 Integrated Energy Policy Report, um, they recently held um, a workshop with the joint agencies um, on May 4th to look at some of these issues. Um, they are um, updating some of their forecasting uh, techniques and met methodologies um, and are developing um, other tools so that we have more contingency plans um, in place in the event of other short, um, uh, shortfalls. Uh, the CPUC um, opened a proceeding and issued two decisions um, in, in this last winter, um, setting requirements in parameters for expedited procurement in the summer of 21 and the summer of 2022. Um, these two con decisions combined should result um, in approximately 1,000 megawatts of additional resources being available um, this summer and a little bit more available in 2022. The CAISO's Board of Governors approved on March 24th uh, and April 21st a package of market operational improvements to support grid reliability in California and throughout the West during tight supply conditions to be implemented before the start of this summer. Um, and then CAISO designated approximately 400 megawatts of resources that were at risk of retiring before this summer as what's designated as reliability must run resources, which prevents their retirement. Um, it, it prevents their retirement for this summer. Uh, next slide, please. Um, additionally, it's worth noting other efforts outside of the, this winter's efforts to bring more resources online that impact um, uh, the timeframes we're talking about here this coming summer 2021, um, uh, 2022, and 2023. Um, first and foremost, and I have already mentioned this decision, um, in 2019, the PUC ordered um, 3,300 megawatts of incremental procurement um, that needed to be online by 2023, but that's supposed to come online in tranches with 50% online um, by this summer, 75% online by the summer of 2022, and the remainder of that online by the summer of 2023. We're at, um, we have um, required the load serving entities to report progress towards procurement. Um, uh, milestones in September and February and August of each tranche period. 
Um, so we are tracking that progress towards um, uh, meeting those milestones from a contract basis. Actually, the load serving entities um, will be a little ahead of target um, for 2021, um, but um, there may be some other issues where while on contract they're ahead, um, um, they still aren't ahead on 2021 uh, procurement. Um, Energy Division staff at the Public Utilities Commission is analyzing the most recent February 2021 filings um, and some supplemental filings um, that needed to be filed and result in errors of the initial filings. Um, and staff is, is still working through some of that um, to develop a full progress report. Um, however, nothing in the staff review so far indicates that the loads of entities will not meet their obligations. Um, yeah, after that analysis, the commission will determine whether backstop procurement um, is needed, um, meaning that um, we may step in and if some of the load serving entities have not met their obligations, we would direct um, the three investor owned utilities um, to go do additional procurement to fill that gap. Um, and we sent a quarterly report on these issues um, to the, um, to the uh, water board on March 16th of this year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this slide actually uh, gets into more detail on a little bit of what I was talking about um, two slides ago um, in terms of incremental procurement for this summer. Um, um, I'm just kind of looking through it to make sure I think I've covered most of this um, slide already. Um, so yeah, I, I think we can skip to slide seven. I've covered this and talking about the other slides. Um, and with this, I will hand it over to uh, uh, Neil Miller at the CAISO. Okay, uh, thank you, Ed. And good morning, commissioners. Thank you for a chance to present today. I should also do a sound check. So Ed, would you please nod if you can hear me? Thank you. <laughs> so uh, as Ed indicated, this is not a request we wanted to be bringing back to the board, but we do feel it's necessary. The other uh, issue that we wanted to address head on is that we wanted to keep the uh, assumptions and the basis for the analysis as straightforward and transparent as possible, recognizing the concerns associated with this analysis and request. So first, I'd just like to walk through the analysis that led us to this point that was performed by the uh, performed and vetted with the three uh, energy agencies here and uh, just walk through the detail on some of the assumptions that underpin this work. So this focus was on a stack analysis that really had us sharpening our pencils on looking at that critical uh, 8 p.m. window, the time period as that indicated where the solar resources on the system and behind the meter are dropping off, but the load levels continue to remain high for some several hours past when the solar output has been tailing down. So the stack analysis we performed is really comparing the capacity of the fleet of available generators, and we consider all available generators to meet the expected need. We assume a one in two average load from the uh, Energy Commission as the basis for the analysis, and the probability of exceeding that is built into our margins, but we start off as the basis using the one in two forecast. We are focusing on the most critical hour after peak, which is generally the hour ending 8 p.m. for the June to October timeframe. And because of that, we remove the solar from the analysis because it's generally not available at hour ending 8 p.m. We assume all resources using their net qualifying capacity, the amount that's proven to be valuable from each unit for contributing to meeting peak load and have of course done this analysis with and without Redondo Beach. We also make and have been making slightly more optimistic assumptions about the amount of demand response performance based on the total that is shown or credited that uh, load serving entities have indicated they have available in terms of how much is contracted, but how much can actually appear on any given day, any given hour. We've also used the five-year average historical resource adequacy import levels, the contracted amounts for each month to establish a baseline. And we use the incremental non-solar resources coming online 
based on the uh, CPUC's analysis of the progress the load serving entities are making in their procurement. And in particular, this was focusing on a November 2020 update uh, that we believe is still relatively consistent with, with what we're seeing to this point. Uh, we do also and assume that the uh, incremental procurement that Ed referred to in one of the decisions is moving forward which is uh, practically the range has been discussed of 1,000 to 1,500. We've been focusing on the 1,500 of additional capacity. And we've been looking at the analysis meeting both a 15% and a 17.5% planning reserve margin, as well as looking at an illustrative August 2020 day ahead forecast. And the 15 and 17.5% and planning reserve margins I should spend a minute on that. The 15% was the historical approach. And given uh, the last several years of actual performance for uh, generation, the 17.5%, we believe, is actually a more realistic number that should be planned for. Uh, next slide, please. So these, this series of bar charts demonstrates the available capacity that we would expect to see in summer of 2022 and how they compare against that 8 p.m. load level. Uh, as you can see from, from the charts, the uh, September chart is the largest concern where all the resources, including Redondo Beach and the expedited procurement are necessary to almost reach the 17.5% margin, but we're counting on uh, either the expedited procurement or the uh, Redondo Beach even to reach the 15%. These also demonstrate the risk compared to this illustrative August 18th day that we provided uh, as a comparator, which was taking the uh, day ahead forecast load for that date adding in operating reserves and forced outages, but not adding in at the additional margin to account for forecast variability because we were picking a very specific forecast. Now, the if I could move to the next page, please. Uh, this table sets out numerically the results that we showed on, on the graphs and really just help highlight the particular points where we see risk. Uh, this chart is focusing on, uh, does not include the uh, expedited procurement underway and shows the gaps in that case without Redondo or the expedited procurement and shows that uh, the September timeframe is the largest concern, although you also see challenges in meeting the July uh, requirements as well. If I could turn to the next slide, please. This is another way of presenting the same results. Uh, these do include the expedited procurement, but show the impact that Redondo Beach would have in helping us close, but not entirely eliminate the shortfall in reaching the 17.5% targeted planning reserve margin. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, when we're looking at the 2022 analysis, which we did in more detail, we also then had to look forward to see if the situation would be materially different in 2023. Well, there is some additional procurement being undertaken that should be closing the gap. We also do see an additional 500 megawatt increase in the demand for loads forecasted for the 8 p.m. window. And we also continue to have concerns around the certainty regarding the actual incremental procurement. And if I could turn to the last slide, please, or the next slide. So uh, just to reiterate the concerns we identified in the SACWIS report overall, there is a period like we are entering into with climate change and a number of other moving parts, there is considerably more uncertainty than there would normally be around the authorized procurement, how it will be uh, realized and how effectively some of it will perform. 
uh, whether the average level of imports can be delivered as these wider spread heat wave events are becoming more common, whether actual operating conditions continue to stay within planning targets, uh, also concern around the uh, susceptibility for higher forced outage rates, given that we are retaining a fleet of resources that are aging and while maintenance is being done on them, they are an aging fleet and often on generators that are being held back from otherwise uh, that would have been retiring. And the ability to keep the rest of the fleet online, especially at a time when if some of this generation experiences any sort of major failure, it's often a very real issue about putting major capital dollars into restoring some units to service if they experience any other sort of major failure. There's also a concern about the ability for load serving entities to contract for all necessary resources and how well some of these new programs will actually perform. So there's a significant number of uncertainties that we're having to take into account in the consideration and applying judgment to the, uh, the supply situation where we really feel it's again necessary to keep Redondo Beach available as an insurance policy against uh, the steadily increasing range of uncertainties that we're dealing with. I will stop there and I believe I'll now turn it over to Kat to talk about the rest of the, uh, uh, the rest of the considerations. And Neil, my name is Kat Walsh. I am the senior environmental scientist supervising the Ocean Standards Unit in the Division of Water Quality here at the State Water Resources Control Board. Now I'll talk a little bit about the forthcoming proposed amendment to the OTC policy, permits and other regulatory documents for Redondo Beach Generating Station and the current project timeline. Next slide, please. So this graph shows the historic and current projected water use for all OTC facilities as a daily average in million gallons per day. Water use is on the y-axis and time in years is on the x-axis. As you can see, daily average water use decreases over time as power plants come into compliance with the OTC policy. The red line depicts the actual flow data reported by these facilities to the US EPA. The blue line represents the design flow rate based on the compliance schedules in the OTC policy. And the green line represents the design flow rates based on owner actions and proposals. I'd like to draw your attention to the blue and green lines for the years of 2022 and 2023. Next slide, please. Similarly, this graph shows the projected water usage based on the two-year extension of Redondo Beach Generating Station as recommended by the SAC list. As shown in this figure, the projected fleet water use, the green line, is still at or below the design flow rates based on the compliance schedule in the OTC policy, the blue line. Therefore, if the compliance date for Redondo Beach Generating Station is extended for two years, we would still be on track to meet the intended intake flow reduction per the OTC policy. Next slide, please. So based on the recommendation of the SACWIS, State Water Board staff is preparing a proposed amendment to the OTC policy to extend the compliance date for Redondo Beach Generating Station for two years through December 31st, 2023. In order for Redondo Beach Generating Station to remain in compliance with the OTC policy, the amendment would need to be adopted by the State Water Board and approved by the Office of Administrative Law by December 31st of this year. However, should there be any unforeseen delays to this schedule, the CAISO could request a susp suspension of Redondo Beach Generating Station's compliance date for more than 90 days under section 2B, 2B of the OTC policy. Next slide, please. So the NPDES permit for Redondo Beach Generating Station expires on September 30th of this year. The Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board is considering an administrative extension of this permit. 
Additionally, the time schedule order or TSO for Redondo Beach Generating Station expires on December 31st of this year. And the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board is concurrently preparing a new TSO for its board's consideration this fall. Next slide, please. As our presentation draws to a close, here's a quick look at our project timeline. We intend to release the draft amendment and staff report on June 16th for public comment. The public comment period will span from June 16th through August 16th. And we are planning to re-release documents and our responses to comments on October 14th and intend to bring this amendment to the State Water Board for a public hearing and consideration of adoption on November 2nd. Next slide, please. That concludes our present presentation. Thank you for your time and attention. We will now take questions from members of the board followed by public comment. Thank you so much, Ms. Walsh. And thank you, Mr. Randolph and Mr. Um, Miller. Uh, any questions from fellow board members? You know, um, when I, in hearing uh, the numbers and hearing the analysis and the modeling and the planning, you know, what, what also comes to mind certainly are, is the drought that we're experiencing and, and similar work in trying to just best balance out and prepare and uh, weigh what are a number of difficult considerations for all of us, but particularly with the climate crisis at hand, you know, it's all this work is incredibly important. So we appreciate the analysis and work and the, the rationale and justification for the request. Um, and I know we have uh, a number of public uh, commenters, I'll just say, I believe it's hovering around 40 or so. Um, so uh, we can quickly get into those, uh, but first want to make sure my fellow board colleagues didn't have any questions. Nothing uh, comes to mind. I want to remind everyone, the board is not acting on anything today. This was an informational item on an update on the SACWIS report. And as you saw from the timeline, there's still further uh, public comment and discussion and work that will go on before the board uh, takes official action. Um, but uh, fellow board colleagues, any questions? I have a quick question, um, and I know we don't have all of the folks from SACWIS committee here. Um, so I, I just, I know in previous hearings, we've heard a lot of concerns around air quality when the um, Redondo Beach plant boots up, that's <laughs> not the right word, but um, is, uh, so I'm just wondering if, I, I know we don't have somebody with, from CARP here today or the local air quality um, district, but I'm just wondering if anyone can just speak to that concern. If not, maybe that can be it for a future, future hearing. Ms. Fitzgerald. Yeah, I believe actually we do have uh, Ms. Carrie Bylan from the Air Resources Board in attendance today. Are you able to share some input? Yes, and I believe we have someone from South Coast on as well. So, um, certainly want to defer and I could give an answer that provides general information regarding per permitting at that facility, but um, if the uh, uh, South Coast representative wants to speak first. Hi, good morning. Yes, uh, I'm Jason Aspel. I'm um, Deputy Executive Officer for Engineering and Permitting at uh, South Coast AQMD. Uh, I believe some of the, uh, uh, the questions was about startup shutdown or was it just um yeah I mean that's when I've heard concerns arise right. is really from that that yeah so uh what we have on the uh, permits uh for AES Redondo is a uh, continuous emissions uh monitor uh you know we do have an allowance for startup and shutdown um of the equipment um but uh, what that uh, monitor measures is just the uh, emissions uh, conti well continuously, uh, and they're part of our uh, reclaim program, which is a cap and trade. Uh, so they do have to account uh, for all those uh, NOx emissions um, from from the stacks of the facility when they operate. Do you know? Um, I apologize to just be lobbing questions, and it's okay if you don't. But do you know how many times the facility had to start up, say, just in this last year's extension? So we get a sense of, and I think what um, board member Firestone's maybe sort of general question was just if there was any sort of analysis done as to 
you know, what what will it would be the you know potential I guess impacts on hearing you know again that we've heard and will likely hear about the air quality impacts to the local community just if there's a sense of what that will be and, and if there was any maybe analysis done. And if not, we can uh, just make sure we, we get a better understanding of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have that, uh, the, the number uh, available to me. Uh, essentially what we look at is they get a cap uh, and they either have to uh, you know, comply with that or purchase additional credit. So as long as they're uh, within uh, those emission, uh, that emission cap, uh, they comply with our rule. Um, I am joined uh, today by one of our um, enforcement managers. I, I don't know if uh, they have that handy, but um, yeah, I, I don't have that information uh, with me. Yeah, that's a, that's fair. Thank you. Uh, so, board member, maybe you know that's you know something that we you can uh, we can follow up on. I guess. Yep. Happy to do so. Thank you. Have a, have a question for Please. Mr. Miller, I believe. I uh, appreciate you sharing the analysis here, um, the stack analysis and and the, uh, the planning reserve margin and, and some of the calculations that went into addressing the just inherent uncertainty that we're facing. It seems like in so many different issues that we're dealing with and a lot of it's driven towards, sounds like climate change. And um, certainly mm -hmm. we're gonna be talking about that a lot more today, but um, you know, I, I was looking at your charts and just reflecting on the fact that, you know, historically you did use a 15% planning reserve margin. And it, it just, I, I don't have a solid understanding of where the 17.5% number came from, but I do recognize that it's awfully close to the Redondo Beach capacity, plant capacity. So I, I just feel like I, you know, while you're here with us, I believe you have to leave. Um, so I was hoping you could just share a little bit more about where that 17.5% came from. And, uh, and then are you, or are the agencies doing anything to fill the rest of the gap that was identified for 2022? I'd be happy to, thanks. I'll, I'll start with that. And there may be part that, uh, that Ed also wants to jump in on following, but the way we've been looking at the 15% planning reserve margin was that it was a relative to us at this point, and looking back over history because the record gets a little blurry, but the 15% at this point really provided us the simple sum of a 6% contingency reserve margin that's a requirement for people operating in the Western footprint. Approximately 4% allowing for load variability, which would take you from a one in two to about a one in five, but not much further. And about a five, percent margin to count for forced outage rates for, for the generating facilities. And when we've been looking over, especially last summer, but also sharpening our pencils before then, we've been seeing that the forced outage rates are more appropriately in the seven and a half percent range. So that's really where we've seen the need for some additional margin to be more realistic about the forced outage rates. And when we were at a time when we were surplus to some extent anyway, where renewable resources were being developed, but the older units hadn't been retiring away yet, we were comfortably above that margin. So it, to some extent, it, it didn't matter. It didn't get the sharper focus until we actually started to approach those limits. And uh, we have provided that input as well into the various CPC proceedings on resource procurement. And we have seen adjustments made in the longer term procurement direction being set, uh, recognizing those higher requirements. And uh, Ed, I don't know if you'd prefer to jump in and comment on that. Uh, yeah, I will. Um, thanks, thanks, Neil. Um, I think there's two questions there um, and I can um, add in a little bit more on the changes to the planning reserve margin, um, but then also a question on what are, what are all the agencies doing to fill in those gaps more? Um, so yeah, Neil detailed um, some of the factors that, that are going into that recommended 17.5% planning reserve margin. Um, you know, more broadly, that is um, a, a, a regulatory provision that was last set, last revisited um, 2005 timeframe. Um, and it does take into a number of factors, um, but a key factor in that is the weather availability and to account for more extreme weather events. 
Um, and the PUC now in, um, in actually two different proceedings is looking at changes to the planning reserve margin going forward um, with the more extreme weather events being a, a driving factor of those conversations. Um, um, what the 17.5% margin there represents is an interim approach um, while the commission develops a, a broader record and a broader understanding of how we should account for weather going forward um, that covers for the next few years what the investor owned utilities need to procure. Um, you know, and is based on the factors that, that Neil had done, um, had, had laid on what we're continuing to learn um, about um, both weather changes um, and changes in um, the fleet as we move to um, more and more um, re uh, clean energy resources. Um, and um, because we don't want to make uh, massive new investment in fossil fuel plants, acknowledging that some of the resources that we um, are relying on until we can make a complete transition to um, a carbon-free grid um, are going to be a little less reliable. So we need to um, account for that in our, our planning there. Um, in terms of what are we doing to fill in the gaps, I mean, I went into some of that in the slides. Um, I'll point out also that there is a, um, um, a commission proceeding right now looking at midterm reliability needs. That's through um, 2026, um, in which um, a, uh, proposed, a proposal from one of our administrative law judges recommended procurement of 7,500 uh, megawatts of, of, of qualifying capacity be built by 2026. Um, the CAISO in that proceeding has actually, based on their analysis, recommended 10,000 megawatts of procurement. Um, there will be a draft decision in that proceeding coming out in the, the next week or so um, that will address a number of party comments on what we should be procuring, what types of resources should be procured to meet that. So that's an additional effort there. Um, and um, all the agencies um, going into this summer and going into the next summer, I think priority number one, two, and three is to make sure we have resources online um, you know, across the board um, to meet needs if we have another extreme, re um, um, e extreme heat wave. And that includes tracking all the orders we've already issued, uh, making sure that the load serving entities um, are meeting their compliance dates, um, as um, we've seen in a bunch of different sectors now, there's starting to be supply chain issues um, uh, with a bunch of different resources out there as uh, shipping gets more constrained, um, as you know, factories in, um, across the United States and across the world are ramping back up um, and we're keeping a really close eye on those um, supply chain issues. And up until recently, we weren't seeing any, but uh, we're starting to see some supply chain issues. But, um, trying to stay on top of those, make sure it's there, make sure that which um, that 2,000 megawatts of new batteries that are supposed to come online before this summer actually come online, um, and making sure that you know 8,000 plus megawatts of new clean energy resources supposed to come online the next three years do come online. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Any other uh, questions from fellow board colleagues? And if not, we can begin to get to um, commenters. Uh, just to note, again, we have about 40 individuals. I would like to see if folks can keep their comments to about three minutes um, and do try to be additive, uh, but, um, under, but please um, just try to be succinct as well. Um, we have a lot of folks to try to get through. That would bring us at about two hours worth of public comment. Um, I'll note that in about an hour, we can go ahead and take a 30 minute lunch and then so we would come back uh, and then continue on through those uh, public comments. And again, trying to hit a two o'clock uh, drought item. If we are still in this item and have significant um, individuals to get through, um, I may pause it uh, and then so that we can hit the drought item and then uh, get back to finishing off some comment on the item. We'll see. Um, uh, hopefully everyone can help work with me here to, to manage. I know what are a lot of uh, individuals wanting to comment and would like to make sure we all respectfully have time for each of those. So let's uh, go ahead and begin. And I believe our first uh, commenter is actually from Public Forum. Uh, Francesco, thank you for uh, uh, being uh, willing to uh, wait a bit there. And now 
uh, you are up for comment. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for, uh, for having me. Thank you for providing the opportunity to speak. My name is Francisco Arago. I'm with the International Brotherhood uh, of Electrical Workers, Local 11. Um, so we appreciate the thoughtful analysis by the CPUC and other energy agencies and their efforts to reevaluate the resource needs to promote reliability, electrical, electric services statewide that was published in their most current report and which was presented to you today. The blackouts last summer were a wake up call and an important reminder that we must keep all existing resources in place during the transition to renewable energy. And this includes the AES power plant at Redondo Beach. We are seeing drought conditions, hotter, longer heat, events across the Western US, more load requirements in the West, less energy imports available, transmission constraints and retiring baseload assets in California and the West. Um, we urge the Water Board to consider the recommendation today by SACWIS, which was also reflected in their Mar March report and encourage, and encourage you are able to extend the operations of all OTC power plants through 2023. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you as well. Uh, next, we have Jan Smutney Jones. I apologize, you're still muted. Uh, you should be invited to unmute here, um, and it should allow you then. There you go. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the board. Uh, my name is Jan Smutney Jones. I'm with the Independent Energy Producers, uh, whose members include AES, but also a number of renewable energy companies. Uh, storage companies and other fossil companies. Uh, we've invested heavily in the California uh, energy sector, provide reliable and affordable and clean electricity. Uh, we are urging the board to uh, extend operations of AES Redondo Beach through 2023. Uh, as the energy agencies indicated uh, last summer, uh, we had uh, two uh, outages uh, and uh, we came close uh, a couple of times in September as well. Uh, a recurrence of these events must be avoided. Uh, we do have the capability of avoiding those. Uh, the Redondo Beach units were available for service during the 2020 uh, summer months. It is prudent to keep those uh, units available uh, for dispatch through 2023. And I think the energy agencies earlier uh, have established that need and I won't repeat what they uh, have already uh, reviewed. Uh, the Redondo Beach units have a low capacity factor of around 4%. This means they do not operate most of the time and therefore have a limited impact on marine life uh, or air quality. Uh, and I think as the water board staff has indicated, uh, the daily average uh, OTC use on a statewide scale is projected to be at or below average flow uh, rates from the original OTC policy. Uh, in other words, the OTC goals, uh, you know, subject to this uh, board's uh, uh, purview uh, have been met and extending the operation of Redondo Beach uh, facilities can be accomplished within these OTC goals. Uh, as indicated, the, uh, the energy agencies have been active in addressing the root causes of last year. Um, and this includes uh, the market uh, procurements, uh, market improvements, and efforts to better coordinate and in the extreme heat events with not only in California, but with our neighbors in the West, uh, in the entire West. However, even with this proactive work, uh, the supply system may experience delivery, uh, experience difficulties in meeting uh, our needs in the Western heat event. Uh, the down of each units, uh, uh, the level of insurance to meet these events. I know uh, concern was expressed in earlier meetings last year about climate change. The California uh, energy sector is on a path to meet all of the GHG goals with current GHG emissions at about 40% below 1990 levels. We are leading all other sectors in this. In this. Uh, this has been accomplished by modernizing our fossil fleet, rapidly expanding renewable resources and storage, and the closure of coal plants uh, importing into California. Other Western states are also engaged in lowering their GHG emissions. And this is great news for those of us working on climate change over the last few years. Uh, however, there are new challenges with low hydro generation, reduced Western energy surplus that potentially affects meeting the net energy uh, needs of California. The continued of operation of Redondo Beach facilities will help meet this. To be clear, uh, we need to keep the grid reliable as we move through the transition to a carbon neutral energy sector. We would encourage you to approve the continued operation of the Redondo Beach facility. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the board. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Next, we have Scott Miller. 
Good morning. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the board for uh, having me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Uh, my name is Scott Miller. I'm the executive director of the Western Power Trading Forum, or WPTF. Um, WPTF is a California nonprofit public benefit corporation, and we're a broad based membership of power generators, financial institutions, energy consultants, public utilities, and we all participate actively in the California market and importantly in other such markets in the rest of the West. I'm here to give a brief overview of the California power market, as well as the conditions of the remaining Western region, which are integrally linked together. California, um, as many know, has long been a net importer of power from other Western states during peak usage times. In years past, this was not that much of a problem as there was normally enough uh, uh, variability in usage and resources in the region. California could just pay a bit more money and uh, when needed an import normally plentiful uh, power from other states. The existence of hydropower assets in the Columbia River Basin and even British Columbia, along with the large thermal assets in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and other states, was normally sufficient to ensure adequate supply to meet the demand in almost all circumstances. Recently, however, for a variety of public policy reasons that Jan just uh, enumerated, uh, a lot of legacy uh, generation has been reduced, has been retired in the Western Electric Coordinating Council or WEC area. Uh, this has meant that there's not nearly as much surplus uh, capacity in the Western region that traditionally supplied California's need at peak times. The situation has meant that both California and the entire Western region have considerably fewer resources available to meet customers' demands. This situation was most notably uh, uh, apparent when heat spread over the wide area of the West as it did in August uh, 2021 stage one emergencies meant that some customers in California experienced power shutoffs due to shortages and the power prices in the adjoining West saw prices uh, for power that had not seen, they had not seen in over 20 years. Uh, the events of last summer have had a profound and immediate effect on the power, uh, on the market for power and the, the ability to call on uh, something known as resource adequacy or RA for the upcoming summer. During that difficult time in August, the California Independent System Operator, ISO, suspended sales power outside of California on August 17th to make sure that load uh, could uh, or customer demand could be met in California. The immediate reaction of companies in the Western states adjoining California who are representing customers was to begin to contract for greater and greater levels of power for summer 2021. Naturally, with so much of the West having experienced either power interruptions, the threat of power interruptions or extremely high prices to meet demand there was a regional scramble for available resources. The situation has already been reflected in the forward market traded, uh, 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 the index known as ICE in the form of spreads or differences between power prices at related trading hubs. Uh, most years, the spread between the node, at the Palo Verde nuclear power plant in, in Arizona, and the trading node in Southern California known as SP15 for late summer is around a difference of $25 per megawatt hour. For this summer, the part of August, and particularly the part of the August to September timeframe, the forward market spread between Palo Verde and SP15 has been as high as $100 per megawatt hour. The wideness of this spread or the difference is indicative of buyers of power being very concerned about the availability um, of enough power to meet reliability and customers' needs regional demands are similar to August of last year. In closing, let me say that everyone involved in power procurement and investment in California and the rest of the West are aware of the resources that make up the grid are changing. However, as California considers resources necessary to meet demands in the future, it must contemplate resources available right now, both within the state and what is available in the other parts of the West that have been a traditional resource to ensure reliability and customers' needs. The CAISO, the CEC, and the, and the CPUC have made extraordinary efforts to plan for the upcoming summer. Depending on the conditions, both in California and neighboring states, we may need all the help we can get. Consequently, I strongly support the recommendations of the energy agencies. And I, I want to 
I'll close with one a final note. Uh, the November decision is maybe a little bit too late as on that line. Um, we need a September or at the latest October decision to make sure that we have enough power in the event that um, conditions are similar to what they were in August of last year. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Appreciate your time. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Sean uh, Silva. And Sean, we've invited you to unmute, which on a phone, there you go. Hello, can you hear me? We can, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sean Silva and I'm speaking on behalf of Creed LA today. We're here to support the extension of operations uh, at the AES power plant in Redondo Beach for an additional two years. That's in line with the extensions already granted by the State Water Resources Control Board and in place for the other three power plants. As been uh, highlighted before, not only in meeting rooms like this one, but by nature itself over the last year, California's energy independence and resource adequacy are at risk. It has become abundantly clear that the projected shortfalls in California's energy grid will be a detriment to our state as we enter another hot summer, athwart a drought. With the additional pressures of the pandemic and with many people remaining at home, the energy uncertainty exceeds reasonable limits. I urge the members of the board to address this issue head on and allow this power plant to keep functioning by approving the proposed two-year extension. Thank you. Thank you as well. Appreciate your comments this morning. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Chad Mainder. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Board Chair Esquivel and the Water Board members. My name is Chad Mender, and I'm here on behalf of the LAX Coastal Chamber of Commerce, representing the communities just north of the Los Angeles International Airport. I'm here today speaking in support of the extension of the AES Redondo Beach Power Plant through the end of 2023. The SACWIS reports recommends the extension to guarantee grid reliability. Other once-through cooling facilities have extended through 2023. Why not Redondo Beach? This plant helps provide energy for the entire Los Angeles County region. So we are all invested in making sure that energy is available when it is needed. The Water Board's OTC policy was created a decade ago to help reduce impacts on the marine environment along the coast where plants use ocean water to cool their facility. Since then, great strides have been made and the goal has been largely met. In fact, in 2020, the Water Board issued a report this said any operation extension of Redondo Beach plant would have minimal impacts on the marine environment, given how little it runs. Extending the plant's operation for two additional years is a small price to pay for the insurance it will provide in terms of guaranteeing that the lights stay on during the, the highest demand times. We need to think regionally, not just locally, about how to make sure we can keep the lights on as we transition to renewable energy. We all wanna see these plants, plants like this close but closing them too soon creates an unnecessary risk and may even undermine the public's confidence in renewables. Moving towards renewables is a goal we all share, but as last year's outage showed, we are not quite ready to power our cities on renewables alone. Extending Redondo Beach provides a reliable and cost-effective bridge to the low carbon grid that we are all striving to create. I highly encourage you to support the extension of the AES Redondo Beach power plant through the end of 2023. Thank you so much. You as well. Appreciate your time this morning. Next, we have Desiree. Good morning, all. My name is Desiree, and I'm speaking for all those who could not make it today. The people of Los Angeles support the two-year extension at the AES power plant in Redondo Beach as recommended by Statewide Advisory Committee and cooling on cooling water intake structures. Summer will be another hot one, like last summer. Most likely, there will be another summer at home for most elderly, sick, and young people. Last summer, California's energy shortfalls caused over 2,000 people in my community to be without power for days, lost food, medicine, and suffered through the heat without real options. Please use your authority and support the two-year expanse extension and do not let us be in this position to go through another blackout again. Thank you.
Thank you as well. Uh, next, then we have, I apologize, I lost myself on my scroll here. Uh, Ron Miller. And Chair Escavel, at this point in time, we do not appear to have Mr. Miller, although there are multiple Mr. Millers on the call uh, today, we do not have Ron Miller in our queue. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, I believe we have Cindy Hinch. Good morning. Hi, good morning. My name is Cindy Hench. I'm a resident of Los Angeles County, and I'm speaking in support of the extension of the Redondo Beach Power Plant through the end of 2023. As our state transitions to renewables, we need to be careful not to get ahead of ourselves and overestimate what our renewable capabilities can actually deliver. It's our experience that our grid has let Californians down resulting in power outages of the summer of 2020. With the recommendation from the state's experts warning that our power grid is still, still susceptible to stress during extreme heat waves, the smart choice here seems to be to follow the recommendations to extend the operations at the Redondo Beach Power Plant through 2023. I respect that you guys have a really tough decision on this because the political pressures are real but the risk of power outages cannot be understated. This is an issue of balancing the demands of the local community with the needs of the greater region. This plant is part of a much needed insurance plan for the state's power grid. And until there is reliable and adequate alternative resources, getting rid of what works now in exchange for something that doesn't yet exist will literally leave us in the dark. Thank you. Thank you as well. I appreciate your time this morning. Next, we have Samuel Nieto. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, board chair uh, and board members. My name is Samuel Nieto and I am here to express my support for the two year extension of the EAS power plant in Redondo Beach as recommended by the statewide advisory committee on cooling water intakes and structures. I'm not from Redondo Beach. So that doesn't mean this does not affect me personally. Last year, my community in East Los Angeles suffered days of blackouts during the heat wave in July. This board must show that it represents the needs of everyone in Southern California, not just the affluent. You can affirm your commitment to every Southern Californian by approving the extension for the Redondo Beach power plant, just like the other power plants that all receive full extensions. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you as well, Mr. Nieto. Appreciate your time this morning. Next, we have Mark Miller. Uh, do a quick sound check, Chair. Yeah, good morning. Very good, good, good morning, Chair. Uh, Chair Escobar, board members, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Mark Miller, and I'm the AES market business leader for California and general manager for AES's Southland Generation portfolio. I'm responsible for our overall energy market development activities in California, including support for the development of our solar, wind, and battery energy storage activities, as well as the overall management of our Southland Generation portfolio in California, which includes the Redondo Beach Generating Facility. We're all well aware that 2020 was an important benchmark year for California's transition away from fossil fuel electric generation resources and towards a new renewable energy fleet. As with any transition in wholesale infrastructure replacement, there will be challenges, some of which we experienced last August. The SACRIS indicated in its report, even with the extension of the Redondo Beach compliance date to align with other ones through cooling or other OTC power plant extensions, California may still experience blackouts or brownouts during times when electrical demand is high and imports are unreliable due to similar demands in other states or balancing areas, such as during extreme and prolonged heat waves like we experienced last year. However, this risk would be significantly decreased to the availability of all remaining coastal power plants, including AES's 834 megawatt Redondo Beach generating facility. During August 14th and 15th rolling blackouts, Redondo Beach and 79% of its capacity available to serve the load and generated at a total plant capacity of 71%. Most notably, its available capacity operated at 
90% to serve load and support the reliability grid at critical hours last year during CAISO um, RMO declarations. Even though Redondo Beach only operates at about 3% of its available capacity during the year, it helps provide energy at critical times. Redondo Beach generating facilities needed to operate through December 31st, 2023 to provide responsible transition to a carbon-free energy future. We at AES are committed to working with each of you and other state and local officials to continue to make this facility available. As we indicated last year to the Water Board, we asked for timely notice of the potential need to maintain the Redondo Beach facility for operations post-21 and secure the required MPDS and TSO permits before the end of this year. From an air permit perspective, the current Title V operating permit is valid through February 4th, 2024, fully supporting the operation of the facility through an OTC extension at the end of 2023. It is also critically important that we maintain the skilled operations and maintenance staff and continue the investment to maintenance and maintenance activities to ensure the facility remains in a high state of operational readiness. Our customers, also known as load serving entities, for example, CCAs, investor-owned utilities, and other public electric service providers like Merced Irrigation District and others serving load in Cal ISO all require resource adequacy capacity or RA to meet their generation resource requirements to ensure electric system reliability in the CAISO balancing area. These customers require identification of specific generation units that will provide this RA. The CPUC and the Cal ISO require load serving entities to demonstrate that they have sufficient RA capacity for the upcoming year by November 1st. With only six months to go until 2022 RA load serving entities showing this year, we would like to advise that the timeline for the water board action is extremely tight to ensure availability for 2022. Any advance on this schedule would bring important visibility and stability to the RA market. Although AES sold the 50 acres of the Redondo Beach property, including the site of the OTC units in March of 2020, AES signed a lease with the new owner as part of the sale transaction to allow for continued operation of the Redondo Beach OTC units through 2023. This, release, this lease will allow the Redondo Beach facility to continue to operate through the end of 2023 should the water board determine it is necessary to support electric system reliability. Finally, the, AES, the entire AES team and I look forward to working with our customers, local communities, and within which we operate, the Water Board and its staff, and other key stakeholders to continue to support electric system reliability and a responsible transition to carbon-free energy by authorizing a two-year OTC extension of the Redondo Beach facility. Thank you once again for the opportunity to speak today. You as well, Mr. Miller. I appreciate your comments today. Uh, Next, we have Brian Germain, but I don't believe he is uh, in the meeting with us. And so, uh, Mr. Germain, if you're watching from one of the web streams, um, please do email the clerk of the board uh, to receive the link to get in here. I think then we can move on to Tommy uh, Favot. Favet, apologies. Yes, thank you, board chair. Uh, good morning. Uh, and fellow uh, board members, uh, my name is Tommy Favai. I represent IBEW, Electrical Workers Local Union 11 in Los Angeles. On behalf of our 13,000 members, uh, we urge the approval of item four um, when it comes to the recommendation from SACWIS uh, on their approved and recommendation uh, to extend the OTC policy uh, for two years. Uh, I understand this is not an actionable uh, item uh, today, but when it does become uh, an actionable item in the near future, we urge your support uh, to extend the OTC policy. Thank you. Thank you as well. Really appreciate you taking the time this morning. Uh, next, we have Hector Rosales. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Doing well, thank you. Thank you um, for joining us. My name is Hector Rosales and I'm speaking on behalf of Local 78 today. We fully support the extension of the operations at the AES power plant in Redondo Beach for another two years. Like the other power plants, California needs to be able to draw on reliable, res on reliable sources of energy to meet its needs. Now is not the right time with summer around the corner to limit our energy resources. Please approve the two-year extension at the Redondo Beach plant. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you as well. Next, we have Doug Summers. Mr. Summers, good morning, you should be. board members. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Doug Summers. I'm speaking on behalf of UA Local 709 Sprinkler Fitters. We are in support of the extension of the operations at the AES power plant in Redondo Beach for an additional two years. Now more than ever, we must maintain and strengthen California's energy independence. This power plant provides good jobs and keeps our state responsive to power needs. This power plant is an asset to the state. The extension will help keep our state's power grid ready for the coming months. Please approve the two-year extension at the Redondo Beach Power Plant. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Summers. Uh, next, we have Gus Torres. So, Chair Esquivel, uh, Mr. Torres does not show up in the Zoom platform as having a microphone. However, we do have a phone number that has never been tied to a name. Uh, Mr. Torres, if you are on a phone and uh, wish to speak, can you press, press star nine now? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and ask him to unmute with a star six, and we think we have our last unidentified speaker then. So, Mr. Torres, go ahead and, yep, there you go. Good morning, Mr. Torres. Mr. Torres, it, uh, if you're speaking, it no. shows you're unmuted on our end. Um, hello, are you there now? I believe we lost him. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Gus Torres. I'm speaking on behalf of UA Local 250. There are 6,300 members, five fitters, welders, and apprentices. And we are in full support of the extension of the operations at the AES plant on the beach for additional two years. This will be a critical change for the present moment. This plan needs to be able to draw on reliable sources energy to meet, to meet its needs. Now is not the right time with summer around the corner to limit our energy resources. Please approve the two-year extension at the Redondo Beach Flat. The time is out left. Thank you, Mr. Torres. Um, thank you in speaking and support today of um, it sounding like extension. Sorry, your I think your audio was a little low, but I, I think I heard uh, most of it. So thank you very much. Uh, next, then we have Zach uh, Strasters. Hi, good afternoon, Chair Esquivel and committee. My name is Pastor Zag with Anchor Church Downtown LA. And here's what's at stake. 10,000 megawatts are up in the air for the summer with a potential 500 megawatt increased demand. That's 10,500 megawatts estimated. Now, based on what we expect with our environment, we are going to continue to be experiencing strong heat waves. The 30 year peak simply exposed what's to come. The communities affected nearby, such as Lawndale, Gardena, and Hawthorne, that are pulling from shared grids will be the ones hit hardest. It's sad that in this racial climate, these predominantly Black and Latino communities will get the de facto shrug in favor of a political push for another park. Edison handles Redondo Beach's electricity, and a 500-megawatt upward demand and an unknown number of unknown sounds like the apologies are going to roll downhill. Black, brown, and all lives matter. The first death will be the last word in the wisdom or lack thereof in this decision. Contracting from all necessary resources and how these new resources will perform, to quote, is what we know by experience will impact those most vulnerable. All the way back in 2019, the statewide advisory committee on cooling water intake structures determined that those closures may cause power grid shortages. Two years is sufficient potentially to build another power supply to protect the nearby communities. We recognize that there is an unavoidable and probably even an encouraged termination date for this plan. However, deferring to some African wisdom in support of our black brothers and sisters who would be most likely to be hit hardest, haraka, haraka, hyena, baraka, it means hasty, hasty is without the blessing. Convince us people won't lose their power, their medicine go bad, their children and elderly be suffering in the heat. 
convince us that you won't once again threaten the health of the underprivileged in favor of what will undoubtedly become a city park. Remember Jesus' words in Matthew 22, 39. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Staff mentioned the hearing for November, but given the urgency and need, we strongly urge this board to take up the item no later than September. Support the extension to December 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strasters. Next, we have Christine uh, Bose. Good morning, my name is Christine Boss and I'm calling in on behalf of the Long Beach Area Chamber of Commerce to support the two-year extension of the AES power plant. The chamber understands that our businesses cannot operate to their total capacity without reliable energy supplies, threatening jobs, innovation, and economic growth. To support local energy production, we need reliable, tw reliable energy 24-7. Implications of power shutoffs, should the state fail to adequately plan for the shortfalls, um, are concerning. These shutoffs can have significant negative effects on the ability of businesses to operate successfully. Our businesses rely on electrical energy to keep the lights on and power and our power operations going. A power disruption, even a small one, can cost thousands of dollars. The Long Beach Area Chamber of Commerce urges the State Water Resource Control Board to ensure that the state has an adequate plan for reliability. We support the modest extension of the power plant as the state works to secure additional resources for addressing the long-term reliability solution. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bose. Appreciate your time and comments today. Next, we have Paula uh, Garez. Hi, thank you so much for letting me speak today. I really appreciate it. I'm uh, I wanna give my support to keeping the plant open to avoid blackouts and that it's an important insurance policy for the in energy grid reliability. So I hope that you will extend it the two years that is asked for. Thank you very much. Thank you as well. Thank you for your time this morning. Uh, next, we have David Voss. Good morning. Muted. You are. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, board Chairman Escavel and board members, my name is David Voss. I'm a resident of Playa del Rey, just to the north of the plant. I'm also an avid user of the bay that would be potentially impacted, but not so much anymore. Um, board Chairman, you made a comment as a preamble to today's meeting about a lot of what you do is how we deal with difficult circumstances. Those were your words. And I listened to that because without getting this extension for two years, we simply don't have the capacity to deal with difficult circumstances. We don't have the options that we need when there is a quote unquote load shed event. A load shed event is a euphemism. It's when the power goes out. It's what happens in third world countries, not what should be happening in the United States. The SACWIS report recommended the extension to guarantee grid reliability, and we're entitled to have that. And it's important to note that when I was commenting about the Bay, the Water Board's OTC, the once through cooling policy that was created a decade ago to help reduce impacts on the marine environment along the coast where plants use ocean water to cool the facilities, that since then great strides have been made and the goal has been largely met. In fact, in 2020, the Water Board issued a report that said any operational extension of the Redondo Beach plant would have minimal impacts on the marine environment given how little it runs. So given the fact that other OTC facilities have been extended already through 2023, why not Redondo? Extending the plant's operation for two additional years is a small price to pay for the insurance it provides in terms of guaranteeing that those lights stay on during high demand periods. This power plant operates only at three to 5% capacity, but when we need it, we need it. When there's a heat wave event, it's throughout the West and trying to rely on imported power has proven just last summer to be a false idea because when we wanna buy power from Nevada, but Nevada is hot too, they don't have power to sell us. So we need to be able to be prepared to be able to survive on our own. Cal ISO just came out on May 12 with their press release and I'm sure you've all seen it. But the Cal ISO report said that Southern California grid is susceptible to stress during extreme heat waves like the one we experienced last summer. It says, and I quote, there are remaining risks to reliability. That Cal also noting that California hydroelectric supplies will be significantly lower than normal this year. And in particular talked about the probability, not possibility, probability of rotating power outages. The energy regulators seem to think that Redondo is an important part of the strategy 
keep the lights on. They're the experts. We should listen to them. So I urge you when it comes time to support the extension of Redondo. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Voss. Appreciate your time and comments this morning. Next, we have Christopher Ortega. Mr. Chair Escobar, we have given Mr. Ortega the opportunity to unmute. And at this point, he is not. So I'd suggest moving on to the next speaker. Yeah, thank you. Next, uh, we then have Mike uh, Costigan. Mr. Costigan, uh, on a phone, you would hit star six to unmute. And again, at this point, he's had multiple opportunities, Chair Escavel. Uh, yep, we will continue to move on. And anyone that um, is maybe just having a hard time unmuting or such, we can come back to you. Just um, uh, we'll just keep moving on for the interest of time. Next, we have Veronica Martinez. It's Martinez. Hello, my name is Veronica Martinez, and I'm representing the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 11. We represent over 12,000 electrical professional workers in Los Angeles County. First, I want to thank you thank you and other energy agencies for this opportunity and for their commitment to statewide electric reliability is an important step towards the right direction but we need a smooth transition and we need to build confidence in california's energy reliability at this time the most prudent path forward and for the years to come is to preserve existing baseload and ra resources to mitigate future energy shortages we urge the water board to consider the recommendation today by SACWIS which was also reflected in their March report and encouraged the extension of operations of all OTC power plants through 2023. Thank you so much. Thank you as well. I appreciate your comments this morning. Uh, next, we have Rodney uh, Cabos. I get it. Good morning. Good, mo good morning. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Chair Esquivel and the board for for allowing me to to speak this morning, and 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 all those behind the scenes that make these uh, meetings possible. So, again, my name is Rodney Cobos. I represent uh, the Southern California Pipe Trades, uh, which is uh, consists of over eighteen thousand uh, members in the piping uh, industry. And if I could combine all the previous speakers. Uh, comments in one, I, I, I would. But uh, again, I, I, I'm pretty much straightforward. You know, the thing of, of uh, having energy reliability and, uh, and the many jobs that, that the uh, AES power plant uh, supports. And I, I just, I can't uh, urge the board enough uh, to approve the extension. So again, I, I, I thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you as well, Mr. Cabos. Uh, I believe Joel Barton is not on the platform with us uh, currently. Uh, and so we would move on to Joe Raymond. And Chair Escavel, we have given uh, Mr. Raymond a couple opportunities to unmute at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we will move on to Nicholas Harvey. And you should be asked to unmute here, Mr. Harvey as well. There we are, good morning. Oh, there we go. I think you guys can hear me now. We can. Um, Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. I am Nicholas Harvey representing United Association Local 114. Um, and I'm just going to make my comments really brief, as I know there are a lot of people that are here to speak and just uh, say that I do stand with uh, Southern California Pipe Trades in support of keeping the AES Redondo Beach power plant open. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Appreciate you taking the time this morning. Uh, next, we have Wyatt uh, Stiles.
Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Good morning. Thank you, board chair, board members. Uh, my name is Wyatt Stiles, uh, representing over a thousand members in local union 398. And uh, I, stand in, uh, I stand in support with Southern California Pipe Trades uh, in keeping the AES Redondo Beach power plant open. Great. Thank you so much, Thank Mr. You. Stiles. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Sean uh, Keone Ellis. Oh, I apologize. I should look at my ticker as well, I believe. Um, and then we'll go to Ron Miller. Good morning, everybody and, and board members. I hope you guys are having a great morning and a blessed morning. Um, my name is Sean Ellis. I'm representing Local 230 and uh, all of our members across Southern California. Um, look, I'm a South Bay resident. I used to be before I joined the Marine Corps. I grew up in Carson, California, which is a neighboring city to Rondondo Beach. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a little something that we I haven't really heard yet in this great meeting. I'm talking about the workers and what that plant brings to uh, our community. And, and I'll just share real quickly. The median household income of Rondondo Beach, California is $112,000 a year. OK, and if you shut that plant down, you effectively have removed a job, a career, um, the ability to have living wages and to be able to afford that home. It's a lot of the reason why our membership and a lot of these pipe fitters, plumbers are working across United States, actually in states that don't share the same labor laws that we do in California or the same dignity on the job site. So I support um, the Southern California pipe trades and keeping this power plant open for the next two years and coming up with solutions for the future in this climate crisis. And I just wanna urge you guys that the majority of these workers are gonna work in these plants are not from Redondo Beach. They're gonna be from Carson, California, Wilmington, California, where the median income is $50,000 a year within the Los Angeles County. Um, and I, I wanna urge you guys that you shut that down. We lost Toyota's plant in Torrance, which costs us thousands of jobs. And if you're gonna shut down another powerhouse, you potentially could be doing that. So. Um, thank you for your time, uh, board members. I appreciate uh, you giving me the opportunity to speak. And thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, next, we have Ron Miller. And Mr. Miller, uh, you should be invited to unmute. There you are. Good morning. Thank you, and uh, thanks for having me. I'm Ron Miller, Executive Secretary of the LA Orange County Building Trades. We represent 140,000 skilled and trained men and women in LA and Orange County. A few of them you've heard today, it's 48 local unions and district councils. And I urge you to support the staff's recommendation for the uh, power plants. You know, in this time of transition, we're deeply immersed in building the alternative energy projects. We've just completed a nice battery storage uh, component in the city of Long Beach to go along with a, an AES plant. And these are very important in the time of transition to make sure that we keep the grid up and running. And uh, you just have to read the news to see how important it is. So please support the uh, staff's recommendation. Let's keep these power plants open until we don't need them anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you as well, Mr. Miller. Really appreciate your time this morning. Next, we have Adolfo Navarro. And Mr. Navarro, you should be invited here to either share your camera and uh, unmute. Good morning, board members. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Adolf Navarro. I'm representing Plumbers and Fitters Local 761. And I also stand with Southern California Pipe Trees in support of keeping the AES Redondo Beach power plant open. Thank you. Thank you as well. Appreciate your time this morning. Uh, next, we have Ben Perez. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ben Perez. I'm a resident of Alley County, representing Local 345. And I stand in support uh, of keeping the AES power plant open. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you as well. Next, we have William Estes. Good morning. I am William Estes, representing Plumbers and Pipefitters Local 460. 
I stand with the Southern California pipe trades in support of keeping the AES Redondo Beach power plant open. Thank you. Thank you as well. And then uh, next we have Tim Redondo. And Mr. Redondo, you should be invited here uh, to unmute and or share your camera. How are we doing there, there you got me? Yeah, now we have you, good morning. Okay, thank you board chair and board members for letting me speak uh, this morning. Uh, again, my name is Tim Redondo. Uh, I'm representing UA Local 484, plumbers, pipe fitters, welders, and apprentices. And I stand with the Southern California Pipe Trades in support of keeping the AES, Redondo Beach Power Plant open. Uh, and that's all I've got. Thank you for your time. Thank you as well, Mr. Redondo. Uh, next then we have Caitlin Kalua. Sorry, Ms. Kalua, go ahead and try to unmute again. All right, there Good we morning. are. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Escobel and members of the board. Um, my name is Caitlin Kalua, and I'm the policy manager for the California Coast Keeper Alliance. My comments today concern mitigation requirements for the proposed OTC extension, and that while today's agenda item is an informational item, we ask the board to use its authority to direct staff to consult with the Ocean Protection Council and relevant agent energy agencies to impose an additional annual fee for the continued use of this facility if an extension is approved. Imposing additional mitigation is the minimum the State Water Board can do to address both grid reliability and address the ongoing comprehensive co harm caused by OTC power plants. The existing interim mitigation was designed to bring OTC power plants into compliance before the original compliance deadline. And we encourage the board, when the time comes to take action and potentially adopt this extension, to essentially impose two mitigation fees. The first being the existing ongoing interim mitigation fee. And second, an additional mitigation fee for each year that the plant remains online with the updated cooling system. We, su we uh, ultimately suggest that this additional fee be based either on a flat yearly fee or an additional fee based on a percentage of the interim mitigation that is assigned for the actual use of the facility. Um, and that concludes my comment. Thank you, thank you this morning. Thank you as well, Ms. Kalua. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time and your continued engagement on these issues. Uh, next we have Justin Walters. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, glad to be here. I just wanna say that uh, uh, my name is Justin Walters. I'm re representing UA Plumbers Local 78, and that I also stand with the Southern, Califi Southern California Pipe Trades in support of keeping the AES Redondo Beach Power Plant open. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment this morning. Uh, next then we have Brandon Dawson. Good morning, Chair and members. Brandon Dawson, uh, Acting Director of Sierra from California. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak today on this item. Well, we have concerns about the granting of an extension and would be happy to have further conversations with you all about those concerns prior to the time you take action. But today I'm here to ask that you all inquire more about the status of leak remediation that was supposed, that was supposed to be the result of the settlement between CARB and the Redondo Beach facility. In 2014, CARB and two AES facilities, Alamitos and Redondo, settled after CARB discovered that the facilities exceeded their SF6 air pollutant uh, criteria due to the facilities leaking SF6. Uh, for those of you unaware, SF6 is nearly 24,000 times more potent than CO2. And unfortunately, it's not clear from the public record that these facilities have fixed those leaks. So I'm asking you all and the other relevant state agencies that are part of SOCWIS, how can we ensure um, that the agencies are protecting the environment as you contemplate an extension if the public is unaware of whether or not those, remedy, those leaks have been remedied or not? Um, we'd love to have further conversations with SOCWIS and the other agencies that are part of this, especially CARB. We really want to see whether or not these leaks have been remedied before we even consider granting an extension further. Thank you. Thank you as well. Appreciate your comments. Board Member Firestone. Uh, I was just going to add a note for the um, air districts when they come back for future ones, if they could just help address that issue um, in their comments and presentation. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Board Member. Uh, next, we have Luis uh, Perez.
And Chair Escavel, we have given Mr. Perez um, a couple opportunities to unmute at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we'll move on to uh, Kyler Joaquin. And Mr. Joaquin, you are uh, unmuted at this point. And just in case you're at a computer uh, in the lower left corner of your Zoom window where there was the button you used to unmute, there is a little arrow next to it that you can select an alternate, you can click on that arrow and select an alternate input, like a different microphone or headset if you have one. You wanna try again? Yeah, still not hearing your audio. So again, next to the little uh, microphone in the lower left corner of your Zoom window, there's a little, it's like a carrot um, a, a pointing up. It's right before you see the start video or stop video button. And if you click on that arrow, it'll I give you- different... There you yeah, go. There you are. I apologize. It was saying it was saying that I need to be let in by the administrator, and then I was not in, and then I turned my video on. My apologies for the confusion. Now that's I okay. Great deal of brevity. I am going to align my comments with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers who called in in the UA Plumbers and Pipe Fitters. My name is Kyler Joaquin, calling in on behalf of the California State Association of Electrical Workers, the Coalition of Utility Employees, the California State Pipe Trades Council, and Western States Council of Sheet Metal Workers. We as well appreciate the analysis conducted by the CPUC and other state agencies and the efforts to reevaluate the resource adequacies needed to promote reliability in the electric sector in California. Nothing is more important than to build confidence in our energy future. And that is to simply stated, make sure we keep the power and lights on in the state of California. We respectfully urge the Water Board to consider the recommendations today made by SACWIS, which encourage the board to extend the operations of all OTC power plants, specifically the AES power plant in Redondo Beach through 2023, thereby extending our members the ability to earn well-paying, sustainable livings and providing Californians with reliable power in our ever-changing ever ongoing climate. Thank you very much and my apologies for the technical difficulties. Oh, no, no apologies in the least. Just thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time today, Mr. Thank you Martin. very much, Chair School. Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. And then that brings us to Todd Golden. And Mr. Golden, was that you, Mr. Laffer? I was going to say, we have given Mr. Golden multiple opportunities to unmute at this point in time. Okay. Thank you. And uh, and then Mr. Golden, again, if you, uh, we can come back to folks that uh, are in the queue that, again, we had to pass over because uh, there was maybe a technical difficulty. So uh, I think that brings us to Joe Raymond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board members. Thank you for seeing me this morning. I'm Joe Raymond, representing UA Local 364, Plumbers and Pipe Fitters. I too stand with the Southern California pipe trades as well as the other trades in support of keeping the AES Redondo Beach plant, uh, power plant open and running. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you as well. Appreciate your time this morning. I believe that brings us actually to the end of our public commenters. And so I wanna actually thank very much uh, folks that uh, kind of were succinct, helped us get through this because we're running a little ahead of schedule as I was anticipating. So that's good. Um, we are coming to the 12 o'clock here. I'd like to go ahead and uh, let's continue to just close out this item amongst us. Um, any other feedback or thoughts from, from folks, um, please do share uh, questions as well. Although we know, I believe, um, at least Mr. Randolph and some others had to head off to uh, other budget items. So um, I don't, you know, for to my mind right now, I don't have an immediate question. Um, I, again, I, we're hearing concern uh, about the impact, certainly about the extension. Some of those outside, candidly, of really the purview of what the once through cooling policy is. There are, you know, embedded here discussions, certainly around climate change, our responses to it, grid reliability, and then also the balance of continuing to transition uh, into the, the 21st century and this, the energy systems of them, but realizing that there are a lot of fast moving challenges for us 
Um, and so this board certainly, when it comes to this plant and its extension of use, uh, is called to, to, to have a question that, again, is, you know, you look at the once through cooling policy, you look at the, the goals and what um, the intention of the board was then, which wasn't to pull us off of fossil fuels, but instead to address the impacts of these plants on near ocean conditions. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have current uh, any questions. I think that would be um, answerable. Um, I share my uh, concern with my fellow board colleague, uh, uh, board member Firestone, when it comes to just the community impacts. Uh, and and here, I mean, it, it is not lost on me that these are impacts. Ultimately, when we talk about extension or not, that in, that um, are across the state. Uh, when we talk about energy reliability and that the the functioning of this uh this this plant is in the redondo community and i think for us it's balancing everyone's uh interests and needs and or at least for myself certainly which i can speak for um but i know my colleagues are also uh you know very much as you've heard uh, not just on this item but we'll hear on item number five and others it's a balance um there are incredible pressures and competing needs here um, and so just anyway, thank very much everyone's uh, comments today going quickly and but still being additive and helping us understand uh, the importance and impacts of uh, this potential vote, which will be here in the fall and we will be working toward. Colleagues, any, any questions, follow up uh, direction, um, please. I think the only the only thing I'd add, um, just in terms of requests for information for our next hearing, I don't have any comments more on on this one, and I appreciate the information and engagement. Um, for the next one, I just would love to get some more information on um, what we've learned and reflections from, um, you know, our sister agencies on um, how the mitigation program has worked in terms of its original intent when we adopted it. Um, I think, you know, to some degree, that's, that's a best guess on what's going to mitigate impacts. And I think it would help us to understand whether that was successful in this case. Um, so that, that's, uh, that and the air quality impacts are ones just I would request that we get some more information in the next um, agenda item on this. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, board member. Vice Chair or board member McGuire. Uh, sure. So for me, I'll just I'll make this brief as well. Um, I just want to reflect on the fact that um, last year we did go through a very extensive process to amend uh, the ones through cooling policy. Um, and Redondo was a was a big part of that conversation. And so here, you know, I completely understand the presentation from the SACWIS committee members today um, and their concerns about grid reliability and all the different fact commuting factors here. And I appreciate all the stakeholder comments as well. And so for me, you know, what we have, I believe that what staff will be working on is a two-year uh, recommended extension. And so some, an area that I would like to better understand, I understand there's concerns about, significant concerns about 2022, um, and that there was, you know, there's ongoing concerns because of growing demand for 2023 and some uncertainty about procurement. Um, but there was a, a caveat there, which is that if um, it was determined that Redondo would not be needed in 2023, it could still potentially uh, be decommissioned earlier. And so I guess, I'd be interested in hearing more about that and what those triggers might be uh, that we might learn more about sometime in 2022, I suppose, to better understand how we can monitor and have assurances that, um, you know, if there is a window or, or factors change favorably um, such that, you know, the plant compliance deadline could be moved up, uh, what would those look like? So no need to respond today, just something I'd like to flag for future discussion. Thank you. Thank you, board member. Vice Chair. Just a few quick comments. Just want to thank um, everyone for their uh, comments and uh, remembering that this was a really tough um, uh, uh, process that we went through last year. And then um, 
not too long after our decision, we ended up seeing these issues with grid reliability. For me, grid reliability is pr probably the top issue that I will be looking at. And so I just really appreciate that we have this information item coming out early. There's lots of information in there from SACWIS. And so just really wanna encourage those that um, are concerned uh, with this extension uh, to go through uh, what's been reported on. And if you have any concerns or challenges, um, uh, please um, comment accordingly. Um, we know that you don't want the extension. And I understand that if I, if I lived in the community, I, I think I would have those concerns as well. But really, um, just want to encourage folks to help us to hone in on the decision related to grid reliability. And if you, um, if commenters have concerns with what's coming out of SACWIS, um, uh, please provide, you know, a, a, a different view and uh, the evidence upon which that different view is based. So um, with that, I just um, really uh, look forward to further updates and appreciate uh, some of the comments that um, my fellow board members made as well regarding the additional information. Thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you all. Um, again, it's going to, I'm sure, be another difficult uh, decision, but here, uh, having information, understanding, and weighing, and um, bringing other folks along as well, so everyone can see how we're doing our homework, how we're making our decision making on something not easy, um, but that's just, um, there's no shortage of not easy things. And that's just the way that is. So we're here to, to keep the faith in that decision-making, um, weigh these, these uh, issues uh, uh, appropriately, and just thank everyone's engage engagement around it. And on this, there's no decision today. Um, and to Vice Chair's point, I'm glad this is before us on an informational item sooner rather than later, so that we can spend uh, these next months uh, engaged as appropriate uh, and otherwise uh, evaluating the decision and coming to a decision point then in the fall. So thank you, everyone. Uh, that concludes, I think, this item then. We are um, on time and on track. And I, again, I appreciate everyone um, cooperating and, and helping do so to have a 30 minute lunch. And then we will uh, actually, because we said we will hit uh, item number five at two o'clock, we wanna keep that to help uh, for everyone's scheduling purposes. So that'll bring us to about an hour and a half before that would happen after lunch, um, You know, maybe an hour and 15, because you know, it can give us an extra 15 for lunch at least. And maybe we would either take item number six or number seven and looking to my fellow board colleagues here uh, and maybe even uh, the advice of our uh, chief counsel on what would fit best for, I guess, that hour or so uh, prior to getting to number two uh, if we should go ahead and take item number seven or, or item number six out of um, order. I'm thinking perhaps item number six can be um, probably something that we can uh, take up the, the hour and get to two o'clock on. Uh, item number seven might, uh, we don't have commenters on either one, I will notice. Um, so it will just be our board discussion amongst us. Do you have any uh, preferences from my colleagues? Or from the, or from uh, uh, Mr. Lawfer. Well, certainly defer to the pleasure of the board. However, I will say I think you probably could get both items six and seven done in an hour and fifteen minute block. Okay. So if the board wanted to go that route, I think that'd be fair, and we can make sure staff are ready to roll. Let's do that's, that then. That's what I was thinking as well. Okay. Trying to Great. see if we can squeeze them both in. All right, we will, let's squeeze. And so uh, we will return here at 12.35. We'll give us all, uh, or you know, 12.45. Let's give ourselves a little more time then, an extra 10 minutes, because we didn't take a break this morning. Um, and so 12.45, we'll, uh, we'll return here. And then we will continue on to item, we'll skip item number five, uh, continue on to item six and seven, and try to get those done before we hit two o'clock with item number five. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate the flexibility and uh, the good morning and what I know will be a great afternoon. So thank you, we'll see you soon.
All right, everyone. I think we can start to gather back. I'm, I obviously have a change of scenery here. I'm actually now in my office. Um, I quickly uh, made it over here. I, I wasn't actually um, feeling sensitive about leaving Michael alone down in the, the board hearing room, although I was tempted to go down there and join him. Sean, can you say something just so I can make sure I can hear folks? Yeah, you're, you're coming through loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that brings us back here to uh, our next item then, which is an update on urban uh, water conservation. Okay, I can unmute myself this time. Um, <laughs> good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, <laughs> good to have you with us again. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, uh, so uh, my name is Marielle Pinheiro and I am a research data specialist with the Office of Research Planning and Performance. I'll be providing the urban water conservation update for the March 2021 data set. Next slide, please. As of last week, the report completion rate for March 2021 data is slightly above 90%. We're still not at 100% report completion, but the vast majority of agencies are only behind by one or two months at this point. So progress. Next slide, please. The March 2021 total production is estimated to be about 124 billion gallons for the 411 urban water systems a supplier is reporting. While this value is not quite as high as that seen in March of 2015, it does exceed production volumes for the post drought years. The upcoming summer months will be the true test of the state's overall supply, especially given historically low precipitation and snowpack. Next slide, please. In contrast to March 2020, which saw partial relief from dry conditions due to some rain, March 2021 had almost no rain. This is reflected in the calculated statewide RGPCD with per capita use increasing to statewide average of 73 gallons per day. It is noting, it's worth noting that this residential number includes both indoor and outdoor use. So without March rain, it's likely that there was an early uptick in outdoor irrigation. Next slide, please. When the update to the reporting regulation was finalized, we added a simple yes no question that allows reporters to indicate whether their agency experienced a shortage of 10% or more during the reporting month. Responding yes to this question reveals a supplemental section of the survey that asks reporters what types of strategies their agency is using to address the reported shortage, which I'll be talking about in future slides. This new question has revealed that since September 2020, a consistent fifth of suppliers are reporting shortages. Next slide, please. The figure on the right shows the statewide distribution of responses to the water shortage question with yes responses indicated in red. Mapping the responses doesn't appear to reveal any immediate spatial trends in shortages as there are agencies responding yes directly next to agencies that have not done so. The image on the left zooms into the South Coast region where a large percentage of the yes responses come from. The colors of the dots in this image are RGPCD values with dots in red and yellow representing higher per capita residential use and black outlines around the dots denoting a response of yes to the shortage question. We see in this image that there is also no apparent connection between RGPCD and declaring a shortage, except to note that none of the agencies with the highest per capita use in the region have declared a shortage yet. Without having more information about agencies' water sources, we have to rely on reported responses to gauge the resiliency of the water supply. Next slide, please. I was just going to flag that um, that's something I think we could readily get from the Division of Drinking Water uh, cross check. I know the Division of Drinking Water um, checks um, uh, and as uh, now with the new executive order actually has some ability to uh, find out uh, more detail about sources. 
um, like how many, uh, what, and, and of what you know, sort of known um, quantity or quality as well. So um, just to flag uh, for, for you, uh, Ms. Pinheiro, and, and then also the Division of Drinking Water, that that's a, an area I think that we could uh, probably uh, generate some further data. And Mr. McGuire. Yeah, I... Oh, sorry. And you can. No, uh, I was just going to say, I think that's a, that's a good, that's a good point to make and I'll, I'll reach out to them. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I, I was just, I, when I, when I saw the, these slides, it just, for me, um, brought up the question of what, what really constitutes a shortage, I guess, by the way it's defined here. Um, only be, and I asked that only because I, I haven't heard, you know, other than a few uh, small systems, I haven't heard of any, um, and particularly in the Russian River watershed and some other areas in Northern California, I haven't heard a lot of actual shortages being reported, especially by agencies in Southern California as of yet. So I was wondering if you could just um, expand a little bit on what shortage means by the way you define it. Yeah, so it's actually, I know that it's it's somewhere in code and I don't have the um, actual um, uh, part of it in front of me, um, but it is something that is specifically defined um, and that is in the question that we ask. Okay, I think just maybe for future updates, it'll be good to, because, you know, as this drought continues to evolve, and we really start to get a more acute sense of what systems and communities are struggling here with providing <clears throat> reliable water supply. It'll just be, and, and how that then dovetails with, um, you know, mandatory versus voluntary conservation efforts. It'll just be important to have a good, you know, clear picture of, of what we're looking at here. But thank you for your information. Yes, yeah, definitely. Point. Yeah, and I and I'm sorry, Ms. Perrin, I, I was gonna just uh, perhaps make the point, as I understand it, this is self-reported, um, you know, identification of a shortage, but with some criteria, because it's obviously built into the question, at least, that we're asking. And so to board member <coughs> McGuire's point, we'll just want to get a little more detail into that. That is correct. And and it is, well, I'll get into it in later slides, but um, yes, the, the, the shortages are, you know, sort of self-determined, so um, that does factor into this. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, the supplemental shortage response section of the monthly report, it's a series of checkboxes that ask reporters what kinds of strategies their agencies currently using to address the reported shortage. So these strategies are divided into a few overarching categories, which are the top 10 are shown here. Um, restrictions on use, shown in blue, are the most common type of conservation strategy among these agencies whether it be restrictions on types of water use or on the timing of water use. The second most common type of conservation strategy is public communication, whether to the general public via their website and social media or with more targeted messages, such as emails to their customers. 20% of agencies, that's the red circle, notify customers who are using water inefficiently, such as people who um, consistently irrigate to the point of water running into the street. On the demand side, which is the orange circle, 14% of agencies offer residential or CII water, un uh, water audits to customers to identify any possible opportunities to reduce water use. Next slide, please. So this next segment of the pre uh, presentation will take a more regional focus as requested by the board members last month. The Russian River Basin was one of the first areas in the state to fall under the emergency drought declaration at the end of April. Many of the cities within the region have proposed or committed to reductions relative to 2020 already, and this region has experienced a 5 GPCD drop in the regional March RGPCD, while overall statewide use went up relative to March 2020. Next slide, please. The city of Santa Rosa is one of the impacted service areas in the Russian River Basin. As of the beginning of May, it has only received 38% of historical average rain. Santa Rosa purchases 95% of its water from Sonoma Water, which is experiencing its own issues due to correspondingly low supply in Lake Sonoma and Lake Mendocino. Sonoma Water adopted a 20% voluntary conservation resolution on May 3rd, and uh, the Santa Rosa City Council is discussing a similar measure um, today. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. 
During the last drought, Santa Rosa did not experience supply shortages, but the city council passed an initial voluntary 20% conservation resolution nonetheless, which later became mandatory. This resulted in an overall 25% reduction in customer use relative to 2013. As of this March, Santa Rosa's per capita residential use is 48.3 GPCD. And as previously mentioned, the city is considering a 20% voluntary reduction resolution. The council will wait to invoke any state of the water shortage contingency plan until Sonoma Water determines Santa Rosa's allocation in July, at which point it will take action based on the corresponding stage. Possible actions will be contingent on the stage invoked. For example, hiring temporary staff to help implement the shortage plan. Um, communication protocols will involve both constant dialogue with state regulators and public information campaigns via a diverse array of media and ad buys. Water waste patrols and use restrictions will help reduce demand for less drastic shortage levels. And if the shortage is more than 30%, then there will be per sector water allocations. Next slide, please. And just finally, some updates on uh, the water conservation legislation. On Earth Day, um, the department and the state water board announced our joint recommendations. For the 2020 standard, we recommend no change to the indoor standard. So it will remain at um, 55 GPCD. Um, in 2025, that will um, be 47 GPCD. And then for the 2030 standard, we will be recommending 42 GPCD. Last week, the department made the draft report available on its website. Um, to access the appendices, members of the public must email the department and request them. Later this week on uh, the 21st of May, um, DWR will be hosting a public workshop on the indoor residential water use standard. Um, per statute, DWR is to provide their recommendations on the remaining standards, such as the outdoor residential water use standard by October 1st of this year. Meanwhile, um, the state water board's conservation team um, is completing analyses and developing the rulemaking documents required as part of the regular rulemaking process. So we anticipate starting the formal rulemaking process sometime this fall. With that, I am finished and I'm happy to take any questions. I just to follow up on your discussion of the indoor standard uh, recommendations. Those are indeed just recommendations at this point. My understanding is that any changes to the indoor standard are actually subject to a decision by the legislature at this point. I'm just hoping you can clarify that. Charlotte, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. Hi. Um, good afternoon, everybody. To confirm, um, yes, they are recommendations from our agency, so a joint recommendation from the department and the state water board to the legislature for consideration. And if the legislature decides to um, adjust the residential indoor standard and statute, it would be done so via legislation. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks everyone. Apologies, had to take a quick call. Ms. Sobeck? Yeah, I just wanted to uh just add a little bit of information from the Division of Drinking Water about the Russian River um, um, area. Um, the Division of Drinking Water has issued um, about 22 technical report orders to public water systems that withdraw water um, from or near the Russian River. And um, <clears throat> the purpose of these orders is to get weekly information on um, levels and water production, since we know that, that whole watershed, um, which is covered by the drought, the first drought emergency um, declaration is in you know, dire straits. And so um, the idea is to have a, a, um, a, a, a pretty precise, pretty real time um, understanding of, of their status. And we are working with um, um, our division of um, IT on a 
on a portal for receiving that data um, electronically from the um, technical reports so that we'll be able to, um, to have that available um, very quickly. And we are, uh, the Division of Drinking Water, um, we're not, they're not quite there yet, but they are working on um, trying to identify other water systems of concern. Um, and when they have identified those, um, those systems, they will um, be issuing similar technical report orders. So um, I think that we're, we're um, moving forward into developing a, a sort of a more robust um, um, monitoring system and we'll be working to get the division of drinking water coordinated with the um, the uh, the data that was just reported to you um, by um, in today's report. Thank you, Ms. Sobeck. Board Member Firestone. Yeah, no, thank you for that. That was I just was going to continue that follow up, but I think that answered my questions on that. I you know I just that the. the one one takeaway for me on this is just that um you know this this doesn't include most of the drinking water systems that are really small and that this regulation doesn't apply to so um but I, you know as we know those are the most vulnerable so i appreciate the you know incorporation of that information um as we're continuing through this drought and trying to understand um you know shortage impacts on the urban water um, arena or or drinking water provider arena, um, and I just I I wonder if um, you know if there's maybe a, <clears throat> a little bit we could provide on the drought and water shortage um, vulnerability that we did with you know DWR did and we did it with our needs assessment of just pulling that out and being able to. Um, to understand that in this context in the future. So, but I, I appreciate all of the discussion that already happened on that. Um, I mean, I, I guess I just, you know, reflect on this as um, I like two things that really stand out to me. One is it's so helpful to see this outcome data and really be able to understand how things are changing over time towards this goal of um, uh, making conservation a way of life and um, and just creating this kind of fundamental resiliency that that needs to be there and I just I, I'm so heartened by how much um, you know the the cutbacks that were really um, that were done and required, and then you know done in the past and the last drought have really um, you know continued to large part now, and I think obviously put us in a much better place, and 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 I think just created this sort of structural and long term resiliency in the sector that is you know, allowing us not to be in the same crisis that we were before that. Um, I, and just sort of manage in this new reality. So even in the Russian river watershed, just seeing how, you know, they've done this before. They know now they're in this crisis, they can do these kinds of really um, severe water reductions. Um, and, you know, they, they even exceeded those in the last drought. So I, I just, you know, really stands out to me as we're looking at drought and trying to figure out how to manage in this new normal, um, how I think the sector has really been able to do those kinds of structural changes and um, and also just the investments in terms of water supply and recycled water and, and resiliency. So it's all folks know, but I just can't help but um, reiterate that as I, as I hear it. Yeah, thank you, board member. You know, on the data side of things, we we do have so many more tools um, between uh, the work that we did with uh, the Department of Water Resources that they led when it came to vulnerability of smaller systems to drought. But to your point, you know, there's an interconnectedness here around conservation and proudly, um, you know, the governor himself, you know, speaks to the 16% that we're still below uh, 2013 in the last drought. But, and I, I don't mean to We'll, we'll remove that, but we'll say, and we need to continue to conserve, um, that we are uh, in very dry conditions. Uh, we'll hear just how severe here soon when it comes to even just the management of the projects in the state. And so, um, you know, it, it, it is incumbent upon all of us to continue to see our part 
including our personal habits, to figure out how we continue to stretch these supplies, these continuing to be stressed supplies uh, in ways that hopefully uh, very much help us weather the worst of, of what uh, these dry conditions and, and continued increased drought will continue to bring to us. And so we need to uh, continue to, to generate more data for these informationals so that we, we really continue to drill down and help uh, everyone assess and understand how they can continue to do more. So I uh, just wanna thank all the, the very good work. I know that's gone for many years, especially before I even joined this board um, that uh, you know decades worth of investment and in previous lessons and droughts around conservation. Any other thoughts and questions? I know there's a lot actually in this space and to board member McGuire's uh, questions and points, you know, it, it, there is a nexus here around then shortage and availability to systems themselves and the sort of, you know, mandatory and extreme conservation that communities need to undertake in order to stretch uh, supplies where things are, are really uh, stressed there. And certainly the Russian river comes to mind, but uh, communities up and down the state. And so we're gonna wanna continue to be more informative and bring up to light uh, the data that we're seeing so as to help uh, guide where both the policy discussion should go. You know, what is conservation 2.0, if you will, and in, in, uh, particularly in this context of, of these dry drives that we're seeing, and how do we all work together and, and turn down what I know is sometimes um, the politics uh, and the, the finger pointing that goes on in drought certainly is who's not doing their part, who needs to be doing more, but instead kind of look within ourselves and say, how do, how do we continue to do more in the space that we're, we're all uh, leaders in. So um, anyway, I appreciate that. Uh, Board Member McGuire, would you like okay. to add anything yeah, else? Thank you. I, I agree with your with your comments that, you know, there's an ongoing dialogue here about what's, what constitutes long-term water use efficiency. And I think that's a lot of the spirit of the conservation as a way of life regulations. And then we have the short-term here um, urgency amongst about conservation and really saving to meet any anticipated water shortages that communities can maybe feeling now or maybe in the coming year. And so I just wanna emphasize, this has come up with folks I've talked to a number of times uh, recently, and that is just, you know, the governor's drought proclamation doesn't currently cover the entire state of California, but that doesn't mean that we all, wherever community that you're in, whether it's covered by the drought proclamation currently or not, um, you should be looking at, you know, water conservation and, and seeing what you can do at your home, um, with your business, you know, in your community to help save water now. Because I, you know, I firmly believe that anything you do now uh, can pay, you know, real dividends down the road. Uh, we don't know, you know, we know we're in a drought now. Um, we don't know how long it's going to last or how severe it could be. I am I'm hoping for the best that it's short term. It's just this year and it's going to um, we'll write the ship here this, this coming uh, winter, but we don't know that for certain. And so I just would implore all of you, everyone who's watching to please um, do your part and uh, do what you can to help save water now because it, it really could help down the road. So thank you. Thank you so much board member. More to come certainly in this space. And, you know, I think, uh, and I don't want to speak for director Namath or, you know, the work there, but I know even when it comes to uh, the projects, knowing that um, the, this year was a 5% allocation ultimately for the state water project. Next year, um, need to continue to plan uh, for what could be ongoing drought. And I know uh, Director Name is uh, already there. And so far as really thinking of uh, how to engage the agencies that are dependent at least on the state water project. And it's similar work throughout the state that we're all going to be engaged with. How do we all assess our supplies? How do we uh, really understand uh, our vulnerabilities? and help that drive to your point board member, what needs to be then be mandatory conservation in certain communities. So, thank you. Uh, I think we can now transition then to our next item, which is actually um, a, a very, and hold on, uh, no, no public comment, uh, Ms. Townsend, correct, still? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Eli, and thank you, uh, Ms. Perino. Uh, for your, your your work, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. And so now we can transition to our next item, which will be, uh, again, a, a rather exciting item for me, uh, item number seven, and I know an exciting item for board member McGuire. Um, this is the Los Angeles River Flows Project, which is the development of a decision support tool for flows in the Los Angeles River. And um, 
I, I want to give introduction, but I'll, I'll just let our own folks in the program do so. But just, you know, thank you. Uh, this I know is a, a long ongoing project, and not unlike many of our other discussions here, it's about balance. Uh, you know, it's, and what, is, what does that mean to uh, understand uh, the, the, the context we make certain decisions, but particularly as it impacts watersheds and amounts of water that move within them. And, you know, in Southern California, we have a very unique um, uh, hydrology. Um, it's uh, effluent basin, uh, effluent based at times, uh, certainly in the LA River. And so um, anyway, I'll stop and actually let our folks get into the item. Uh, and thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get, I'm gonna kick off the presentation. So good afternoon, Chair Esquivel and members of the board. Can you guys all hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Lori Weber and I'm a senior environmental scientist in the standards and assessment section of the Division of Water Quality at the State Water Board. Um, with me today is Dr. Eric Stein. He's from the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project and Sam Bolin Bryan, who is a supervising engineer in the petitions, licensing, and registration section in the Division of Water Rights. So we've got two divisions and one outside agency covered at this presentation. Uh, we'll be presenting item number seven, which is an informational item, as you mentioned, on the Los Angeles River Flows Project, uh, development of decision support tools for flows in the Los Angeles River. Next slide, please. Okay, this is just a, a very brief outline of the presentation today. First, I'll be giving you an overview of the project background and the overall goals of the project. Then I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Eric Stein to provide an overview of the technical process and a demonstration of the decision support tools. And finally, Sam will wrap up the presentation with a discussion of next steps within the Division of Water Rights. Next step, uh, next slide, please. So a bit of background, uh, this project was initiated in response to the need to balance water recycling and beneficial use support in the Los Angeles River. Um, during the dry season, flows in the LA River consist primarily of discharges from three wastewater treatment plants operated by the cities of Los Angeles, Glendale, and Burbank. So that's the effluent dominated uh, water body that, that you mentioned. Um, these three municipalities would all like to recycle a greater portion of their treatment plant discharges. And of course, this would, um, additional recycling um, would have the effect of reducing in-stream flows within the Los Angeles River. Uh, currently, these flows support both aquatic and recreational beneficial uses um, on the aquatic life side. There are fish and bugs that live in the water. The um, in-stream flows support riparian habitat for birds. Um, as well as in-stream habitat for wading birds. And on the recreational side, there are beneficial uses such as kayaking, fishing, and wading in the river itself. Um, and finally, in order, um, on, a, on the procedural side, in order for the municipalities to reduce their discharges for recycling purposes, they need to, to petition the State Water Board's Division of Water Rights for approval pursuant to Water Code Section 1211. Next slide, please. And just very briefly, the, you know, as I mentioned, the overall goal of the project is to support decisions regarding the balancing of recycling and beneficial use support within the LA River. Um, specifically, the project goals are to quantify the relationship between in-stream flows and beneficial uses, um, to provide a toolkit to evaluate 1211 petitions related to recycled water, and along the way to engage local stakeholders and receive feedback regarding the study and its application. Um, just to clarify, the outcome of this project is not a static set of numeric flow objectives for the river. The outcome is a tool that can be used to develop flow management targets to protect specific species, habitats, and beneficial uses. And it really provides a science-based framework for the water board and stakeholders to work together to evaluate different flow reduction scenarios and to facilitate equitable requirements regarding discharges to the river. Uh, the project was initiated uh, back in 2018 and has just recently completed in April of this year. And we're here today to give you an update on the outcome. 
Um, so at this point, I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Eric Stein from the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project. And he was the lead scientist on this effort. Great, thank you, Laurie. Can I have the next slide, please? Thanks, Laurie, members of the board. It's my pleasure to present to you today. Um, I just wanted to begin by acknowledging like all projects, this was a group effort. And so I wanna acknowledge my key collaborators, primarily the Colorado School of Mines and the research group of Dr. Terry Hogue, who led most of the hydrology and hydraulic modeling and the Council for Watershed Health and Yareli Sanchez, who led the recreational use assessment. So can I have the next slide? So I would like to start with the outcomes um, and then kind of work backwards from there. So as Lori mentioned, the goal of this project was not to develop a static set of targets or recommendations, but more of a process that could be used to work through a decision process to come up with a variety of different flow ranges that depend on the priorities that the stakeholders or the water board may have. And so we have a series of outcomes that came out of this effort. Um, the first two are a set of tools, as Lori alluded to. The first one is a set of tools that will allow people to come up with flow management targets based on a series of priorities, depending on things like season, location, and habitat or species of concern. The second is a set of tools that can then be used to evaluate a broad range of scenarios involving reduced discharges from either water reclamation plants or storm drain discharge, and understand what are the implications of those changes in discharge to the flows in the river and how they may affect beneficial uses. The tools were developed not only to support the current evaluations under the 1211 process, but really one of the stated goals was to develop tools that are flexible and transferable because we understand that the LA River is not the only river in the state that may be experiencing these challenges. And the goals were to develop a process that could be applied to other systems that may have similar issues that they're, that they're working through. And then finally, as again, Lori alluded to, we had a broad stakeholder process. It was very important throughout this process to engage not only the potentially affected parties such as the municipalities, but a lot of the communities along the river who depend on the river for recreational uses. So we had a very um, deliberate strategy over the course of the project to really engage and work with our partners and our stakeholders to make sure that their technical input and their concerns were embedded into the project. Uh, next slide, please. So as Lori mentioned, upfront one of the key decisions was that we were focused on both recreational uses as shown by the kayaking and aquatic life beneficial uses as indicated by the species and habitats that use the river as shown by this picture of this osprey foraging in the river. Uh, next slide, please. So we took two different approaches for the two different um, sets of beneficial uses that we're evaluating. For the recreational use assessment, the approach was really a series of targeted interviews, what are called snowball surveys, where you lead to other people based on initial responses, and several focus group meetings where we had experts on recreational uses in the river. And through a series of breakout groups and interviews and discussions, we were able to identify what recreational uses occur in what parts of the river and get some understanding of what are some of the flow, velocity, or depth needs associated with the ability to support those uses at different times of the year. And the outcome of that was in this technical report was available on, on the project website that summarizes the outcome of that analysis. Next slide, please. So for the aquatic life beneficial uses, we took a different approach. And so with this approach, we started by identifying in concert with our technical advisory committee and our stakeholder group, the major habitats that occur along the LA River. And for each of those major habitats, we identified species that um, are associated with those habitats and represent the range of tolerances within those. So those could be species that require have high flow uh, tolerances or low flow tolerances within those habitats. So we call those end member species because we're trying to capture the range of species needs within each of those habitats. One thing I wanna point out on the slide is you'll see at the top two rows represent habitats and species that are not currently supported in the LA River. The LA River is not currently designated as for cold water be beneficial uses. But one of the early goals of the project was to evaluate not only the existing beneficial uses, but to also understand how potential changes in discharge of the river may affect the ability to support uses in the future, even if they're not currently supported. And for that reason, we included habitats and species that represent beneficial uses that aren't currently supported, but could be supported potentially in the future. Next slide, please. 
So this uh, slide basically just a map of, of the river. So just a couple of things to point out if you're not familiar with the LA River. This is the Los Angeles River. We divided the study area up into 10 reaches numbered one through 10. You can see the wastewater treatment plants are where you see Burbank, Glendale, and Tillman. The triangles represent the locations of the three, three uh, wastewater reclamation plants that Lori mentioned. And this was the domain we covered in the river. Our focus was the main stem of the river um, from just upstream of the Tillman plant down to the mouth of the LA River. So although we modeled all of the tributary watersheds, the focus of the analysis was on the main stem and Compton Creek and Rio Hondo. Um, and the focus was on flows within the banks of the river. We weren't focused so much on some of the revitalization activities going on outside the river, but really on the flows within the banks of the river. The other thing to point out here is that you can see through the icon graphic that each reach of the river may be associated with one or more of the different habitats that we identified as important for beneficial uses. Next slide, please. So this is my main technical slide on the process that we use to come up with the number. So I'll walk you through this. Um, the process is essentially a series of linked models. And so starting from the upper left, we generated a series of habitat suitability models based on relationships between different hydrology or hydraulic properties such as depth and different life history needs of the species that we were focusing on. So in this example, I'm showing a relationship between depth and an adult fish species. And by knowing these ranges, these tolerance ranges for different properties of flow, we can uh, set ranges of tolerances associated with each species. We then relate those to the hydrology and hydraulic modeling that was done by the Colorado School of Mines to generate a probability curve like the one shown in the lower left. And what this graph essentially does is it relates a certain flow characteristic, in this case, a dry season base flow on the x-axis to a certain probability that the, a certain species can occur based on the suitability curves I'm, show, I'm showing in the upper left. And so if you look at the large graphic on the right, what we did in working with our, our technical advisory committee is we identified a series of cutoff points on this graph. And so what we identified is that if we wanted to ensure a 75% probability that a species we've occur, we call that a high probability. I'll come back to these terms later. And if we wanted to ensure a 50% probability of the species occurring, we called that a medium probability. A low probability is anything below 50%. And we don't talk about that much because we generally um, don't aim to manage for low probability of supporting a beneficial use. We want to at least have a medium or high probability of supporting that beneficial use. And so um, this curve, for example, if you wanted to have a high probability of supporting this fish species, a 75% probability, you'd need just under 200 CFS of base flow in the river to support that species during that time period at that location. And so the important take home message from this is that like many things in nature, there are no bright lines and hard thresholds that, and that's why we operate in probabilities. We want to acknowledge that there's uncertainty in our analysis and so we're really based on what is the probability or likelihood of supporting a certain species. So an important caveat is just because there's a low probability doesn't necessarily mean that the species won't occur. And just because there's a high probability doesn't necessarily mean the species will occur. So it's all based on the probabilities. Next slide, please. So we generate a series of these curves from multiple locations in the river for multiple species. And then we have a decision process. I won't. Uh, I won't torture you by walking you through it, but essentially we have a decision process that allows the users to use the table on the, that I'm showing you on the upper right that relates different species to different beneficial uses and go through a series of decisions based on the species they're interested in, the location they're interested in, the season they're interested in. And based on those choices, they can generate a set of numbers that are necessary in terms of flow management targets to meet the objectives that they've laid out. So in this way, the process is very flexible because it allows the users to decide what they want to manage for and what their priorities are and come up with an associated set of numbers that are based on those agreed upon priorities. So if you go to the next box, next slide. So this is an example of what that might look like um, when you go through the whole process. This is the Glendale Narrows region of the river. And what I'm showing on the x-axis in the green box are um, adult and juvenile willow and cattail. So this represents willow riparian habitat and, and cattail marsh, both the growth form and the adult um, sustenance form. And what you can see is there's a range of 
of bars that show the flow ranges necessary to support those species or habitats in that location. And so the gray sort of horizontal uh, box is just represents the overlap. So if you manage for that range, you would be able to support both willow and cattail marsh habitat in that reach of the river. You can also see in this graphic that I've shown the flow ranges associated with both the fishing and kayaking beneficial use and how they relate. And then in the white box, the current flow range. So you get a sense of what you might need to manage for, for the various beneficial uses relative to the current flows. And then that can be translated to a table, which is shown on the right. Next slide, please. All right, so that sort of wraps up the first part of the project, which is really um, the process we use to come up with a, a set sets of numbers based on the priorities that are um, desired. So the next important decision that we have to make is once we have a set of ranges that we might manage for, the question is how might changes in discharge from either water reclamation plants or storm drains, how might they relate to the ability to support those or reach those desired flow targets? So in working with our stakeholders, we made a decision that we did not want to identify a discrete set of scenarios because that would be potentially limiting because there could potentially be hundreds of scenarios that you might come up with based on the three water reclamation plants and the hundreds of storm drains and all the locations in the river. So instead of identifying a discrete set of scenarios to analyze, we came up with a process using what we call sensitivity curves. And uh, next slide, please. And so this is an example of a sensitivity curve and I'll, I'll walk you through it. This again is for the Glendale Narrows, same part of the river. Um, and what this shows is it shows the relationship between dry season discharge from the water reclamation plants on the x-axis and how that relates to dry season base flow at the Glendale Narrows in the y-axis. And so the solid black line represents a median of all the years that we modeled. And so what you can see obviously is as you reduce discharge from the water reclamation plants, you reduce dry season base flow in the river. And you can see what that relationship looks like. A couple of other points, the vertical dash line, that's the current condition, that's the combined discharge from all three plants, which is 73 CFS under current condition. So we know what our starting point is. And the gray band represents the range that we see over all the years we modeled. So we modeled a range of conditions, including wet, moderate, and dry years, and that gray band represents the range of conditions around the median. Next slide, please. So again, we have another decision process, another flow chart. We can step through a set of decisions based on uh, the different reclamation plants and what you decide to do. And that can come up, that, and using those sensitivity curves, we can then come up with some recommendations. So next slide. So in practice, what this looks like, I have two boxes overlaid here and they're kind of laid one on top of each other. This is the same curve I showed you on the previous slide. I have the red box, which actually goes all the way to the top. And that represents the range of flows necessary to support willow habitat at the Glendale Narrows. And so if you just look at the red box, what you can see is you can reduce the discharges all the way down to something close to about 10 CFS out of the water reclamation plants and still stay within that red box and still support the willow habitat. So it gives you a lot of range to work with. Now, if we overlay the blue box, which represents the range necessary to support both willow and freshwater cattail marsh. And if you wanna support both of those, because the cattail marsh needs more habitat, you can see that the, the overlap of those two boxes gives you a much uh, narrower range. And so in that case, if you wanted to support both those habitats at the river, you'd only be able to reduce the discharge down to something like 50 CFS and still support both of those habitats at that location in the river. And so the important part about this is it gives, again, some flexibility to look at a variety of different uh, reductions in discharge and a variety of different habitat end goals. And you can make a decision based on what you're trying to manage for and how much reduction you might be able to tolerate from the discharges. Okay, next slide, please. And so what I've showed you here is the exact same graphic. I've just added um, a graph on the right that has two additional lines on it. And those two lines represent the addition of storm drain, of reduction in storm drain discharge in addition to the reduction in discharge from the water reclamation plants. So as many of you know, there's a lot of um, effort in the LA River watershed, like many watersheds, to implement BMPs, best management practices, in order to reduce dry weather storm drain discharge as a means of, of improving water quality in the river. 
So we wanted to understand what is the relationship between not only the reduced discharge from the water reclamation plants, but that reduction in concert with reduced storm drain discharge. And so I've shown two lines. The yellow line represents a 50% reduction in storm drain discharge from current levels. And the red line represents 100% discharge, which is actually a stated target in the municipal stormwater permit is 100% reduction of non-storm discharges. And so that represents, that allows you to now look at those same tolerances for both the willow and the willow in combination with the cattail marsh and understand um, how reductions in flow of all, reductions from all three sources would affect your ability to support the flow needs for those species in those habitats. So again, a variety of different things you can look at here and a variety of different scenarios you can analyze to understand the potential implications of the decisions. Next slide, please. And so to put all the pieces together, again, I won't walk you through this table, but just illustrates an example that you could generate a table like this for the Glendale Narrows that looks at different scenarios in the first column, looks at different amounts of discharge, and then you can determine whether you have a high, medium, or low probability of supporting the different species that we've identified. And again, just to remind you, high probability is 75% probability of supporting that species, medium is 50%, and low is below 50%. So you could generate a series of these tables for every reach of the river. We looked at 18 discrete um, locations along the river that you can generate these types of tables for. And then you can put all of that together to inform your management decisions and understand the implications of those decisions on the ability to support uh, in-stream beneficial uses. Next slide. So the last point I wanted to make is that as I uh, spoke about the beginning. I think one of the things that was uh, very important to the entire project team, and I think I'm, I'm particularly gratified by in working through this process, was that we had a very in involved community of both stakeholders and technical advisory committees, local community groups. Uh, we spent a lot of time meeting with them. And at the end of the project, I think we received a lot of positive feedback from the user community that everybody uh, have confidence in the products and feels comfortable using these the outcome these tools and these products to inform the different decisions and the proposals that they may develop moving forward in terms of how they might balance uh, reduced discharge to support recycling and the ability and the need to support in-stream beneficial uses. Next slide. And so just to wrap up the results of this are in a report which is again on the project website website. We're working on some web-based tools. Um, right now that will help users sort of navigate those decision flow charts in a little more user-friendly manner. Those are still being developed. We're also working on a monitoring and adaptive management recommendations so that you can track um, progress if you begin implementing some of these scenarios. There's also additional analysis looking at the water quality implications of reduced discharges in terms of both reductions in loads and reduction and potential reduction in dilution effects. And finally, we're evaluating the effect of some of these reduced discharge on proposed restoration um, actions, including those inclu um, included in the revitalization plan. Next slide. And so with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Sam for the last part of the presentation. Thank you. Hi, board members. My name is Sam Bull and Brian. I'm a supervising engineer with the Division of Water Rights. Could I get a hit nod that my audio is working okay? Thanks. Um, and next slide, please. So I'm going to just touch on a few points of how this project can be um, used and how we kind of plan to use it. And I did want to give a note that I'm sort of humbly carrying on the, the good work that board member McGuire started when he was in my position at Water Rights. Um, but the, the main kind of outcome here is these technical resources that Dr. Sign just overviewed are going to be a really valuable technical resource and sort of help create a common vocabulary in the watershed around water recycling projects. And so th the idea is that these are, these are complex issues and the, um, the, the scientific questions that kind of Dr. Stein walked through are challenging. Um, but kind of what we have now, is a lot of technical information, but also a, almost like a roadmap of how to navigate it. And so he, he touched slightly on the, the flow charts. Those are sort of different ways of accessing the same data set. And so there's multiple ways we can kind of approach these questions of how much more water recycling can occur in the watershed. Um, and so there's a few different ways that we can use those flow charts 
and, and the technical resources. The, the most likely is through the, the 1211 process. This is also referred to as a wastewater change petition. And this is a process administered in the Division of Water Rights to evaluate reductions in discharge by wastewater facilities. And so just kind of a quick overview on what that process is. We could go to the next slide. Um, there's a few kind of main steps in, in the water rights process when a petition is filed by a project proponent. Um, so this is someone that's proposing a water recycling project that will re result in reductions in discharge to the LA River. Uh, there'll be a, a petition package that's submitted. We will put it out for public notice. Members of the public will have an opportunity to submit protests to the project. And then the, the State Water Board um, kind of takes those protests into mind, um, directs the parties to kind of resolve any issues to the extent they can. And if necessary, um, the, the State Water Board will act on the protests through a, a hearing process if necessary. Um, the board staff will prepare an order uh, kind of acting on the 1211 petition and then issue that order. This process is subject to the California uh, Environmental Quality Act and um, board staff doing a, a, an analysis of public trust resources and the effects of the project on those resources. So I kind of put this process out there uh, just to point out that there are multiple opportunities to use the technical resources. Um, so CEQA is one of them and how we kind of factor in our, our public trust analysis. We have now a much more robust data set for the, the LA River for evaluating potential effects of a project. Um, and if necessary, it can be used in the protest resolution process. So going back to what I said earlier about kind of a, a common vocabulary, people will be under, have a, a better way to kind of understand what other groups are saying. Uh, about the proposed changes and how to kind of analyze those changes. And um, so through our process is one of the ways these, these tools will be used. One kind of other opportunity I wanna highlight is that the, since this information is available now, it can factor into discussions at the local level prior to submitting a, a twelve eleven petition to the Division of Water Rights. And so this is really where um, the, the stakeholder groups that have been convened for for these, this process and the, the project proponents can, can work together to kind of identify issues and um, uh, potentially avoid protest processes. Uh, it may be more efficient to, to work out those details before submitting the petition. And that's where this technical resource will also be valuable. And so that when um, a petition does get submitted to the State Water Board, it can be kind of processed really quickly <laughs> um, through the steps I identified. Um, how specifically we and to what frequency we use the technical resources is going to be driven by what kind of new petitions we receive. We don't have any pending currently. And so part of it is how the, the project proponents proceed, whether they kind of take a, a, a broader holistic approach and kind of file one big petition or kind of do smaller incremental projects. And then we'll use these, uh, we can use these technical resources on each of those incremental projects. That sort of kind of remains to be seen, and then how much additional recycling is proposed in each of the uh, subsequent petitions that get submitted. Um, and the stakeholder working group that, that has been convened for this process, um, we it's those folks will still be around, uh, and we hope to reach out to them when we do receive a uh, more twelve eleven petitions in the watershed. And then, as Lori and Eric said, we uh, we will. We'll, I think there's hope here that this process and the, the workflow essentially that Dr. Stein relied upon can be duplicated in other watersheds. There's still a lot of obviously technical information that needs to be developed for each specific watershed, but the, the overall workflow is there now. And I think that could, uh, not to put him on the spot, I think it could be done uh, faster and then duplicated in, in, more, in more cases now that um, the process has been worked through. And that finishes my slides. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? I'll hand it back to Lori. Thanks, Sam. Um, just to kind of wrap up the presentation, uh, I want to thank Dr. Stein and to Sam for your uh, 
great presentation and for passing on this information. Um, at this point, we are available and happy to take any questions um, from board members. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> <laughs> I have a um, question, I think. Um, this may be not one that you can answer. <laughs> but um, I, I noticed in the list of, you know, future studies and things that you want to do that there's, um, there's a whole bunch of really important stuff, um, great stuff there. Um, right now, top of mind for me these days is temperature, <laughs> along with flows, um, because of you know, the Bay Delta watershed. Um, and and I, I appreciate you calling that out um, as an area of, of future study. Um, I'm just wondering if you already, um, I don't know, just how you're approaching that and how you see that um, playing into this. And again, I know that's future work, um, but it seems like it's one of those, it, it's like many things, if you don't, you know, you can have flows, but if it's too hot, <laughs> it, it's, you know, that it doesn't work. Um, if you, I mean, same same could be said on on water quality and, and restoration, which are other things you had as well. So just, um, again, just cause it's top of mind, I don't know if you can give a little sense of how you see temperature fitting into what you've done already um, and maybe what the, the future work will focus on. Yes, great question. Thank, thank you for asking that. And um, I didn't talk much about the temperature analysis just in the interest of time, but I, I will say that um, part of the work that the Colorado School of Mines team can, um, also worked on was a temperature model. So we do have a temperature model for the LA River. And so there's several pieces of analysis work on right now. As, as you correctly point out, you cannot decouple flow and temperature, particularly when it comes to discharge from treatment plants, which is often warmer than, than the ambient temperature. And so what we're looking at now is the how changes in temperature that could actually potentially be some cooling that happens by associated with reduced discharges, um, how changes in temperature may also affect the ability for certain species to exist in the river or the ability to bring back some of the cold water species. Um, so the relationship between flow and temperature and how they work together is something we're working on both in this, in this watershed as well as some of the um, adjacent watersheds which are dealing with temperature issues as well like the Santa Clara in particular. Um, the other part we're doing is we're looking at through some of the restoration scenarios um, things like uh, replanting of streamside vegetation and even some changing of the substrate composition to change reflectance patterns and how that might uh, be used as a strategy to lower temperatures and potentially make the conditions more suitable for supporting the species and habitat. So it's definitely work that we're continuing to, to pursue here. And we, we do have the tools that we um, are continuing to develop to do that. Great, thanks. Yeah. I think it's possible we may have lost our board chair. <laughs> I don't know, Vice Chair uh, Diadama, you happen to know anything about that? Uh, no, I don't, but thank you for pointing that out. I um, have uh, limited um, boxes on my screen here. So any other questions? Uh, I, I don't have any quest other questions right now, but I, I could make a couple comments if, if you're ready for that. Okay. So I just want to thank everyone who's been involved for a number of years now uh, with the Los Angeles River efforts. And for me, uh, you know, I came to this as uh, Mr. Bull and Brian uh, point, pointed out as, you know, when I was working as staff actually in the Division of Water Rights, um, the issues of kind of this, uh, the notion of this is a good problem to have about the Los Angeles River came, came to my attention in that you know, we had um, multiple cities who all really saw the opportunity um, coming out of the last drought actually to um, recycle essentially 100% of their discharges to the river. And, you know, but a, a pretty quick recognition that that really 
um, without understanding the impacts to you know, the environment of the river, um, that that was you know, not going to be a, um, a winning solution for our ecosystems that uh, the Los Angeles River does support. And I've learned so much about the river um, that you can kayak on it, um, about the waiting shorebirds, um, about you know, fishing opportunities, you know, about the habitat. I've, I've been on a couple of tours and I just you know, really have grown to understand the significance of the river to the Los Angeles community generally. And you know, just how important it is that we um, you know, do everything we, we can. You know, we're, we're regulators, uh, we deal with water quality issues, we deal with balancing um, water supply. There's a whole host of other folks with the cities along the river with the Army Corps and others, um, conservancy groups that are looking at ways to you know, physically enhance the habitat through revitalization efforts. And I know, you know there's been so much invested in that as well. And I, I really hope that these support tools, this, these decision support tools help inform those discussions as they go forward, because I think there was a recognition that there was just not a great understanding about these types of trade-offs. Um, you know, at the same time, I just, I see this as a wonderful opportunity. I, I don't know, you know, which curves the stakeholder groups will look at or you know, ultimately what types of habitat and species make the most sense here. Um, but these tools will help us sort that out and hopefully the stakeholders sort that out amongst themselves, ideally. Um, so that, you know, at the end of the day, we can achieve greater recycled water um, we can continue to support stormwater capture as a um, really significant and important opportunity in the LA basin as well. And, um, you know, support, continue to support the habitat that's, that's there. So, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, I hope it's sooner rather than later that we can get to that point. Um, you know, there's so many efforts underway now with looking at Hyperion, um, looking at Metropolitan and LA County Sanitation Districts, looking at their ocean discharges and recycling as much as possible um, that they can do there. But there's, there's the, you know, looking at Burbank and Glendale and, and LA's facilities, there's other low hanging fruit out there for recycled water. Um, so hopefully through this in the not too distant future, we can, they can, you know, narrow down what that number looks like, you know, what those opportunities are and help, you know, balance the river going forward. So I just want to thank Eric, uh, Dr. Stein, it's been, you know, great, great meeting you on, uh, I think, associated with this project and your contributions from Squirp and your team uh, that was involved with this and, and Laurie as well. So just thank you all for your contributions. Really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Sean. I appreciate it. Thank you. I just want to add a uh, here, here, uh, thank you um, for the leadership and uh, just adding on one last thing to everything Sean said, um, who has been part of this for a long time, um, is just the importance of this kind of decision support tool as a like empowerment tool for communities to be part of the decision making that affects them. And, um, you know, I think really a model, the way you all have approached it in terms of um, uh, in, uh, incorporating community into the development of the tool. And then also by design, thinking about how it, it actually empowers locals to figure out and sort of self-determine what they think um, you know, their communities and their watersheds um, should look like because these are these are real decisions that affect people and so um, you know I just wanted to highlight that as an additional I think real strength and um, highlight of the work you have done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, do we have any um, public comment on this item? No we don't vice chair. Okay. Then um, I'll just ask a question, um, and I know that it's too early to tell, but um, uh, Mr. Bull and Brian, could you um, kind of uh, walk us through, or, or others, um, any potential issues that you would see with um, um, a petition being filed and potential protests? 
I know what we're looking at here and the discussion has pretty much centered around consensus based approaches use, utilizing this toolkit, but um, uh, maybe if you could shed some light on potential areas of protest. Sure, I can take a crack and then the others can, can fill in anything I'm missing, but the, um, it's the kind of key stakeholders, board member McGuire referenced in terms of dischargers are Burbank, Glendale, and, and LA. And so we're really, I think will drive the process is like what amounts the next petitions proposed for water recycling. And so, um, if the next project proponent sees that their, uh, their proposed projects um, will have kind of dramatic effect on beneficial uses in, in the LA River, they may look to the prior approvals given to, to the other discharges to reduce their discharges, if that makes sense. So um, there have already been some 12, 11 petitions approved in the watershed, um, Glendale and Burbank. And in those approvals, there was a, a, a kind of a condition noting that the approvals could be reopened with notice in a hearing uh, in order to kind of work through a process to more equitably uh, distribute, you know, how much each entity could reduce its discharges. So it's essentially, um, I'm used to water rights, so it's harder to, to transplant the metaphor, but there's a certain amount that can be distributed amongst each of the entities. Normally it's water supply available, but in this case, it's how much can each entity reduce. And each of these parties has kind of different opinions there. Um, and so the, the first question where this technical resource comes in is, you know, what are the beneficial uses that um, need to be supported and how to balance those against changes in discharge. Once there is kind of we know more through subsequent petitions of to what extent people want to reduce their discharges. We'll be able to say, you know, is, is that more than kind of what one entity is proposing under one petition? And, you know, do we need to kind of proceed to a hearing process? Uh, the hearing is, as, as all of you know, is kind of the, sometimes the appropriate way to kind of work through some of these challenging questions. Um, but there's always, you know, hope and opportunity that it, um, something can be negotiated locally as well. And this kind of the common vocabulary we now have will, will help facilitate that. Great. Okay. Um, well, thank you all for this um, really interesting update. And uh, thank you, board member McGuire, for your leadership and for, you know, encouraging all of us to continue to follow this really important uh, regional issue that really is something that the whole state is uh, potentially watching, you know, for other opportunities elsewhere. So thank you for that. And with that, we will move on to um, agenda item number eight. And that's an update on the status of the underground storage tank cleanup program and underground storage tank cleanup fund and opportunity um, and opportunity for public comment on allocation of funds generated from the petroleum storage fee. Ms. Barkley, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Vice Chair Diadamo and other members of the board. I don't know if the chair's back yet, but um, I'm here today. I'm Diane Barkley. I'm the underground storage tank cleanup fund manager and division of financial assistance. And Matt Cohen from Division of Water Quality and I are here today to present you our annual update on the UST or Underground Storage Tank Program. And Matt will go first and tell you what's going on in Division of Water Quality. And then I'll cover the fund portion and I'll also tell you briefly about the fund audit that was just completed and present our recommendations for the allocation of the three mills of the petroleum storage fee. So Matt, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, can can we hear me? Yes. Good. Good. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Vice Chair and Board Members. I guess we don't have the chair at the moment. Um, Actually, thanks for having. I am really sorry. We had a microphone failure here in the room, so I had to run over and figure out what happened. 
Um, before we begin this item, Vice Chair Diadamo, we do actually have a number. Uh, we had noticed that the drought item would not begin before five o'clock um, or before two o'clock, pardon me. And uh, Diane and Matt, could you give us a quick sense of how long you think this particular item would go? Because we're going to try to slot it as close as possible since we have numerous directors joining from other agencies. Uh, maybe 15 minutes without any, you know, and then any questions? 20, do, do we have any um, members of the public that have signed up, Mr. Lawfer? No, we do not have any speakers on this item. I would go ahead and suggest that we run through this item then, and then that will also give us time to get the remaining members um, and directors from other agencies joined while Mr. Cohen and Ms. Barclay go through their presentations. Okay, sounds good. And then uh, just feel free to jump in if I know that we have uh, principals that have uh, tight schedules. So if we need to um, well, I would just su suggest uh, Ms. Barkley and Mr. Cohen, um, since we don't have public comment on this item, just move as quickly as you can. Thank you. Will do. Thank you. Uh, so I'll pick back up here. Uh, my name is Matt Cohen. I'm the um, chair of the or chief of the underground storage tank cleanup program uh, and geotracker unit at Division of Water Quality. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the underground storage tank cleanup program and kind of where we're at. Uh, so this is a, next slide please. Um, this is an aging program. Uh, we've been uh, running this program for about 40 years. Uh, in 1989, they established the cleanup fund. Since that time, um, we've uh, opened 42,000 cases um, and we've closed approximately 94% of those cases. Uh, as, as you all know, the policy, the low threat closure policy was passed in 2012. Um, and we've closed uh, approximately 6,300 cases uh, since 2012. Next slide, please. So uh, at the end of 2020, we had 2,243 open cases uh, across the state. Um, this slide shows a breakdown of those cases and where they're at. I can kind of move quickly past that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so, so this is a closure rate. So closure rate um, since 2012. And as you can see, we kind of uh, quickly ramped up and, and our numbers have been um, dropping. Part of that uh, reduction in closure rate is that the cases are becoming more difficult, that these are the, um, the most difficult cases that are left, the ones that were kind of put on the shelf, uh, the stalled or stuck cases. Uh, and so I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing about that in a minute, but uh, we also think that um, there's other reasons that we're, we're slowing down, that um, some of the agencies, some of the regional boards and local agencies are shifting resources away from the UST program or adding responsibilities uh, to those staff. Um, some of the aging cases have run out of fund money. Um, and uh, because the cleanup fund is scheduled to sunset in 2025, um, we're, we're sort of we want to keep the, our foot on the gas. We want to keep moving um, and we want to make sure that we can wrap these up in time. And uh, we think that it's critical to move this program forward so that we can figure out how to transition the resources that we have um, to, to really go tackle the worst problems out there, the, the, the solvents and the, the nitrates and the, 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 the things that are really impacting our um, drinking water. Next slide, please. So we took a look at uh, the cases by age. Um, as you can see, uh, this, this uh, chart here, um, approximately 700 and, uh, excuse me, yeah, 770 of our cases have been open for over 30 years. Uh, and, and so we think that that's kind of a, a lot that we need to figure out how to resolve those and move those forward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of those things that we think will help is closure plans. We think that uh, it's important that every case have a plan that we document, okay, what are, the, what are the impediments? What are the steps to resolve those impediments? And we work with um, all of the stakeholders uh, involved um, to, to develop those. Uh, and we have a thing in GeoTracker, a, a, a report in GeoTracker where caseworkers can go fill that out. Um, we, we took a look at those and they're kind of hard to, to look at in aggregate. But um, when we look at, you know, dates have passed, things haven't been updated, they're not complete. Um, it looks like about 65% of those uh, 
closure plans need some additional help. And so um, that's an area that we want to focus on and, and, and make sure that caseworkers across the state are really mapping out their plan and, and, and moving the cases forward. Next slide, please. So uh, some of the things that DWQ is doing, Division of Water Quality is doing to, to move these cases forward. We have our stalled case initiative. Um, this started in 28. It's a partnership with US EPA. And um, we took the worst uh, 20 or so cases from each agency. Uh, we met with them. We outlined uh, you know, next steps to get them moving and um, using EPA and, and uh, state board resources, we're helping to move those cases forward. Um, to date, we've successfully closed uh, 84 of those cases and, and um, secured funding for countless other cases. Uh, path to closure meetings. So this is uh, what I talked about before, the path to closure plan. Um, this is an effort where uh, state board staff uh, are working with agency and responsible parties to negotiate that path to closure. So we're, we're acting as sort of a facilitator, trying to show them how to do it and, and hopefully the um, caseworkers can take that and run with it and, and apply that to other cases. Um, and then finally, we, we have a comprehensive case review where we're going through and looking at every case in the portfolio and trying to figure out, you know, are they on track? Do they need help? Should we shift them to stalled case? Do they need a better path to closure plan? Things like that. So that's, that's kind of where we're at uh, at Division Water Quality. Next slide, please. So uh, looking forward, uh, as I mentioned, the fund is scheduled to sunset December 31st, 2025. Beyond that, our resources are unclear. Um, we also have a new Cal EPA uh, target to clean up and close over 1,600 cases, uh, or 1,600 cases over the next uh, five years. Um, and then with the anticipated influx of new cases, um, we think that we would have uh, approximately a thousand cases by the time the fund sunsets in 2025. And so at that point, we'll probably be asking ourselves if it still makes sense, sense to have a standalone UST program. Um, thinking about the transition, it seems logical to combine the site cleanup and UST programs and cross-train staff to work um, together on both programs. Um, we already have a few smaller regions that um, have combined programs, and this model allows regions to be more um, agile with resources and shift between um, UST and site cleanup. And, and it allows us to sort of save some of those specialized, uh, tra especially trained um, cleanup staff. So next slide. Uh, and so this is kind of the, the call going forward. Um, we want to make sure that we, again, keep our foot on the gas, uh, that we're, we're, we focus on closing cases, we focus on um, developing good path to closures. Um, and then thinking about larger goals, um, keeping resources within the UST cleanup program um, uh, so that we can uh, have a softer, uh, easier transition uh, over to site cleanup. So uh, that is it for me. I don't know if we wanna answer question, ask questions now or wait till Diane's done. Uh, Diane, I think you can go on and apologies everyone. I, I am back now and uh, sorry for having to quickly hand it over to my vice chair and thank you Vice Chair Diadamo for handling things through here. Um, but yes, Diane, please. Sure, next slide. Um, now for the fund portion, uh, next slide. I'm gonna go kind of fast here because I'll talk, try to highlight mainly what is different about the fund. Like Matt said, we've been around a long time, but there are some changes happening. So just as a background, we do provide financial responsibility to meet the federal requirement for owners and operators of underground storage tanks. We reimburse eligible costs and we're funded by a two cent per gallon petroleum storage fee. And we do have the aid of the Office of Enforcement to help us with fraud prevention. Next slide. So in these, uh, since 1989, these are cumulative statistics just to kind of show you the volume that we have. We have accepted more than 16,000 claims. We still have um, 4,200 of them open, but we've closed more than 11,000 of them. And we have, I think we're, we're activating claims so fast off the priority list, which is something new in the last few years. We're down on, I think around 200 now, and we expect not to have a priority list that's because the ball is in our court anyway, by September of this year. So next slide. Reimbursements is what we're all about. And we paid almost 3,000 of those last fiscal year. 
We have 200 million in claim authority, and we hit that last year. And we have a two-part process. We encumber it, and then we pay it. So the encumbrances hit 200 million, and the payments hit 197. So this year so far, we've received more than 2,000 of them, and we released 2,800. So that's those are good numbers to me. We're, we're getting them out at least as fast as, as we're getting them in. And we're gonna reach that 200 million in claim spending authority, I predict, hopefully this year again, with another 160 million sitting there that we could pay if we had the authority. So I'll talk about what we did about that in a minute. Next slide, please. This year alone, we've received more than $250 million in requests for payment. And this slide breaks that down by priority class. As you all probably know, we have the higher priority claims, which are the small businesses with A and the businesses get bigger until you get to mainly major oil companies at the D level. And because these folks are now being activated off the priority list, they can now submit their reimbursement requests even though they've been waiting for a long time. And that's why we're seeing the influx of them that we're seeing now. Next slide. This is what we released to accounting this year. This is this, the second piece that I was talking about, the actual payment. And we released so far almost 141 million to them. We have one year to encumber two years to, to do the payment. So we're getting some money out the door. As you can see, again, mostly D-level claimants, lesser amounts for the higher priority claimants. Next slide. We have some sub accounts within the fund and these have been the focus of some recent activity. We have an expedited claims account program where we put together a joint execution team that consists of the claimant, their consultant, the regulator, and a member of our staff. We put together those paths to closure. It's similar to what they're doing in water quality with the Stalled Case Initiative. And we've had some really good success there. We've had a 44% closure rate with more than 200 sites in that program. We have the emergency abandoned recalcitrant where we're able to go and help sites that the regional boards nominate whether there's no RP or a recalcitrant RP or an emergency situation, we're able to do cost recovery there with the lien on the property. Our orphan fund is something that we can use for a petroleum site that is not otherwise eligible for the fund and doesn't have an RP. And we find a lot of those are brownfield type uh, urban redevelopment sites. We've had some success there. Our REST program, is where we give grants and loans to small businesses to remove and replace single wall underground storage tanks and bring their systems into compliance. And our site cleanup sub account is probably the most different and exciting account that we have. We have a lot of demand for this. It's where we have a, a small portion of our funding that's able to be used for grants and contracts to clean up sites that are contaminated with non-petroleum compounds. We also, it's not on here, we have a very small school district account as well. Next slide. So combining the items here, we are required by statute to submit our recommendation for public comment on how we allocate a small portion of that two cent per gallon storage fee, which amounts to three mils. And we are to allocate that between three of those sub accounts I just mentioned the rest account for upgrading and replacing tanks, the site cleanup sub account and the school district account. And this three mils comes to about $51 million a year. Next slide. So last year, this is some of the new stuff. We actually do have a finance letter that we expect the budget to include our recommendation from last year with 15% to rest and 85% to scap and a one-time 2 million addition of funds to the school district account because the school districts are winding down. There's not a lot of work left to do there. The rest account has been pretty well funded. Our projections indicate that we're gonna have plenty there. And SCAP, as I mentioned, the demand is, is quite high. And these are typically sites where there is significant risk to human health with vapor intrusion and, and drinking water supply wells being shut down. And there's also a focus in SCAP on disadvantaged communities. So we're gonna recommend for 
that same 15% to rest and 85% to SCAP split. And the finance letter has that. And it also is giving us some more positions for accounting and some more positions for SCAP staff to, to get the additional money out. Next slide. Want to briefly mention our audit. We're required by statute to have an audit every five years. And this is not just a financial audit, but it's a programmatic audit. And so they look at our process, they look at the, the finances, they look at everything. And I'm really happy to share with you that the audit showed improvements in nearly every aspect of our program. We're, uh, we're proud of that, but we do know that we, we are not done making improvements. Some of the things that the auditors mentioned as improvements were our processes, we're streamlining them. ECAP is a success. Having the Office of Enforcement help us with deterrence and also actions to disqualify folks that have been defrauding from the fund has been very helpful. We have increased transparency. We have increased stakeholder engagement. And we've contained our costs, as Matt mentioned, with the low threat closure policy, but also with budgets and some other items that we've been able to implement. Some of the things we need improvement on, as everybody probably knows and has heard many times, the implementation of FISCAL, the statewide accounting system, really threw everybody a loop, and especially us, because uh, we have such volume and we're paying, not buying, but luckily um, my staff did an incredible job getting us rolling in FISCAL. And accounting is, is still having to deal with some of that. And so the auditors found that we're not having access quite yet to all the financial information that we need to make our annual reports. But everybody's working together on that and we hope to have those as soon as we can. One of the other things we need to improve is some legacy cleanup in our database, which is SCUFUS. And like Matt said, the older claim closure, you know, we're down to the, we're down to the nasty ones. So they're not as easy to solve and we need to do a little bit better documentation on our secondary review. Next slide. So for sunset, these are, these are the things that are different, I think, than you, you're used to hearing about the fund in the past. In preparation for sunset, you know, several years ago, like I mentioned, we have been issuing, I think there were 3,500 sites on the priority list a few years ago. Now there won't be any in September. And we have been doing our review summary reports and ECAP to try to get those sites closed so that we can pay them before we sunset. I talked about our finance letter and that is also gonna increase our authority to 400 million. It's gonna double it from 200. So we really need, can get the money out the door before we sunset. And as usually happens when the fund is about to sunset, uh, somebody proposes an extension we have AB 753 right now that is proposing to extend the fund for five years and also form a stakeholder group to look at what the eligibility for the fund should be. So that concludes my presentation. If there are any questions? No, and I think at least for me, only because you've just done incredible work, Ms. Barclay. I think, you know, through the years now and each year having these updates and just the improvements that have come in uh, through the program, the really good work of folks, these are incredible statistics and numbers to be continuing to, to get dollars out, to be cleaning up these uh, sites that are providing uh, benefit to groundwater quality and, and, and other uh, benefits in communities. And so, just you know, thank you for doing this good, quiet work. Um, it is incredibly impressive. Um, I am incredibly impressed knowing that there are challenges with some of the systems that we're dealing with, but that here, you know, continue to to really get the dollars out and improve the program in ways that are again audited and verified. Uh, and so, just uh, commendable on on the continued great work. And just thank you. Uh, but board members, any any particular questions? I know for me. I, you know, that sunset date and then now the extension, you know, it does kind of come to mind that the program will shift because of that and become something else. And I appreciate even the thought of already what happens to the unit afterwards and how might we incorporate it in ways that continue to draw great benefit, knowing that, you know, these are teams here that um, are well honed now and have really um, learned their, our programs in a way that, um, again, you know, verifiably are, are improving our results in the state. So thank you. You're welcome. Board members, any any other comment or, or thought? 
Okay, and thank you. And thank you again, Vice Chair and everybody for the flexibility of quickly adapting there to, I think uh, maybe my, my, my leaving to my meeting caught a, a few folks off guard, but thank you, Vice Chair. Um, that brings us then to, and I appreciate uh, being able to take that item because it just brings us to really our um, last significant item, which is uh, item number five. I'm gonna give everyone a five minute break to just kind of um, take a five minute break and come back. And we will then actually start, and I apologize, you know, I, I think we did caution and say at least it'll start sometime after two, but we'll start here then at 2.20 uh, for item number five and uh, just uh, provide everyone a five minute break. So thank you and we'll be right back. And thank you again, Ms. Barclay. You're welcome.
Okay, everyone, I think we're we come back now. And we can begin item number five, which is a drought update. <clears throat> I want to just begin uh, by acknowledging the obvious, very uh, dry conditions, drought, extreme drought conditions that are already exceptional drought, as I understand it, that are creeping into the state already. There has been a lot of movement since we all discussed last uh, two weeks ago when we first heard that the projects um, were missing about 500,000 acre feet plus of inflow um, that were expected and the dire uh, hydrologic conditions in April that really led to that. Since then, we've had an, an executive order that's expanded to additional watersheds in the state, including the Tulare Basin, the San Joaquin and the Sacramento and writ large there, the Bay Delta watershed and including the Klamath. It has been an intense couple of weeks as we've all tried to figure out what it is that we have in so far as now a system for, with the operators, but also how do we balance out what are uh, incredibly uh, limited supplies. I think I'll start by also saying that it's obvious that there is as much wet water in our system now than there will be certainly by the end of the summer and may very well be uh, going into the potential of another dry winter. And so what we're really needing to do and what has been the focus of a lot of discussion these last two weeks, uh, and I just wanna acknowledge and thank uh, Director Namath uh, and um, Regional Director Conant. Uh, we have Paul Souza from Fish and Wildlife Service and also Barry Tom, um, uh, and just thank them for joining us today to talk about the in incredible and intense coordination that has been going on between our agencies these last weeks as we contemplate and understand not just temporary urgency change petitions, but curtailments and their, their impact on the system, salinity barriers that have been proposed by the drought by the project operators, and then also contributions that all of us in this system, particularly those contractors within the system, are, are needing to respond to. Um, there was a lot of assumptions prior to April 1st uh, in the way that this system was going to be operated in this huge hole, which represents about enough water for a million Californians for a year, uh, is uh, the crisis that we are trying to navigate through. And we all and our agency's capacities are here to do our part and to balance. Uh, certainly it's called upon the board to balance these, these many needs, but it's actually within the water code and it's upon us all. And we know that the operators operate a system that again itself uh, requires balance amongst numerous state and federal laws amongst us. So I just wanna thank everyone. I know that there's a lot of concern, I'm sure, and I've heard um, a lot of sort of uh, discussion on the outside of this decision-making space between the state and the federal government, uh, but just really appreciate everyone's patience and the opportunity here to hear from the project operators, hear from our biological uh, fish agencies, and to, to discuss uh, how it is that we're comprehensively seeing what are an incredibly a number of impacts from incredibly and catastrophically dry conditions that of course aren't just impacting here, here in California, but we see throughout the West. Um, you know, our models, and we'll hear more about this, really aren't just even able to account for just how dry uh, a period we went through and is part of uh, our real need here to continue to be better decision makers amongst us, to be informed by the best available science and data to make very difficult decisions in balancing between all critical needs of water within this state, and but particularly as we, uh, we is concerned to the Delta, uh, which we know has been fragile before these points, continues to be stressed during times of drought. And uh, here we find ourselves again with this balancing act, I think many of us are familiar with in our professional careers, if not directly uh, in working with some of the agencies you see before us. Um, we're also joined by uh, uh, Chuck Bonham, our Director of Fish and Wildlife, I want to note. I, I don't see him on camera yet, but I know he will be here with us and joins what is uh, an incredible group of leadership here on the state and federal side. So with that, uh, just introductory quick comments. I just want to thank everyone again. And I'll hand it over to Diane Riddle to, um, uh, from our Division of Water Rights and um, who has been a real critical asset in this space too, to just go over just where we are and so far as uh, I believe just yesterday, we received temporary urgency change petitions. We're not in the pre prepared to go in detail into those because we just received it yesterday and in the middle of public noticing around them. But we want to be able to provide, again, a, a space here for us all to understand and consider 
uh, the decisions before us. Nothing will be decided today before the board. Um, and again, this is all uh, an attempt to make sure that we collectively as a state and as and as uh, leaders here amongst us, understanding the space and decision making we're called to have. So with that, Diane, if you don't mind, um, maybe kind of providing some context for us here, uh, and you know, kind of how it is we find ourselves, um, and what are what is the timeline? More importantly, that uh, the public can expect around some of the decision making points that we'll we'll explore today, but won't be uh, deciding. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the introduction. Again, I'm Diane Riddle. I'm one of the assistant deputy directors in the Division of Water Rights, overseeing the division's Bay Delta Hearings and Special Projects Program. I'll provide some updates on some of the activities that are going on in the, the division to address the dry conditions. Um, and then I'll turn it over to DWR and Reclamation, who I think are going to elaborate on some of those activities and the dry hydrologic conditions. Um, the first activity that I'm going to provide an update on is um, that the division has been working on, you know, early, starting earlier in the year when we um, first indi got indications that we may be facing serious dry conditions this year. The, the board started working on um, methodologies to look at water supplies and demands within the Bay Delta watershed to determine if there were instances in which there was not adequate supply to serve water users at their priority of right. Um, we've been working very hard on that effort. Staff has done a phenomenal job pulling all of the pieces together very quickly. Um, we uh, dusted off the methodology that we used in the prior drought, made a lot of improvements to that methodology, and we released a draft method methodology for looking at water supply and availability in the Bay Delta watershed last Tuesday for public review and comment. We are planning to have a workshop on that methodology on Friday. Um, then public written public comments on the methodology would be due on May 25th. And we have a, an informational item before the board to provide an update on where the methodology stands based on the public comments we've received. Um, and what we're thinking about in terms of issuing notices of water unavailability to water users in the Bay Delta watershed. Based on current estimates, it's looking like um, water may be unavailable for all post-1914 users in the Bay Delta watershed as early as June. Again, we're gonna refine the estimates. We had anticipated maybe taking a little more time to do that, but given the very dire hydrologic conditions, I think a lot of our efforts are, are being expedited right now. And we're really looking for input from the public on um, critical assumptions related to the methodology that warrant updating before we look at issuing potential notices during the June time period. Um, as Chair Esquivel indicated the, uh, the governor issued an emergency drought proclamation that provides additional authority for the board to potentially consider emergency regulations. We'll be looking at that, determining whether that may be needed or not. Also looking in the future, if there may be instances in which water, and a bit, water is and a bit, appears to be unavailable for pre-1914 and riparian users. But the first step in the process is, um, is a workshop on Friday, hearing from the public um, on their thoughts of critical updates to the methodology that should be made before the board proceeds with using that methodology. Um, then as Chair Esquivel indicated, we did receive a temporary urgency change petition from DWR and Reclamation yesterday requesting modifications to June and July Delta outflow requirements, as well as the agricultural salinity requirements on the Sacramento River from June through August. Um, we are currently assessing that temporary urgency change petition. We are planning to issue a notice for the petition as early as today or tomorrow. Um, given the expedited nature of everything that's occurring right now, we're anticipating a um, quick turnaround on public comments. Um, Pursuant to the provisions related to temporary urgency change petitions, the board may act on the petition prior to receipt of public comments. Um, that may be necessary given the, the need for the change starting in June in order to 
help with some of the water supply shortages that currently exist, providing for some of this water to be backed up into storage for critical needs extending over the, the water year. Um, so we're anticipating that we would likely take action on the temporary urgency change petition um, around the time that public comments would be due at the beginning of June. Um, after we take action on the temporary urgency change petition, we can make modifications to the order based on public comments. Um, and so that's still a part of the process. Um, the other activity that the division is working on is on Friday, DWR submitted a um, application for a 401 water quality certification for installation of temporary rock, a temporary rock barrier at False River in, in a, another measure to help with salinity conditions um, to allow the projects to retain more water and storage to meter out over the season to address the critically dry conditions. Um, we issued a notice on the um, 401 water quality certification on May 17th, and we're anticipating taking action on the 401 water quality certification in early June. So that's, that's the majority that covers the big ticket items that the division is working on. We've also had a lot of coordination with the fish agencies, DWR, reclamation surrounding all of these topics. Um, and I think that uh, the, our um, sister state and federal agencies are gonna provide some more information on, um, on details around the items I talked about and um, the information surrounding those items. So with that, I can turn it over to um, DWR and Reclamation. Thank you, Ms. Riddle, really appreciate it. Director Namath. Um, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and, and members of the board. Um, I wish we were here under better circumstances, but it is certainly a roll up the sleeves moment for um, not just the state and federal water projects, but um, water users uh, watershed wide. Um, what I thought I would do is I've got a pretty brief slide deck here. It's about nine or 10 slides. Um, go through that. Um, it's focused um, somewhat on project operations, but, but really this broader question about risk management and how all these pieces um, come together. Um, perhaps I'll start um, by noting that it was probably just a month ago when the board had its um, its last update on drought and hydrologic conditions. And that was happening at a moment where um, we at the Department of Water Resources um, became um, highly aware of some very intense challenges and rapidly developing challenges in our in our watershed. And that really kicked off an enormous amount of work to, to dig into the information and um, present uh, what we have to share with you all today. That's really about setting the stage. It's about how pieces fit together and it's about a, a broader need to, to really manage risk in a year that as you put, it's, it's not gonna get wetter, um, than it is today. Um, and we all, I think, are, are very focused on um, the um, desire to have a wet year, but also absolutely the necessary prudence if it does um, continue to be dry. Even if it's um, modestly wet, I think what we're starting to see in our system is that uh, recovery will be long and we all need to be thinking about this much beyond um, much beyond this fall or winter and really into next year, given the, the state of uh, conditions. So I think um, the board is going to run this slide deck for me. Okay, good. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> so next slide, please. So as I was mentioning, um, I think, you know, if we're all, you know, uh, reading the newspapers and sort of reading our, our favorite um, experts, we're all understanding that um, this particular water year has developed into one of the driest on record. We think it's going to wind up about likely the third driest in that hundred year record. It means that it's drier than the very deep drought um, that just ended, or if you're someone who ascribes to the fact that maybe that drought didn't end at all, 
we had a couple of wet years, but, but we're back in it. And this is in fact drier than that two year period. We are the driest since 1977. Um, and then 2020 and 2021 is the second driest two year on record. I believe in the Feather Watershed, which of course is the state water projects um, where we have our facilities, this is actually drier than uh, 2014, 2015, that, that two year combination. Um, so all of this to say, um, Every drought has its own kind of permutation and uh, in terms of the sequence of temperatures, storms, snowpack, runoff, all these important things. So we did actually achieve a few firsts this year and, and not in a good way, uh, but in a way that um, we are planning for and responding to. Um, so next slide, please. So um, we have had no significant precipitation since mid-March. Um, the snowpack did not produce anticipated runoff. Um, that's something that uh, Chair Esquivel, you mentioned. Um, what we saw happen was um, despite the fact that we had 70% uh, uh, peak average snowpack, um, what happened with that snowpack was um, very dramatic um, in that it, uh, it the snowmelt accelerated with high temperatures, above average temperatures in the Sierra, and that snowpack uh, infiltrated into very dry ground and, or evaporated into a dry atmosphere. Um, so what essentially happened from the beginning of April um, to um, the end of April, beginning of May, is we saw that 70% snowpack really disappear into almost nothing. And right now I think we're below 8%. I think maybe several days ago I checked in it, we were about 8% average snowpack. Um, what that has amounted to uh, as it relates to the projects is we have um, identified a 685,000 acre foot shortfall um, relative to inflow that has developed between April and May. So, you know, we like to think about droughts potentially as sort of a kind of a slow moving disaster. Um, this one was a fast developing um, crisis, and that's where we find ourselves um, now. And um, that has uh, put all these kinds of tools on the table that, frankly, a month ago we were not anticipating. Um, next slide, please. So as I was mentioning, um, we have had significantly above average temperatures. I'm not going to um, read this chart for you, but as you can see, um, you know, some of the data that's coming in has, has very much affected um, our, uh, our watershed and available water supplies. I would also say um, in my conversations with um, uh, Secretary Ross, um, we're also beginning to understand what above average temperatures um, have done to the planting season this year. And that is we have folks who planted earlier than they ordinarily would um, in response to the dry um, conditions and warm temperatures. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as we mentioned, uh, inflow is uh, much lower uh, than we experienced in 2014 and 2015. Um, 2015 was um, its own interesting year. There was that um, really amazing footage of then Governor Brown standing on a barren field. Um, we thought we weren't anywhere near that when we were at 70% snowpack about five weeks ago six weeks ago, um, but now it's probably looking quite a bit like um, 2015 and that happened very quickly. And as I mentioned, um, the sort of, at the end of the day or at the end of the last several weeks rather, um, what we've really experienced is um, an enormous drop in anticipated inflow into uh, the three ma major reservoirs of the state and federal project. So that's Shasta, Oroville and Folsom. Um, so a lot of our conversation today is going to be on, on those, those elements of our system. Uh, next slide, please. Um, maybe actually, Ernest, um, this would be a good opportunity before we get into some of the details. If you could provide a, a little bit of perspective as um, someone whose territory expands beyond California, but you know, what are we, what are we really seeing westwide? And can you put this into a little bit more context? Yeah, th thank you, Carla. Um, I think I'm my speaker's on. Uh, 
Yeah, so as the chair alluded to, this phenomena that we've seen just kind of overnight where the forecasts have gone south and uh, because of high temperatures and dry soils is something that we're seeing west-wide. Um, the reclamation, we've particularly noted it not only here in California, but also with the Klamath Basin, the Colorado River Basin, the Rio Grande Basin, and the headwaters of the Missouri, to name a few, where we've seen this most pronounced. So this phenomena that has caught the forecasters off guard is something we're seeing west-wide. <clears throat> So um, where we are a little closer to, to home here. Um, so um, we had been anticipating meeting our D1641 standards. Obviously that did not happen in April. Um, and um, that came as something of a surprise to all of us as we were getting in you know, the real time data. We had been planning for a 90% exceedance year, uh, but um, with the increase in temperatures, um, it became very clear in April that the water that we had planned on releasing and were releasing from um, Shasta, Oroville, and Folsom was um, not adequate to maintain uh, water quality standards in the Delta. That's somewhat related to inflow, of course. We're balancing against levels in reservoirs, but what we also started to see was a depletion rate you know, uh, on the other side of the dam. So inflows coming into the reservoirs and on the other side of the dam, we saw um, early system depletion that also was about double than what we were planning on and what we would normally see even in a critical year. So lots of changes there uh, created that um, very negative situation in April. Um, so uh, in April, we did, um, suspend allocations to the Central Valley Water Project agricultural users. The State Water Project went from a 10% allocation to a 5% allocation. That is um, met uh, exclusively from st stored water supplies in, in San Luis Reservoir. Um, and then uh, the Sac Valley settlement contractors um, were, uh, their contract amount was reduced in the Feather River settlement uh, contractors, um, their contracts were reduced to the amount allowed in that contract. Um, Ernest can speak to the Sac Valley for the Feather uh, contractors. It's about 50% of their contract amount. Um, yeah, next slide. The, for, Go ahead, yeah, Ernest. Yeah, for the Sac Valley, or Sac River settlement contractors, it goes to 75% uh, per their contract. And uh, through voluntary actions they've taken, it's now closer to 60% that they'll actually be utilizing. <clears throat> Thanks, Carl. So next, next slide, please. So we are now um, focused on um, early May and, and really getting through this month. Um, so you know, essentially, we once we saw these conditions developing, um, we identified that hydrologic deficit. We've identified some major goals from a water supply perspective, but also from a, a temperature perspective. Um, we do have temperature concerns at all of the three um, major CVP and state water project reservoirs due to low levels. Um, we do have municipal supply concerns um, for um, folks who are fed by Folsom Reservoir. And we are um, in an effort to um, do our due diligence and planning for 2022. We are um, looking at low carryover storages. Um, we're going to do the absolute best that we can to keep those up given where we are with um, state water project allocations, given some of the challenges we have for water quality down in the Delta. So all of those considerations um, have led to and will continue to lead to a difficulty in meeting these D1641 standards without modifications. And so the first signs of that is um, what uh, was delivered to the board yesterday um, as a proposed um, application, a, a temporary urgency change permit. And then certainly um, in the governor's uh, emergency proclamation, um, there is a, uh, we've been directed to pursue uh, the salinity barriers in the Delta as a way to help us maintain upstream storage levels. 
So next slide, please. So um, as, as I mentioned, we are um, working through a variety of, of goals. Um, these goals are beyond um, the purview of the projects. Um, my colleagues who join me here have a lot to, um, to say, and we're working with them very closely on how we manage all of these pieces. Um, you know, first and foremost, top on the list, um, we're focused on cold water needs for fisheries. Um, we also want to make sure that we can protect um, storage in Folsom. Um, and then we do want to maintain um, water quality in the Delta. We, in a temporary urgency change um, request, there are certain water quality conditions that we need to continue to meet. So that's part of our operational plan, um, our proposed operational plan moving forward. And then um, working to provide certain conditions that can lessen some drought impacts to fish and wildlife. Um, and then of course, contingency planning for um, 2022. So these are our kind of our guidelines for moving through the summer. Um, and I think we expect um, as we move through the next couple of weeks um, and um, work with the board and get to some decisions about moving forward. Um, I think we all realize that ongoing coordination and communication, understanding how the system is responding to these kinds of actions is going to be really important managing going forward. So I bet this is not the, the last time I'll be um, talking to you all about how we're working on things um, together. Next slide, please. So um, again, comprehensive action is what we're focused on. Um, um, a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. Um, uh, reclamation is um, releasing um, water out of New Malonis. That's part of how we're meeting water quality conditions during May. Um, um, we do, um, we are requesting the uh, change petition to take effect in the beginning of June. We will have that June period to put in the emergency drought barriers. And that's kind of the focus on where we're, how we're managing for salinity and other conditions down in the Delta. Um, there are, there are other things underway on behalf of the, on, on the part of the water users. Um, for the state water project, we are delaying water transfers that would otherwise occur this summer until the fall. We are also implementing a groundwater substitution program, um, both in the Sac Valley and there are, um, are other discussions underway. There have been voluntary reductions um, and conservation by water users. Um, I'll have Ernest speak to um, where conversations are with the Central Valley project contractors, um, with the state water contractors, of course, we're a slightly different animal, if you will, um, in terms of uh, how we manage um, supplies once, um, uh, once we understand the hydrology and, um, and activities south of the Delta. And then finally, um, certainly through the fall, um, we're gonna get a jump on this this summer with, um, with Chuck Bonham and, and Paul Souza about how do we um, want to be um, operating the system um, through late summer and fall to deal with um, some of the issues on the Pacific Flyway. So all of these things have to be um, balanced and I think our best shot at balancing is doing as much pre-planning as possible, knowing that we're coming into this, I think, um, with a pretty abrupt set of circumstances that we didn't anticipate six weeks ago. Uh, but I think we all recognize the value of very intense planning, um, not just for the next two weeks, but throughout the summer and fall and into 2022. Um, so maybe I will stop there and um, I will, uh, Chair, why don't I turn it over to my colleagues on this panel um, to offer some of uh, their comments, um, unless I'm actually remembering there might be one more slide. There it is. Uh, this is this is the slide. So, so we are working on a, a handful of integrated regulatory actions that we want to um, put into place by the end of this month as a way to acknowledge that all these pieces are, are actually need to be working together. Um, I would say, um, having been around in the previous drought, but in a different role, um, we did have project coordination, but nothing like the way we're doing it this year, absolutely not. Um, and that's, that's a good and important um, development in our response to this drought. But um, where we are with the urgency change permit submitted this week, 
um, the board will do its um, staff will do its staff work. Um, it's very similar to 2014, 2015. If there are additional questions, we can talk about them in, in more detail. Um, work is underway, um, not in my shop, but with other folks on Shasta operations and that temperature management plan. And then um, we do have a drought operations plan that is a new requirement of the state's incidental take permit um, that we do monthly when we get to these dry conditions. Um, additional information about carryover storage targets for Oroville and where we're going with Folsom, slightly different than the needs that we have on the Shasta and, and the Sacramento River system. That will also be included in that drought operations plan. Our goal is for um, uh, for the board and all of our stakeholders to see this bigger picture of an integrated approach that deals with um, balancing conditions in the Delta, balancing conditions across all reservoirs. Um, we're you know, effectively sharing the pain across water users in this, um, in this um, kind of a water year type. And then I certainly want um, the biological agencies to really talk about, you know, what's happening in the environmental side, but that is clearly part of our, our thinking about how we move through this. So maybe with that, I will uh, uh, hand it over to my colleagues and, and thank you for indulging me on um, this PowerPoint. I, I appreciate that. Oh, no, thank you, Director Namath. Um, I know that we're all working uh, long hours right now trying to best understand this whole space. So I'll just, you know, add on when it comes to this integrated regulatory um, space that we're, we're working in, it's, it's obvious that there's different timing for our Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan. There's TUCPs that are coming quickly. And more importantly, we have a system that we're quickly reassessing and evaluating. And I hear on the board side, relaxing environmental standards, doing curtailments, there's the salinity barriers. And again, as you said, amounts being generated either through supplemental groundwater pumping or where it's um, where it's able and conforms with GSP plans or, or, or other ways that folks can contribute to ultimately a meta goal here, which is how much can we keep back up in reserve that th th this is the moment where we have as many options as we can amongst us. And it's incumbent upon us all to, to then contribute to what is uh, a goal that um, it just for the sake of just uh, another dry year and a catastrophic space that we'll be in, prudent to have, have been able to, to generate this all amongst us, even though we know it comes at cost. So um, just thank you, Director, and, and we'll hand it over to um, Regional Director Conant here, and thank you for, for joining us as well. Yeah, yeah thank you, Chairman. Um, just a couple introductory notes. Uh, I think Carla covered the high points through this uh, PowerPoint that uh, we put together jointly. Um, but just a couple notes. First of all, I just want to acknowledge and recognize the uh, intense coordination going on between the federal and state agencies and the state board. And uh, we appreciate everybody's efforts in that regard. Um, also want to acknowledge on behalf of Reclamation, uh, appreciation for the leadership of the governor and issuing the uh, emergency proclamation that many of you had something to do with and um, appreciate the efforts of the board and, and carrying out those measures, uh, which Carla has alluded to. <laughs> um, I guess lastly, um, I'll just note, um, you know, recognizing this very challenging year uh, in cooperation with the federal and state partners, we've, you know, been trying to think outside the box and take on actions that in some cases we've never done before. <laughs> so one of the first example, of course, is what Carla alluded to. Um, for the first time we're providing flows from New Maloney's to assist with Delta standards um, and, and take the pressure off of Shasta and Oroville and Folsom, you know, recognizing that New Maloney's is our one reservoir that's about average. <laughs> uh, so that's one thing we've undertaken that we haven't done before. And then another thing is a major power bypass at Shasta that's been going on to uh, save cold water for later when it's uh, most critical for, for the health of salmon. Uh, so those are a couple things that we're doing this year that haven't been done before, uh, certainly not on the scale. Um, and uh, we're gonna continue to you know, work collectively with 
our federal and state partners to uh, make sure we've turned over every rock uh, in this very challenging year. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conant. I appreciate your, I know, uh, long hours, not just uh, here on the Central Valley project, but certainly in the Klamath and other uh, places westwide. So thank you. Yeah, we got our hands full up there. Yeah, and there too, uh, state um, prepared and, and is a, a partner. And I think with, with everyone as well, um, I, these are uh, very difficult circumstances. Um, and I've you know, heard earlier about the, um, the fish uh, die-offs happening uh, within the system uh, because of these conditions. And so, um, yeah, just thank you. I just wanna acknowledge that it's not just the CVP here that um, certainly is on reclamation's plate. Thank you. Uh, next, I think we'll hand it over to Director Chuck Bonham from uh, Fish and Wildlife. Great, thank you, Chair. Just let me check and confirm you can hear me. You can, let me clear. Great. Nice to see you under a difficult situation, board members. I think uh, after I'm done, I'd like to hand it over to Barry Thom at our federal salmon agency, who I think will flip it to Mr. Souza. And maybe Mr. Souza sends it back to Ernest and Carla to take questions. Hey, I want to do two things. I appreciate the time. The first is I want to talk about the situation we're in right now. And I want to speak in really plain terms. And what I want to do is provoke as much attention as I can, particularly from the public that's watching, because we need people to understand the precarious situation we're in as Californians as of today. So that's my first goal. And my second goal is to give you some sense of options, tools, actions, which will also reference some of the lessons we learned in the last drought. So what's the situation like? You got to start at the broadest level. Look, nature is really tough uh, when we give her half a chance. But if we don't allow nature time to heal and rebound, we, are, we find ourselves in a very tenuous situation on the natural system side with our animals and our plants. Um, there's no doubt drought produces significant often disturbing impacts to people, access to water, economics, agriculture for sure. But on the natural side, we can't think about this current drought without realizing what happened in the last drought. And for some of our species, they have these life cycles that run over several years. And some of the species y'all been discussing are still coming out of the last drought. And that's relevant, particularly when you start to look at some of our iconic salmon runs. So you've discussed before, many people know, there's this special salmon, we call it the winter run. It lives in a really small piece of real estate up near Redding in the Sacramento River below some large dams. That's its home. It can't access its historical habitat above those dams. The majority of those winter run salmon died in 2014 and 15 because of lethal water temperatures during egg incubation. So that's not that long ago. The last two years, looking backwards from today, two years, we call them cohorts, the group of salmon, the winter run in the last two years, had really poor freshwater survival when they were swimming downstream, migrating out into the ocean. We've also had this other uh, intervening event. We're seeing a particular deficiency in some of these fish called a thymine deficiency. And that also likely negatively affected the winter run just last year. So we've got compounding events over a series of time. And these are fish that have a three-year life cycle. So the less protective we are, you may be looking at three years of poor survival in a row, which is less about the individual fish and much more about the population effect. 
So three years in a row of poor survival, and you can get a population negative effect such that your population stability or if declining or on an incline drops, drops off dramatically and heads you towards extirpation of naturally produced fish. So you hear it a lot, hyperbole, extinction's real. It's these pronounced moments of water scarcity, scarcity that produce that challenge in the natural system. We see it right now with winter run. We also have this other uh, pretty well known run of salmon. We call it fall run. They're named around the time of year in which their movement's happening. And fall run is really our remaining backbone fishery for all the hardworking men and women who make a living in the ocean catching fish commercially or the really large recreational industry in California that fishes for these fish for sport. And our fall run over time, it's not like they've been doing exceedingly well, but in the moment we're in now, if we don't think about our management decisions, both as to winter run and fall run, we may find that our fall run fish also tip over. And we begin to see a population effect in that fishery. If that were to happen, we would expect to see a real significant blow to our commercial and recreational aspect in the state. And if that part of the salmon run became more legally protected, the little management flexibility we have right now would continue to shrink even more. What we know right now is the water temperatures in the Delta itself are pretty hot, as hot as we've seen kind of historically detected. What we know right now is winter runners spawning up by Redding in the river. What we know over on the Russian River side is that we run a hatchery with the Army Corps, which is kind of the conservation hatchery to bring coho back to that coastal stream. We may lose temperature control over that hatchery in coming weeks. What we know up in the Klamath is uh, a situation with little room to go in any direction. The federal government is challenged to keep lake levels in Oregon at a certain level for native fish in that lake, known since time immemorial by the Klamath tribes. The federal government's challenged to ensure sufficient flows in the river down in California. The federal government hasn't been able to provide any allocations to its farmers in the basin. We have some of the oldest wildlife refuges in America in that basin, which will be starved for water. And in the river in the last 10 days, as conditions worsen, flows lessen, temperatures rise, there's a disease we struggle with, Barry's team and mine, C. Shasta, it's a spore, and it can produce pretty catastrophic mortality rates in the young juvenile salmon. About two weeks ago, the mortality rates were through the roof. They look like they're coming down a touch. It looks like the spore abundance has come down a touch, but we may be in a period of episodic up and down for the foreseeable future. It's not just about fish. I was on the phone yesterday morning very early with Ducks Unlimited, California Waterfowl, Point Blue, Audubon, Fish and Wildlife Service, Paul's staff. We're pretty convinced there'll be a dry landscape in the Klamath Basin, which is the first major pullover spot for birds as they're flying south, they're not gonna pull over. There's nowhere for them to stop. They're gonna come into the valley down here in the Sacramento Basin, and it's gonna be dry. We'll have less rice. We're likely to have far more birds on much less space, which is just a recipe for disease and other management challenges when we get there. We know out in the ocean from Fort Bragg North, this year we'll have zero commercial fishery for salmon. I saw just this week that the Yurok tribe has declared on their tribal lands a drought disaster declaration in the Klamath Basin. So that's the situation we're in. It's plain terms, it's precarious. How do we get out of it? I don't know. I think one of the things we must do is go through this together. We can't tolerate 
parts of California pointing fingers at each other as much as we need to inspire all of us to think about this as a California challenge and we get through it as Californians together, which is why I'm glad the five directors of the relevant state and federal agencies on wildlife management and water supply have come together to you. That was one of the most important lessons we learned from the last route. The directors of these relevant agencies have to be engaged on a daily basis together, trying to solve these problems. They're hard choices. They're not easy. They're gonna hurt. Um, I mean, I don't stand up and say the thing I want to see happen the most in the Delta is construction of salinity barriers. But as part of a package, it's something we need to consider doing. What we learned in the last route is our staff, we redirected about 200 staff and they spent about 150,000 hours of time. They conducted over 930 fish rescues of 38 different species, exceeding 270,000 fish. In one instance, our, our staff went out to the Modoc Plateau and picked up tiny little McLeod River red band trout, found nowhere else, beautiful fish. They brought them back to our hatchery outside Mount Shasta, the oldest hatchery west of the Mississippi. They refused to put them with the hatchery fish. They refused to feed them trout feed. They put bug zappers on the property and caught bugs and tried to keep these fish on native food as long as they could. And then they took them back to the streams when the conditions um, improved. This will be true on the terrestrial front as well. Paul's staff in mind, there's about 60 of a cute little fuzzy rodent called the Almarosa vole down in the desert left. What's its home? Wetlands. Not much of those in a drought. With UC Davis and Paul's staff, we brought about 62 of them into captivity, held them in refuge, and then put them back. It's an all hands on deck precarious situation, extinctions real on our side of the equation. Here's a last tool, I think. As I understand it, um, Folsom and Oroville will end up having uh, end of September storage target, carryover target. I think we're also in discussions amongst ourselves on how to treat something similar for Shasta. In my view, this idea of an end, end of September storage target is a prudent one. It's about acting with care and thought for the future. The higher we can keep our reservoirs, the main ones, Oroville, Folsom, and Shasta right now, the more we'll have an ability to keep water cool for the fish benefit right now. But also I think more importantly, the higher we can keep these reservoirs, the better prepared we are for next year. That's also a people benefit. That's a health and safety drinking supply benefit for next year. It's really hard to get people to think about the long term. Our brains are wired for the in the moment. And this really difficult conversation we're having about how you manage your reservoirs needs to balance the short term. And no doubt where you set this target has all kinds of impl implications, including to our partners in agriculture. But you need to be thinking about avoiding a domino of long-term effects. So I would submit that amongst all of our tools, um, one of them is how we handle right now these decisions around the reservoir storage targets. I'm thankful the governor has a $5.1 billion May revised drought contingency kind of resiliency plan. For us at the department, it will provide immediately almost $51 million to spend over three years and to onboard 55 staff to do all those things we're, we know we're gonna need to do in conjunction with you, Barry, Ernest, Carla, and Paul. And with that, let me flip it to Paul. Actually, did I say Barry? Let's flip it to Barry. We'll go to Paul. Paul, I'll kick it back and then I will take questions. I appreciate y'all giving us so much time. Director. Uh, thanks, Chuck, and uh, thank you, Chairman, for having us here. And uh, hi to members of the board. I've never been before the board before, so nice to meet you all virtually. 
Uh, Chuck sent, set some good context there for the situation we're in. So I'd probably make my uh, comments a little bit briefer. I did want to highlight um, a couple things today. One is just the coordination piece. Uh, talk a little bit about the temperature management, which tends to be a big focus, but also talk about some of the other factors. And just recognizing, like Chuck said, it's it's going to be a bad year for salmon. And, you know, from a salmon agency, um, we recognize it's going to be a bad year. But working together, it's trying to figure out how we actually work together to make it the best we can, uh, given the, the bad hand we've been dealt uh, moving forward. And so there is a, a tremendous amount of coordination going on. From no fisheries perspective, we have sort of two pieces here. One is um, from sort of the science side, from our Southwest Fisheries Science Center, how can we provide the best, most objective, transparent data we can on the impacts to fish, um, given the different scenarios we're looking at? And trying to, and there's been a, a tremendous amount of work going into that, um, tremendous amount of modeling scenarios and sort of real time, uh, recognizing that with that real time, because there is a lot of data going back and forth, the communication is critical. We know, you know, in trying to keep coordinated between us, between the settlement contractors, between VOR, the state, um, there is a, you know, always a work in progress to maintain that communication across those, but recognize that people all have their sort of best interest in mind and trying to provide objective, you know, transparent information so that you guys can all make the best decisions you can uh, moving forward. On the regulatory side, um, we both, you know, in addition to the work we're doing on temperature management and other pieces, we'll also um, be pushing forward on our voluntary drought agreements like we've had in the past in 2014, 2015. Um, Working with the state, and that's even even up in the Scott and Shasta up in the Klamath. You know, thanks to the board and others for being partners there to to do what we can uh, up in the Klamath. You know, as Chuck mentioned, it's a pretty bad situation. We're also working uh, with uh, with Paul and the Fish and Wildlife Service and others, and and Chuck on uh, hatchery management, trying to pull more winter run into the hatchery, uh, so we actually have some brood stock uh, and can secure those fish uh, for the long term, uh, given the impacts that they're going to be have out there. A couple of things I'll highlight on the temperature management side. So we tend to be laser focused on temperature management. We get criticized for that in some cases, and, and other people think that's a big benefit. And I'll talk a little bit about that. The temperature management is critical. And as Chuck said, you know, even going into this year, we've already had uh, one really bad year last year, um, a couple bad years for winter run. So we're going into a, a, a pretty bad situation and need to do what we can to maintain winter run survival and reduce temperature dependent mortality. And that's critical. But at the same time, if we aren't doing those other, you know, dealing with those other impacts in the system, whether it's main stem freshwater, main stem habitat, floodplain habitat, and increasing the productivity of those stocks, those investments in the temperature related in reducing that temperature mortality don't don't pay any benefits if they actually die somewhere else and vice versa. So last year, the temperature dependent mortality was low. We actually did really good on temperature, but we lost those fish somewhere else. And so we're really challenged with this balancing act of keeping everybody in the game to do everything we can across the full life history of the fish to actually make some progress if we're going to want to maintain a winter run moving forward. Um, so that's, um, I think the, the biggest thing we're trying to figure out is, you know, how do we work together? I'll, I'll recognize, Chair, that the conversations have been good. We have are doing a lot better job than we did in 2014 and 2015 in communication. I think we have a lot better science uh, to base that on um, and recognizing that we can use that to actually make some good informed decisions and do the best we can moving forward. And I'll just stop there and I'll turn it over to Paul Susan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairman. It's an honor to join the board. This is also my first time having a chance to address the board. I wish it was under better circumstances. I think all of us have sounded the alarm and it's something we all need to understand because it's going to be tough going forward. We care deeply about our relationship with the state. We are working among these five directors every day on multiple issues, doing the best we can with a difficult set of circumstances. We definitely appreciate the governor's leadership with providing the funding and the emergency declaration, and it sets the right tone for what's to come. We've seen, as Carla said, an extraordinary deterioration over the past six weeks, largely unprecedented. So we're walking into this drought situation when we didn't have an expectation we were going to be facing this difficulty. So all of us acknowledge that we're in uncharted territory and we're doing everything in our power to work together to address it. I do have to briefly mention the Klamath. It's been covered well by my friends, but the Klamath is in crisis. The par farmers and ranchers for the project are essentially getting no water. Barry and I have a tough conversation after this as we're trying to balance the need for salmon and Lost River and short nose suckers and many tribes. We have one of the most important wildlife refuges in the country. It was established in 1908 by President Theodore Roosevelt. It's the Lower Klamath, and it will get no water. 
Last year, we had 60,000 birds succumb to botulism because of dry conditions. And so we are deeply worried of what's going to come for our birds also. I'll focus on three issues and try to provide a few different nuances than my friends have shared. Number one, delta smelt. Delta smelt are on the verge of extinction. We have deep worry about their condition and obviously low flows that affect the low salinity zone, which they need in the Bay Delta are going to be very concerning to us going forward this year. We have what we believe to be an exciting effort that we're working with Chuck and his team on right now to try to reintroduce 3,000 Delta smelt to the Bay Delta in the fall in an effort to try and jumpstart the population and see if we can build toward recovery. So the drought conditions are gonna be extraordinarily important for us to consider as we find a methodology that's scientifically based to try to recover Delta smelt. Salmon was covered very well. I'll just add two points. We have an important pair of flagship salmon hatcheries up by Shasta, Coleman, and Livingston Stone. And we release over 12 million salmon every year. Uh, we have had to take some measures this year that we don't particularly care for, but just because of the deterioration in hydrology, we thought it was necessary. And we made these choices in conversations with the commercial and recreational fishermen. So we have trucked about a million of our salmon to Marin to release them to help the commercial fishery and recreational fishery in the ocean. We don't like to do this because the fish get stranded. They can't find their way back to where their natural home is located, and to the hatchery where they were raised in the upper Sacramento River. But these are the kind of actions that, as Chuck articulated, we have to take in desperate times. We have another release tonight by Marin of some of our salmon and one more Wednesday. And that will mark the end of our releases for this year. But it's been said, well, we need to start thinking about next year. And that's a, a recurring theme that I know the board is going to focus on. Relatedly, and this really reflects Barry's point, we have a tremendous science apparatus. So the good news is our monitoring at Red Bluff and Lodi, and our stations, we have boats on the water all the time, important screw traps to understand fish returns, they will be in full force. So we will be able to see what is going on with Chuck's team in terms of the impacts of the drought on our salmon. The third point I'll mention is refuges. Broadly speaking, we have an extraordinarily important network of refuges across the Pacific Flyway. As Chuck said, we think Lower Klamath is largely going to be lost this year, which means the birds are gonna be moving into Modoc and the Central Valley and trying to make their way south. So there will be a lot of birds in a few places where there's water. So we're doing everything in our power. We appreciate the leadership of the state and trying to be creative around groundwater for targeted efforts to help our Pacific Flyway. Honestly, the refuge system with Chuck's efforts and rice fields and other irrigated agriculture, they represent the centerpiece for the health of the Pacific Flyway. And in a wet year like this, we'll have to find ways to uh, deal with it and do the best we can. I'll just say in closing, the messages have been clear, working together is everything. This group of people work together every day. They're trying to solve problems. We need the help of the public. We welcome your advice. It's a committed partnership. As Chuck said, it's all hands on deck. And not just thinking about this year, but thinking about next year with reservoir capacity. If we have a year like this next year, all the drama we're facing now will be multiplied by a factor of 10. So thinking about next year now matters. I'll stop there and pass it back to you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you all so incredibly much. Um, you know, uh, there is not, I, I know earlier during public comment, uh, we heard a request to really, uh, you know, make make win-win decisions or, or find uh, win-wins out there. And I think it's the reality and the, the, the soberness and the somberness, I think that we need to bring to all of this that um, it's really about how we're going to share um, unfortunate circumstances together and get through uh, this this time. And, and regrettably, 
no easy win-wins on the table that uh, at least at this point I have found unturned. Um, and that turning of those rocks, of finding those options is all through your all leadership. And I appreciate, again, the, the tight coordination that this has required. Um, the fact that it is such a tight system now that all of these actions, whether it's TUCPs or curtailments or the Shasta temperature management plan, um, all need to fit together in a, a common decision-making space amongst us to see how best we balance out uh, very difficult circumstances and not leave um, any consideration um, out there. And that's where I really do appreciate the, I think we have 23 or so individuals um, here to, to comment on this discussion, um, to hear their concerns, to hear um, you know, their, their, their thoughts here, um, because it's critical that everybody come to us with their self-interest and that we collectively realize that there are things above any individual self-interest that we're, we're trying to attain and reach for. And we're doing so in a way, again, driven by you know, rapid assessment and modeling with supercomputers that we didn't have in the last drought to, to be able to evaluate and know that there is no perfect model. That, I mean, this moment itself showing the, the sometimes the limit uh, we have on our models when we quickly moving into a climate uh, that simply no longer exists and that we're having to all ensure that we're adapting our water systems and the way we all even in, think of this resource together um, so as to, to, to make it through. And there just acknowledged uh, Director uh, Chuck, your, your, uh, your comments around the investments that were also recently announced in the last week. Um, it's, you know, those, we're not going to get through this without spending resources to adapt our water systems to a 21st century. And so those, those investments are a down payment and what I know is a national discussion around how we you know, again, not just unique to California here, but Westwide, adapt our water systems to a, a 21st century and give ourselves the best chance we can. So just thank you and um, open it up for my fellow board colleagues for comment. Uh, questions here of the directors. I know this is a lot. Um, I know there hasn't been the space, I think, for, for certainly us to come here publicly to be able to, to lay out some of the, the, the considerations that are before us here and the criticality of really bringing them together here uh, really very soon so as to be able to move on to what are going to be a lot of real-time operations as the actual system that here we're modeling out and trying to make our best assessment of balancing actually unfolds before us. So I have a few um, questions. Vice Chair, please. Yeah, and before asking them, just want to um, have provide some big picture comments. And first of all, to thank you all for your tremendous leadership. Um, I too agree that this feels different from the last drought. Um, I think we were sort of scrambling and asking for real time um, collaboration and interagency coordination. And that just happened, you know, right at the start. And I do really appreciate uh, Director Nemeth, your comment about the slow moving disaster versus the um, sort of, you know, hit you over the head uh, crisis that we're seeing here. And so the need to just move really quickly. And um, I do appreciate what you're all doing and also our staff, um, but I do wanna use this as an opportunity um, to just also um, really encourage that good outside the box thinking, um, not just interagency, but also with the stakeholders. So if I look at just any one piece here, whether it's TUCP curtailments or temperature management, the suite of actions, um, if we look just at that one piece, it, if, any, if any of us um, as uh, agency heads and uh, those that are working on this look at any one piece, we may miss those opportunities for some, um, maybe wouldn't go as far as to call them a win-win solution because of this being so tough, but just not as bad and a pill that people can handle. And uh, Director Bonham, just as you've indicated, a concern about that cascading effect that you see if we miss out on some opportunities um, and then ongoing um, issues with disease and um, temperature and um, year class. Um, I too have that concern. I think we all have this concern regarding the, the trade-offs um, on water supply. And 
any action that we as a board could take or other, any of you could take a regulatory action, sometimes there's unintended consequences that we may miss. And so that's giving that space, not just with the agencies, but also with the communities at large to be looking at um, unintended consequences, maybe um, better approaches. And uh, thankfully, a lot of really good um, uh, actions that have been put on the table um, by the water supply community uh, to maybe um, avoid a, a regulatory action. And so just uh, really want to encourage you all to continue having uh, those good discussions and appreciate what you've done so far. I just have um, uh, two questions. Really, one is more of a request for Mr. Tom. So that uh, temperature workshop um, uh, that we had a few weeks ago, um, I found it to be quite fascinating. I don't have a scientific background, but all of that information from the Science Center and uh, the different runs and that rapid assessment tool. And then, you know, a few weeks later, receiving um, your thoughtful comments on temperature management and the inclusion of, I think there's a chart in there um, on some of the runs. And I know that, um, you know, there's, there's quite a wide range. And um, as, as was indicated at the workshop, um, still a great deal of uncertainty. But again, getting back to this um, issue of space, um, recognizing we have to move quickly, but space for outside groups to review models and comment and provide you know, their own thoughts um, uh, with the idea toward improvement. Um, where are you, um, uh, where is NIMFS on this issue of the release of the data and, and the models? So that um, if these uh, models that are being used are the underpinning for some of the uh, decisions, um, uh, more input could be provided from stakeholders. Yeah, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, yeah, so in terms of that, we, we have tried to make the information, the previous modeling efforts um, uh, distributed that out so people do have that so they can comment. Um, there are some, you know, it's sort of ever evolving modeling effort and trying to true those up given the assumptions and the changing hydrology. Um, we are in the process of, of trying to develop a, a website to actually post that information so that it actually is available to the to the board, uh, to the contractors and others so that they can actually have a visibility on those modeling results. But I don't have any time frame for when that might be up. Up and available, but we are trying to do what we can. Um, there's this there is a challenge of trying to, you know, like you probably understand in terms of truing up the modeling efforts. And I know early on, given the rapid assessment tool, you know, with those efforts come, you know, finding small errors and other things in there and trying to true that up. And so that's always a constant challenge we have of what we can put out there given the assumptions um, and how, you know, making sure that it is the most accurate, but recognizing that there always are always are going to be tweaks to that moving forward. So take it as a grain of salt. I would actually say, you know, and, and you referenced the table in our temperature management comment letter um, of one of the utilities of those modeling efforts is not just focusing on the the specific numbers in those tables, but really the comparative across those scenarios is really where that becomes valuable, looking across the scenarios and, and the benefits. I mean, nobody has to explain to too many people that you know, fish need water and fish need cold water. Um, <laughs> but, but I think looking at the comparative nature for decision making, I think is important between those different scenarios and what could be best. That, that's helpful, thank you. And I think with regard to the comparative nature, one of the things that um, has been a challenge is looking at trade-offs and sort of the comparative nature as well as, as um, those different scenarios are considered, um, what sort of uh, impact would that have on um, trade-offs um, in terms of um, um, other species and also uh, water users and uh, potentially groundwater use and drinking water supplies. So- um, Yeah, uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Oh, and sorry. Then, mm -hmm. Oh. No, go on, please. I just wanna acknowledge, uh, I think uh, Chuck also maybe wanted to add a little something. Oh, I didn't realize. Thank you. It's hard to keep track of the Hollywood Square. There's so many faces yeah. online. Hey, Vice oh, Chair, nice, nice to see you. I hear you. Um, I, personally wouldn't take any of these decisions lightly because there's ramifications no matter what we decide in all directions. And those impacts could run to people I consider to be 
colleagues in the water user and agricultural space. I mean, we have real leaders in the Sac Valley for sure. I think the message for me though, is these are gonna be hard decisions that require us to be thoughtful. We don't have a lot of time to dilly dally, but we also need to be super deliberate and try to understand that balancing, particularly at the board whose charge is to balance. And I hear you on the request for creativity. In the last route, we came up with an approach where if landowners would join us in doing approaches and the package was, you know, would, would substantially help, then we would agree not to, you know, enforce under the California Endangered Species Act during the period they would be doing those emergency voluntary commitments. And then I think Paul would say with me, the way we're gonna make the flyway work is we think about our refuges, our public properties and nearby adjacent private parties. And we see if we can get some private partnership in conjunction with the public space and preserve enough postage stamp that there's wetted habitat for birds. So partnerships is gonna be essential. And then um, my second question has to, and last, has to do with uh, curtailments. So I'd like to better understand um, from uh, directors Neenmith and Conant um, on, if, if you were to just look at right now, the, the releases that are occurring and the demands, whether it's in-basin demands, exports, water quality standards, and any gap that exists on, you know, I don't, I don't know the best way to describe it, but losses, uh, losses in the Delta, just to uh, better put this in perspective on the intense need that we have right now to protect uh, stored water releases. Um, as we move forward in this workshop on Friday, uh, I think that can help to sort of frame the discussion. Ernest, um, I don't know if you have a have a number um, available about what we were seeing with depletions. Yeah, I've got a cheat sheet here, just of uh, I mean, just our current conditions, but it doesn't really fully answer the vice chair's question, which maybe we could better elaborate on for Friday. <clears throat> but I mean, just in terms of our releases today, we're at eight eight hundred at Keswick, which is Shasta, 2,500 at Oroville, 1,000 at Folsom. Uh, but Edmonton's salinity standards are controlling, so we can't really reduce the releases. Exports are at about 1,200 with the two projects. Um, and so Delta outflow is actually a little higher than required, um, but it, it has to be because of uh, salinity is controlling. <clears throat> so the missing part there is just what the diversions have been and what we would estimate, you know, out of priority diversions would be. So maybe we can work on refining that uh, more for you, Vice Chair. And uh, I just don't have anything readily available to precisely answer your question. <clears throat> Thank you. That would be helpful. Just another tool in the in the toolbox there as we move forward on the curtailment issues. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. And I agree with you that um, getting the data out, making sure that you know we have a very transparent uh, process around the sort of tools that are being uh, used or developed here is really important. And also important to note, though, there is no perfect tool out there that we are at this point. You know, these are all um, sort of tools in their own space. I know that Reclamation and DWR have their own modeling efforts when it comes to their actual operations. Then you kind of layer on the Science Center for kind of considerations of different scenarios on, you know, temperature benefit and other things. But all this together, you know, we, I think we kid ourselves if we have a, we think we're, we will have a perfect tool in this. And it is, you know, then incumbent upon us to make that right judgment call. But here again, informed with the best available science, the best available tools, even knowing that, you know, just on fundamental data of, you know, who has right to what or diversions on the curtailment side, we know we're a little behind. And so we'll, we'll continue to just do and drive as best we can, I think in that space, but just to caution that, I mean, there is no, 
I don't think there is no perfect tool at hand yet, but hopefully continue to build one through cooperation and through the coordination of everyone, including, and importantly, to your point, stakeholders on the outside of this discussion. Director Namath. Yeah, um, thanks for that uh, question, Vice Chair. I think uh, I don't have the, the number, but but I know that some of my technical staff did, and I'll, I'll, I don't want to misspeak, but I'll, I'll go find that. But basically what we were seeing is, you know, obviously in an, in an anticipated ability to meet water quality conditions in the Delta during April. And so we released the volumes of water that we thought would do it. Uh, but instead, we were we were in violation, which does speak to a depletion factor. We we always consider a depletion factor, but it was, I I was told it was about double what we thought. Um, the actual sort of CFS, I don't know, but we can get that information and um, and bring it to the table uh, in time for uh, the workshop because I do think that's kind of a key piece, and that was a that was obviously a piece that took us by surprise. Um, before I go, I just, um, Chair, I see this little screen of my Microsoft Office is deciding it's going to update in seven minutes. So in seven minutes, I'm gonna to transition to my phone. You won't see me on the screen, but I will be active in the conversation. I don't know how to <laughs> shut it down without shutting it down. So sorry about I, that. I've had one of those too. And, and I've been in a mean Teams meeting where suddenly Microsoft says, well, we want you to re-authenticate yourself because right. that's just how our security standards are. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, no worries in the least. Other board members, please, uh, you know, questions and or comments here. And we do have about 23 folks that are, are gonna uh, look to uh, provide us further input here. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank uh, all the directors for being here today. and. You know, I'll, I could echo and repeat all of the comments that are already shared by everyone, uh, including my uh, fellow colleague board members, about how critical this time really is. And I've been, you know, I wasn't on the board during the last drought, so I, but I have spent a lot of time coming up to speed on my responsibilities as a board member and the authorities that we have, um, whether it's considering a TUCP for Delta operations, whether it's looking at curtailments and how far and extensively those need to reach. Um, whether it's our capabilities to embrace collaborate, um, you know, voluntary uh, agreements in different watersheds and how rapidly we can do that. And, uh, you know, in, in all cases, it's a little bit untested and unclear. But one thing I've realized is how we do really need to think about all this in an integrated way. And what I've been hearing today is that we're moving in that direction. And I'm really encouraged uh, to see all of you together, um, to see all of us talking here in a public space, knowing that we have you know, over the next couple of weeks here, at least at the board, we have, and you as well, you know, we have a lot of very difficult decisions that need to be made and balancing with a very small bucket of water this year and um, a number of watersheds that really are facing conditions that we, you know, frankly, at least that to my knowledge have never experienced before. And so none of these decisions are gonna be easy. And uh, Director Nemeth, I believe you mentioned uh, you know, you may have to return at some point. I appreciate that offer whenever that appropriate time is. Um, and for those of you who, are, who, this is your first time here, thank you uh, very much. This has been incredibly helpful just to hear your download of, uh, and your perspective on what's been evolving over these past six weeks or so. so thank you. Thank you so much, board member. Really appreciate it. Board member Firestone. Yeah. So I will um, echo everything that's said. Um, I do have a few questions, but I also just, you know, want to emphasize how much um, just you all are so busy. Your leadership and collaboration is amazing. And I also really appreciate the time to come um, to this public space and public forum to, to talk about these things that are really challenging. I think it's, you know, helps create this space of all hands on deck, um, Let's create a common understanding of where we are, and um, and then also try to understand um, and be well informed in our decision making as a board. And I think all of the work that you're doing from um, from some of the stakeholders and, and interests that maybe you you know aren't necessarily engaged with on a daily basis. So I just I really really appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I guess I also want to say, and, and we talked about curtailments and um, and other responsibilities and tools that we 
um, that we have in this, um, you know, real crisis time as, um, as uh, you know, the area within our responsibilities. Um, I do feel like the regulatory actions um, and, you know, our role as kind of a backstop are necessary to create kind of more of these, these creative and, and, and innovative solutions and collaborations. It, it needs to be done in a way that actually does facilitate that. Um, but I don't think it's incompatible. And I think we can do that. Um, and we have a responsibility to do that in a way that, um, you know, is well informed so that we don't have unintended consequences, but also, um, you know, takes that, that need in terms of our role um, seriously. So I have a couple questions. Um, you know, as I was listening, and I'm trying to understand this as somebody that's relatively new to these spaces, um, I, you know, I, I know there's, a, I see things in, in kind of three boxes in the, in sort of the, the drought crises that I've been part of um, to date. This is so much more complex and integrated than anything that I've been a part of, but I think that the overall structure of you know, how are we adjusting our management planning to better manage for this new normal? Um, and secondly, how are we mitigating and responding kind of immediately to the immediate term issues? And then lastly, how are we really accelerating um, the structural changes and investments in creating real resiliency so that we're not in this, you know, the, the situation um, as we know, this is going to be really the new normal and much more frequent. Um, so just within those three buckets, um, I, I guess I just wanted to hear kind of highlights. Um, I, I certainly, I think I heard a lot in this, um, in this presentation around all of the risk management and planning work that's going on. So I don't want to have you have to um, reiterate any of those things. I'm wondering, I think in particular in that area, if just given the real, um, I mean, you all mentioned this, this um, really unexpected shift in terms of um, snowpack translating to runoff, for example, um, and, and just really high temperatures. And just given that, you know, we, we do see um, we, we can anticipate that there's um, a new normal with climate change that is, is going to have more of these extremes and changes. Does that change, you know, are you factoring in, does that change the assumptions that you're factoring in into the, um, you know, the operations and planning um, work that you're doing? I know you're been working on temperature management plan and drought plan, um, but overall also operations planning, just if you can talk a little bit about um, whether, you know, what, whether things that have happened this year um, may result, where you see that may or may not result in um, changes in the assumptions you're bringing into to management and planning. I think Carla's computer is reset on her, yeah. but she is, I think she is on her phone now though. Um, I am, okay. I am. Um, Ernest, I think had his hand up. So why don't you go oh, first, okay. Ernest? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Member Firestone, I'm kind of addressing your question, which I think is talking really about forecasting, which, you know, we all got caught by surprise. <laughs> and uh, so Carla and I have talked about this, um, you know, DW, we rely upon DWR largely. DWR has the preeminent forecasting organization probably in the nation. <laughs> um, and throughout reclamation, as I mentioned, we've seen the same issue come up this year. So I know at reclamation, we're gonna be taking a fresh look at forecasting from a Westwide perspective, <clears throat> um, you know, and working with our our local and state partners, um, exactly how that's going to evolve. I'm not sure, but I know it's uh, a key action of my item of my leadership. It's something we've taken note of, and um, and I'm sure we'll be collaborating with DWR, uh, working through. You know, is there a better way 
to approach forecasting. Thank you, Mr. Conant. Chuck. And board member, I'll give you an example in each of your areas. They may not be as like globally significant once we can crack the innovative nut on hydrology forecasting. But I think on my side, I can't speak for Barry or Paul. I mean, we're adjusting planning, taking into account where species are going to shift over time because of climate. I mean, some species may no longer have tolerable um, habitat conditions. Some may need to migrate to different spots. And one of the things we learned in the last route was a really high increase of human wildlife conflicts. We had bears in downtown Bakersfield. Now I couldn't tell you it's causation, drought equals bears in downtown Bakersfield. But I do think the data would suggest there's correlation. You know, scarcity animals look for food and water. We've actually seen a 300% increase in the last five years of those kinds of interfaces, conflicts. So we could see this one coming in the current drought and we've pre-deployed cages and staff. So that's an example of planning. Mitigation responding. We're better positioned for this drought coming out of the last one because we spent a lot of money to go to our hatcheries with Paul and Barry, and we installed water recirculation systems and chillers and fish rescue units and UV systems to kill pathogens. And all these things we didn't know we would experience in the last drought because of this dynamic. So our infrastructure is a little bit better prepared. And then structural change. The fact of the matter, though, is you need landscape scale change, right? So there's a lot of conversation in connecting our rivers to our floodplains. You know, that's, that's an example. But I'd also say in the governor's budget is 200, and, um, I think it's 30 million to the Wildlife Conservation Board for fish passage and wildlife crossing. At the end of the day, on the animal side, in my view, freedom to roam is a single most important adaptation strategy to climate impact. They have to have an ability to get between habitats. And you're involved in this, but there's 350 miles of habitat above dams on the Klamath River where fish can't get to now. So that's a very large fish passage project, but there are countless of them along the coastal zone in California. That's an institutional change at scale. Great, that's really helpful. I don't Thank know you. if Carla wants to um, jump I in do. and have a second question. <laughs> I do. Thanks. Um, first, before I forget, um, Vice Chair, to your earlier question, um, you know, basically the projects were releasing um, water from the reservoirs and um, there was about a 5,000 CFS sort of deficit once it got to Freeport. That's about 1,000 CFS uh, more than we saw in the 2015 drought in terms of a depletion rate. And it started happening about a week earlier. So that's, that's just a, you know, kind of a, a data point for you. Um, but um, board member Firestone, this is a really good question. And as you can imagine, this is something that we're thinking about very intensely in our state water project office. A couple of things. Um, one of the things that um, we are doing with our state water contractors is we are looking at next year and, and not only examining, you know, through our models, um, you know, it's this kind of 90% exceedance, but we now have experience with a 99% exceedance, um, but also really starting to dig into the soil moisture data um, and starting to understand um, that that is, um, is, you know, not, it's not entirely new to the department to look at it, but clearly that factored far more significantly here. Um, so that's going to, I think, emerge as another key parameter of hydrology and what we can expect. And I think that, um, you know, we are likely to see these intense dry conditions persist into next year. And so we are, you know, really gearing up for um, a high likelihood that 
that next year is also an outlier year, probably in a way we can't quite conceive of because that's the the sort of stress of climate change, right? You, once you think you've got, you know, some view that it's a different sequence, it's a different set of issues that come upon you. But we are very much looking at that and um, that will be part of our planning that, you know, we'll share with board staff and others as we go forward. Um, one of the things that is um, kind of stunning about it to me is that, you know, in 2020, when the, the State Water Project uh, pursued um, an incidental take permit that was um, separate from a consistency determination from a federal opinion, which is typically how we sought California endangered species compliance, one of the things that we did in our um, in our project description was having learned from the last drought, we started to carry over 300,000 acre feet more in Oroville to deal with a, a consecutive dry year challenge. So the good in that was actually since 2020 was dry, we carried over more water than we ordinarily would have. The not so good about that is, um, you know, here we are. So um, 300,000 acre feet, that's about, you know, I think it's 20% more than we had been carrying over before. So it was a significant policy decision to, uh, you know, start really thinking about climate. Um, and ultimately it meant that last year with our 20% allocation, we met that entirely out of San Luis Reservoir to leave Oroville, you know, to kind of be doing other things, if you will. You know, we've got other water users that we supply. There's, you know, temperatures issue, issues. There's, you know, all sorts of things that we're managing for up there. So I say that as a, those are some concrete things we've been doing. I think we need to do more. And I think, you know, as a department, we'll be working together with Ernest in this larger sort of forecasting issue. And, you know, what does it mean to be outside of a 90% exceedance? And how do we start incorporating that into our thinking? So I would imagine that in this sort of year over year, you know, set of activities, you know, we're, we're managing in, in pretty tough times, but we're gonna be making, you know, a number of decisions that will be carried forward. Um, in terms of, you know, how we measure extremes and how that gets into our um, sort of our overall assessment, for example, of, you know, we do a water reliability report associated with um, the State Water Project. And for the first time ever, we actually had a climate aspect to that where we are layering on climate assumptions to reliability. That's the first time ever last year for the State Water Project. And we also actually just hired a, a climate person who works for the State Water Project, who's going to be bringing all of that. Um, we're, we were lucky to uh, have him back. He was at the Stewardship Council doing fantastic work there. And he's coming back to the department. Um, and we're really excited about incorporating um, that. And it is a position within the State Water Project um, so that it gets really, um, it really does become much more uh, part of our planning parameters. Great, thank you all so much. Um, I have a, I, I'll just make it one more question, although it probably touches on a couple of things. <laughs> um, so in these buckets of kind of mitigation response and, um, and, and maybe also within kind of the uh, resiliency sort of structural changes and in investments, um, I think one of the pieces that hasn't uh, been as uh, in the forefront of people's minds all the time um, has been some of the environmental justice concerns. And I think particularly um, one thing we heard from a lot of folks in public comment um, that have been bringing up these issues for a while at the board. Um, and I think some, some folks that will probably just uh, be here for public comment um, pretty quickly um, now is concerns around HABs and um, harmful algal blooms, you know, especially in the Delta. And, um, uh, you know, certainly um, that, I think one of the challenge, one of the many challenges with that is that there isn't one agency that's, um, has an existing HABs 
regulatory um, program. Um, and uh, I'm, I think what I'm, I'm interested to hear is, are there ways that you all are looking at kind of um, being able to try to integrate mitigation for HABs impacts for, for management decisions. And, um, and then also, I, you know, I guess that's both in terms of the um, more immediate uh, response, as well as more, you know, long-term kind of resiliency. Are there discussions around things that can be done that are more investments and structural around trying to um, look at how we can reduce those impacts of this, you know, new climate change reality that we're in. So I thought it may be a harder question, but I bring it up because I know it's one that's that that's uh, come up for us a lot at the board from the community. Um, and I think hasn't always been as um, visible and, and integrated into a lot of the, the management decisions that are going on, but that does have a particularly an environmental justice concern. Yeah, thank you, board member. Um, I'll just flag, I know that there's um, the issue of HABs is an issue throughout the state as well. I know there's good work with our folks at OEMA and our program, but then also Clear Lake has a specific project that I know also uh, suffers from HAB issues. Dos Palos as well, a community that comes to mind with um, harmful algal bloom and then their toxins issues in their water. But, um, and I know uh, Director Namath, I don't know if you uh, would like to speak at all to, to some of what I know is um, at, at least the, the projects as well, and a growing understanding and desire across the system to really figure out harmful algal, algal blooms. Yeah, so a couple things on that front, and I do kind of want to reflect on um, board member uh, Firestone's comments about, you know, it, it lives in a few places, and I think that that's been kind of a flaw. Um, frankly, it, it does feel like it gets um, a little bit too orphaned. Um, so, so there is work to be done on that. And it's, there is a, I, I learned oh, about a year ago that there is an, an algal bloom council that um, we work on with the board and I believe Cal EPA. Um, so that is something that at DWR we've been working on, um, you know, bringing new energy to. Um, we've been having some conversations with the city of Stockton um, and um, Restore the Delta has raised that as an issue. Um, and it's it's definitely something we need to um, figure out where the resources lie across multiple agencies and um, and set to, to work on it. There aren't, um, there really aren't easy solutions. Um, and I think as it relates to, um, as it relates to the Delta itself, I think, um, a key partner in that um, is likely to be um, the Stewardship Council and some of the work that they've been doing on climate change and vulnerability in that system, because I, I think that that's emerging there as well, um, and you know, bringing those folks together. Um, one of the things that we learned in the last drought, um, and I'm pausing because I want to, I, I want to make sure I get it right. Um, one of the things that we learned was, you know, how salinity intrusion affects um, vegetation, particularly in the western part of the delta and other places in the delta. Um, and I think we had been hoping for, um, you know, we had done some sort of test areas, you know, where we could, you know, we were removing some of the um, of non-native vegetation. And I think ultimately um, that effort was overwhelmed by temperatures and salinity. And I think it's something that um, we've been talking to DFW about um, uh, in the recent past. It's probably something we have to put back on our radar in terms of drought management, because there is there's definitely an interplay between you know, removal of this kind of vegetation and you know, making sure that we're not um, you know, we're not harming, um, you know, fish and wildlife species there as well. So I think there are a couple of to-dos there. Um, and I would just, 
you know, welcome more um, direct in engagement with the board on, on the topic, particularly as it, you know, relates to activities in the Delta. Yeah, thank you, Director. And I think yeah, what comes to mind is that Water Quality Monitoring Council <clears throat> that we're jointly um, uh, part of and really a good place that we can maybe uh, even see better coordination with communities that are particularly uh, impacted by harmful algal blooms. So yeah, thank you for the good, uh, good quick thought, uh, knowing that not necessarily prepared to, to respond fully to the comment. And I think it's uh, about more work there. So thank you, Board Member Firestone, for connecting uh, the dots there. Thank you. Any other questions from fellow board uh, colleagues before we move on to public comment? And I wanna thank the directors. We've now had uh, an hour and a half of your time and know that you are all very, very busy. So um, do know that uh, you can stick around for public comment um, or um, I, I, re I respect and understand if uh, you all need to move on to other work as well. Uh, but we'll continue to be talking. I mean, we'll, we'll, the board will be here to hear the comments and we'll certainly uh, bring them back to our discussions as we continue to balance out a very difficult system. But any, um, any other thoughts, anything uh, further to, to leave us with? We haven't had a chance to cover um, before we transition to uh, additional comments from, from folks. Chairman, I'll just note that three of us have to leave but to talk about Klamath. I think our deputies are on. If any further questions come up, you could defer to them. Um, if any board members have any further questions. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. No, much, yeah, much uh, uh, realized there's a lot going on. So thank you for just taking the hour and a half here to begin with. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you again. Uh, now then, I'd like to transfer, I'd like to transition over to um, comments, and I think our first uh, commenter is Alex uh, Beering, and thank you for your patience and um, sticking with us. Then, uh, instead of speaking this morning, and hopefully now um, maybe reflect, you know, hopefully we we answered a few things, or at least sh shed a little more light into what it is our thinking is, and can now um, and welcome everyone's comments and thoughts and uh, reflection. And so at this point, um, I think it is about 23 folks. Uh, we'll go ahead and keep it about three minutes. If you need to go over a little, that's fine. If you're under, that's fine too. But um, let's let's just say three for now. And um, thank you. Good for you to join us. Good afternoon. Okay, great. Um, yeah, good afternoon to you, Chair Esquivel and the board members. Um, my name is Alex Fearing. For those I don't know, I work for Frant Water Authority. Um, just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, we know you're reviewing, as you said earlier, Reclamation's draft Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan. Um, and the Frank Division CDP contractors have a special interest in Shasta Reservoir Operations. And I just wanted to mention a couple things about that. Um, as you know, our water supply is made possible by the purchase and exchange agreements between Reclamation and the original water rights. Uh, holders on the San Joaquin River. Part of those agreements allow for those water users, the exchange contractors, to call on their reserved rights to the river when the Sacramento River supplies can be delivered to them from the Delta. That happened twice, as you know, um, in 2014 and 15, and in both years, the exchange contractors instead received their water supplies from Millerton. In a year such as 2021, which is going to potentially meet uh, even the driest years on record for California, implementing operational decisions um, and conditions beyond what's in the draft, Sacramento River TMP will probably reduce Sacramento River exports from the Delta enough to potentially trigger another call on some amount of France supplies by the exchange contractors. The results of that could be pretty um, Spearing, devastating to- oh, yeah. go on. No, I'll let you finish your comment oh. first, sorry. I do, I do oh, want to follow yeah. up on that point though. Go on. Okay, yes, yes. Um, so, I mean, the two things that we're most concerned about is, are, you know, by reducing the amount of surface water that's available for irrigation and groundwater recharge in the Sprite Division service area, you're potentially impacting the quality and quantity of groundwater that is available for um, dozens of communities that rely almost entirely or entirely on groundwater. Um, so that is something we saw in 2015 and, it, and it's a concern here as well. The second thing that we're concerned about is reducing the potential cold water pool behind Triant Dam through the fall months, which could increase temperature dependent mortality of the spawning population of spring run Chinook salmon that was established through the San Joaquin River Restoration Settlement and Program. And that's something that, you know, we've had several successes uh, over the past six years or so with salmon returning 
Um, and so that's something that we want to be able to protect. So we just want you guys to give consideration to those impacts as you think about how you are, how conservative you want to be in trying to conserve Sacramento Valley resources in 2021. That's all. Thank you. No, thank you, Ms. Beering. Uh, point of clarification, as I understand it in my discussion with the operators, uh, a call on Friant is because of this hole that we uh, discussed about the you know, 500,000 acre foot hole that's in operations. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure we are clear on that and not necessarily that uh, you know, the temperature management plan, which as I understand is still based off of pre-April pre hydrology that doesn't take into account that big hole is like you know, the cause, if you will, of, yeah. of, this, of, of a need to call on Friant. Because I think we should be very clear sure. with that. Because I was pretty clear from the operators, at least, that this this moment where we have the hole uh, is what's causing a call on Friant, not uh, any 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 deviation from the temperature management plan, which of course uh, would have the effect of increasing perhaps that call. But would note that the hydrology of the plan, as submitted, is pre-April or at least um, before our understanding of this massive 500,000 acre foot plus hole yeah. in the system. No, that's a good clarification, um, and and you're right about that. But it's the sort of domino effect of all these types of things, and where it where it ends up. So we just wanted to to note Definitely. that, and in, within the context of these decisions. So thank you. Definitely, Appreciate it. that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Beering. Uh, next, we have Thad Bettner. And Chair Escobel, Mr. Bettner has not joined us at this point in time, so we okay. can keep him in the queue if he rejoins later. Okay. Uh, sorry, and Mr. Bettner, if you are viewing from one of the other platforms, please um, just uh, join us back here. Would appreciate uh, your comments. Uh, next, then we have uh, Doug OBG. Good afternoon, Chair, Board Members. Doug OBG on behalf of the Natural Resources Defense Council again. Um, there's a lot of talk today and a lot I want to respond to with very little time. Um, and it's hard to express just how frustrated we are with the lack of action to curtail diversions over the last several months. You know, as we know, as you know, we sent a letter to the board two months ago asking the board to take immediate action because we saw this slow moving train wreck happening. Um, and unfortunately, that is what's happening. Um, you know, we are now faced with TUCPs that sacrifice water quality for some communities in the Delta to improve water quality for the export projects. Um, Shasta temperature management that will devastate what not just winter run salmon, but fall run salmon that are the backbone of the state salmon fishery. And ultimately, we're in this position because the board hasn't been allowed to update the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan. And because DWR and the Bureau of Reclamation have refused to plan for these kinds of droughts. Uh, indeed, in the CEQA document that Director Nemeth was describing before, we, we asked DWR to model what happens in those droughts and account for TUCPs, and they said it was quote unquote speculative to make those kinds of plans. You know, we've, we've lost a lot of ground just in the last two months of inaction um, because we've released so much water from Shasta and these other reservoirs, largely to satisfy um, demands for growers along the Sacramento River. And to, to board member Adamo's question, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, um, on May 10th, uh, we were releasing more than 17,000 cubic feet per second of water from just Shasta, Orville, Folsom, and New Bullard's Bar on the Yuba. And we were only seeing like 6,000, 7,000 of that reach the Sacramento River. So the vast majority of, of this water supply is being diverted upstream of the Delta. And I, I do agree that we need to think about all these actions in tandem, just the temperature management, UCPs, salinity barrier, just as the board did last time. But I think we're missing some of those connections. First, even as DWR seeks to violate their water rights obligations, they haven't reduced their state water project allocation to zero. That would conserve another 200,000 acre feet of water. As you know, water quality standards are already far weaker in dry and critically dry years under decision 1641. And the board has recognized in the past that the existing standards are not adequate. You know, given the record levels of water storage for many state water project contractors, particularly metropolitan, I think it's unreasonable for the board to allow the state and federal projects to violate the terms of their water rights and these water quality standards before reducing the state water project allocation to zero. Similarly, I think the board needs to account for the conserved water if TUCPs are granted. 
you know, we saw last time in 2014 and 2015 that that reduced um, storage releases by well over a million acre feet. And I estimate that the TCPs that have been proposed would reduce delta outflow by approximately 120,000 acre feet in June and July. Now that may not be the, the, fun, the final answer, but I think you have to consider that when you're thinking about setting carryover storage targets. We do think that it is critically important to set a carryover storage target at Shasta and a cap on reservoir releases. And the only somewhat protective operational scenario that I've seen is the one analyzed by NIMS on April 27th, which capped Re Keswick releases at 6,000 CFS and results in a 1.47 million acre foot end of September storage. You know, that resulted in fifth, killing 50% of the endangered winter run salmon and meant that fall temperatures would be around 60 degrees, giving fall run Chinook a, a fighting chance. Well, that reduces Keswick releases by about 500,000 acre feet. It still leaves carryover storage far less than the 1.9 million acre feet target from the 2009 NIMS biop. And anything less than that appears unreasonable. And finally, I think it's important for the board to recognize that the water allocations to many of these settlement contractors that DWR and Reclamation are making this year is far more water than these parties would be entitled to under their water rights. That includes the Sacramento River Settlement Contractors, the Feather River Settlement Contractors, the San Joaquin River Exchange Contractors, and CVP Contractors on the Stanislaus River. For instance, DWR's allocation to the Feather River Settlement Contractors is 600,000 acre feet, largely delivered over the summer, even though the full natural flows for April to July on the Feather River is only 460,000 acre feet. The CVP al CVP's allocation to the San Joaquin River Exchange Contractors is approximately 156% of the full natural flows for April to July on the San Joaquin River. And the same, albeit smaller amount, is true for the settlement contractors on the Sacramento River. The implementation of these water supply contracts this year, when the projects are violating their water rights obligations in the Delta and below Shasta Dam, is unreasonable under the state constitution. These contracts are not inviolate, and the rule of priority must yield when it leads to unreasonable results. Cutting these contract deliveries to the amounts they are entitled to under their water rights would significantly improve the ability to meet Delta water quality standards and increase carryover storage, which is necessary for temperature control this year for salmon, and as all the agencies acknowledged, necessary for water supply if next year is also dry. I don't envy the board's duty to make these decisions. I know sometimes it sounds like I'm cavalier about this, and I'm not. And I know that you have a really difficult job. But it is incredibly frustrating to see that we're now the third year in the last seven that we're violating Delta water quality standards. And the third year in the last seven that we're going to have massive mortality of winter run Chinook salmon. And it's clear that the system is breaking and we can't act quickly enough. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Obiji. I appreciate the comments and, and contributions here. And um, certainly it's uh, you know not lost on me and these last weeks and their intensity certainly um, just reinforcing that we have a system we've all inherited collectively uh, that we're needing to reconcile um, because it we simply don't have the hydrology it was built for. And uh, it's meaning, uh, again, uh, we all have to continue to best uh, see how we contribute to what is gonna be uh, not an easy uh, time ahead, certainly, as we uh, make the investments we need to to transition to uh, a, a climate that we obviously have before us now. Um, but just thanks, I appreciate it. Uh, next, we have Rachel Zwillinger. Hey there, I'm Rachel Zwillinger with Defenders of Wildlife. Um, I just have three quick points to make. Um, first, Defenders would like to ask you, similar to NRDC, to require operations that are consistent with the recent NIMS modeling that minimize temperature-related mortality to winter run. Um, that means limiting releases from Keswick to 6,000 CFS through the summer and targeting carryover storage of more than 4 million acre feet. Um, and it seems to me that the alternative is just unacceptable. It would mean unnecessarily killing the vast majority of a year class of gravely endangered winter run and setting us up for the possibility of an ecological, humanitarian, and economic disaster next year. And so on this front, I would ask you to act quickly. 
um, before it's too late. Second, um, a quick note on the Pacific Flyway. We're really concerned about habitats for birds and other wetland wildlife this year as well. Um, I think this is a space where there are a lot of opportunities for creative solutions to safeguard Pacific Flyway birds, giant garter snakes, and other wetland wildlife. Um, I think first and foremost, safeguarding and prioritizing refuge water supplies is essential. Um, second, prioritizing having some water available for rice straw decomposition in the winter is going to be really important for, for waterfowl and shorebirds coming through the valley. Um, and third, to the extent we are looking at water transfers and rice idling for other reasons, trying to make sure we're idling rice in patterns that are protective of giant garter snakes and ensure some habitat connectivity. Um, and you know, in this space, I think it's important to underscore that we can absolutely protect the Pacific Flyway and other wetland wildlife in a manner that's consistent with also pr protecting winter run. I think sometimes we see rhetoric about trade-offs, but I think there are um, creative ways that we can work together and implement solutions and safeguard all of the Sacramento Valley's important wildlife. And then finally, um, I continue to think that these conversations about drought underscore the need to update the Bay Delta plan, that we are consistently failing to protect fish and wildlife beneficial uses. And the old system simply doesn't work in a future and in the world we are in with climate change and increasingly frequent and severe droughts. Um, and I think the board needs to stop waiting for voluntary agreements that may never arrive and move forward with the Bay Delta plan update. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Willinger. Appreciate your, your time and, and comments today. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Shelley Cartwright, <clears throat> and then uh, followed by Ellen Weir. Uh, thank you, Chairman Esquivel and Vice Chair Deadamo De and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. My name is Shelley Cartwright, and I'm speaking on behalf of Westlands Water District. Uh, first, I wanted to thank the board for seeking a reasonable balance that helps mitigate the impacts of the severe drought without putting one beneficial use above the others. As you know, Reclamation did not put itself uh, in a position to have issues with Shasta related to temperature control this year. Uh, in fact, with the implementation of the, uh, implementation of the 2019 biological opinions, Reclamation had more water in the reservoir going into this year than they otherwise would have. The allocations to CDP contractors and the CDP operations plan were based on a conservative 90% exceedance forecast. Unfortunately, as you know, we are experiencing the driest year since 1977. Uh, Westlands appreciates the need for all agencies across the state to come together and find the most efficient use for the small amount of water in the system. As such, it's important for the board to focus on utilizing water and enforcing water rights throughout the system rather than you know, micromanaging only one part of the system. The projects only account for a portion of the water diverted in the system. For instance, today DWR calculated the total delta inflow at approximately 9,474 cubic feet per second. And the delta outflow index was approximately 5,700 CFS, meaning that there is about a gap of 30 or 3,774 CFS of inflow that was consumptively or diverted consumptively used or diverted in the Delta. Um, roughly of that 3,800, uh, the projects only accounted for 1,100 CFS. This means that more than 2,670 CFS of water was consumptively used or diverted in the Delta, and some of which is illegal diversions, as you know. As part of its consideration, the board should understand how water is being used uh, and ensure that all available water is used as efficiently and effectively as possible. I've also heard uh, many discuss the litany of catastrophes that are gonna that are certain to befall the species unless certain actions are taken. And there is no doubt that drought is going to impact their species and there is a need to protect those species. Equally clear is the effect water shortages will have on the communities and the livelihoods throughout the San Joaquin Valley. However, unlike the need to the specific needs of the species, we do know exactly what we can do um, and we can quantify the specific needs of those in the valley. In 2015, in the Central Valley, the drought caused an economic impact of nearly $3 billion and resulted in over 20,000 lost jobs. Because of Proposition 218, the cost of drinking water to smaller and disadvantaged communities skyrocketed. 
wells went dry, individuals were standing in line to collect food grown in China. Well, that was until the food ran out. The San Joaquin Valley was hit very hard with COVID and the district appreciates the board's efforts to seek solutions that protect the food, the jobs and the livelihoods of those in the valley. I know Chair Esquivel that you and all the board members understand the disastrous consequences that are being realized now and that will be continued throughout the year. Westlands and many other water dish districts stand ready to support the board in measures that protect the fish while also balancing the needs of other beneficial uses. In implementing measures regarding temperature management within reclamation's reasonable control, it is essential the board does not prioritize one species to the detriment of other species and other beneficial uses. For instance, the delaying delivery of some transfer or purchase water to protect cold water pool may be appropriate. If the board considers such a delay, it should consider the balancing or balancing the delay and the needs of the one listed species with the needs of the community south of the Delta, as well as the needs for other listed species. For some, this transfer water is the only source of water besides groundwater. Further delaying the transfer too could impact or too long could impact fall run Chinook salmon. If water is released too late, there's a risk of stranding reds, uh, fall run reds. Um, ultimately balancing all of these needs is consistent with the direction provided by provided to the state board by the governor and his re recent drought proclamation, as you I'm sure well know. Uh, as Governor Newsom stated in a February 4th guest commentary in Cal Matters, the this time of unprecedented challenges demands unprecedented, par unprecedented partnerships. As such, the district supports and commits to continue the efforts of the state board staff, the California EPA, the California Department of Natural Resources, the California Department of Water Resources, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation and other public water agencies to promote comprehensive collaborative efforts to advance California's water resiliency needs. As we are in the driest year since 1977, tough choices will need to be made. We appreciate the board's willingness to work towards a solution that protects all beneficial uses. Thank you for your consideration and your time today. Thank you, Ms. Cartwright. Really appreciate your good comments uh, today and your contributions here, uh, knowing that oftentimes, regrettably, there, there can be a fish versus farmer sort of false dichotomy, which I've certainly been so tired with in my previous you know, iterations of working in these conditions. And so just appreciate, and I know I may be working off of a little less sleep than I should, <laughs> but appreciate what I heard was actually a commonality between you and Doug BG from NRDC in really wanting to ensure that our water rights system is being protective of this very difficult circumstance we're in and that it is a, a need here to protect project water, to ensure that uh, only those diverting have a right to a uh, diversion in this incredibly dry condition and to make sure that we have a system here that can cogently be administered. I, I thought there was some commonality in your comments there. I won't, I won't directly connect you to too hard there but perhaps um, a sign of maybe some of the, again, common way we can all continue to look at this system and see data and information and good decision-making off of the best available therein within the water rights space, or even again, in these balancing and other regulatory tools we have, um, try to continue to drive towards something in common. So I appreciate the good comments and the constructive um, con contribution today. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, next then we have uh, Ellen Weir. Good afternoon, Ms. Weir. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, um, Ellen. We're on behalf of Grassland Water District. It's been good but sobering to join you all today. I have a brief update uh, from our Central Valley wetlands and a request to keep wildlife refuges in mind as part of your statewide drought management actions. So the good news is that since the last drought, we have implemented recycled water and water recirculation projects to improve our incremental level four water supply for CBPIA refuges. During the last drought, our level four allocation was only 10%, but with these new projects, we're looking at a, and hoping for a 30% allocation this year. And the bad news is that the habitat throughout the Pacific Flyway, as you've heard, is suffering greatly. There's little promise for any water on the key refuges in the Klamath Basin and the acreage of winter flooded rice in the Sacramento Valley will be greatly reduced. Our Central Valley refuges uh, will be the backstop for the wetland dependent species in, this year. And with a critical year allocation of level two water from the Central Valley project, 
refuge managers are conserving every drop in order to meet the baseline habitat needs uh, for migratory waterfowl that will be arriving back here in California in three months. So I cannot emphasize enough the importance for our ecological management of ensuring that the refuges receive their level two water deliveries. In the last drought, the board acknowledged a minimum pumping level from the Delta that is necessary to meet the baseline water requirements and avoid a system-wide crisis. Um, this minimum pumping level is sometimes referred to as health and safety pumping, but it has always expressly included the environmental mitigation needs of refuges south of the Delta. So we know this is an incredibly difficult year, and we ask that the board proactively include baseline wildlife refuge needs in the balance of the many competing needs during this drought. Thank you. Thank you as well, Ms. Weir, and thank you for, I know, the long-standing leadership at Grassland um, on all this uh, work, so thank you, and for flagging uh, the critical need to, to keep that in mind when we talk about base flows or uh, base exports in the Delta, so thank you. Um, next, then, we have uh, Joel uh, Del Bosque. Chairman Esquivel, uh, am I coming through? You are. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here. Thank you and uh, Vice Chair Diodamo and, and the rest of the board for giving me an opportunity to ex express some, uh, some comments regarding the drought. My name is Joe Del Bosque and I'm a farmer from Fireball on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley, where I grew up on a, on a farm labor camp. My parents settled here after many years of migrant work between the Imperial Valley and here. With little more than a pickup truck, with lots of work experience and a dream, I started my own farm in 1985. Today, I farm organic melons, organic watermelons, organic sweet corn, and almonds. Until recently, we had produced organic asparagus. This year's drought has already forced us to make difficult decisions. It eliminated the water supply for our asparagus, which we have already had to pull out and lack of water has also decimated our, our melon acreage. The remaining acreage is now in peril of being lost if we did not get water deliveries in time for our crops needs. At 72 years of age, I suppose I could just fold up and retire, but what do I tell my employees? Some who have been with us for more than 20 years or the next generation, my daughters. Our employees are just like my parents. They came here for work and to create a better life for their families. Many of our employees have children in local schools and colleges. They have invested in homes and in their communities. They have worked incredibly hard to create a future for their families. In prior droughts, we had an employment rates of as high as 40% in towns like Mendota, where many of our team members live. Most of these folks have no safety net like you or I and limited help for the inevitable hardships caused by the lack of water. Many are too proud to ask for a handout. The loss of work can cause anguish, shattered dreams, and even families. They will suffer silently or will uproot their lives, their families, and move away. What many people don't, don't realize is, or simply do not care about, is that every acre we fallow is not simply lost food production. It is thousands of dollars in lost wages to those who are least equipped to lose those wages. It is an attack on the economic and social fabric of entire communities in regions that are no, that there are no other types of jobs. We can fallow land and we will because drought impacts affect every sector of society and we must do our, our part to help others. However, doing so in communities like mine are, have dangerously real consequences to people. What is ironic is that less than a year ago, these same people were facing poten potential for contracting COVID and were considered essential. I do not envy the hard choices that you and your staff have to make to balance all of water needs of the state in a year with such little water. I know it's not easy. But I urge you to consider that the this, this striking the right balance means no single community or single segment of society bears a disproportionate share of harm. Only a year ago, during a pandemic, we were essential. 
we are no less essential today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Debelska, for your comments. And just know that, you know, my actually my grandfather was a was a palmero, um, a bracero actually that came to the Coachella Valley, uh, worked at Laughlin Date Gardens, now Oasis Date Gardens. And my other grandfather was uh, worked at Sea View Ranch in Oasis. Um, and so, you know, I am incredibly aware and, and know how critical it is um, for our communities and, and for our, uh, you know, our, our, our families when it comes to the need for ag and the space that it creates and the opportunities it creates for generations. And so, um, thank you. I know um, these, these decisions are not uh, at all ever taken lightly, certainly, and do know that um, in, in what, when it comes to the way I, I, I view these things at times, um, just know it, it, is, it comes from a very personal space. So just thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, next, I uh, would like to call uh, Ben Gai uh, Gallegos, which I believe, I think he is not currently in the platform with us, nor, nor are the next uh, three commenters um, uh, Freddie Valdez and Sean Brewer. I, I do apologize. I know today, um, you know, today's item is a little later in the day. If you're still viewing on uh, one of the web streams, uh, please um, uh, do try to join us back here on the Zoom platform and we can come back and make sure that we uh, come to your comment. So then next I'll go to Sarah Singleton. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Singleton. I'm the Assistant Manager of San Benito County Water District. Our CVB contract CVP contracts supplies water both to agriculture and to municipal customers. We want the board to be aware of some of the impacts um, to our community of limitations on the delivery of the M&I allocations because there is uh, somewhat of a domino effect downstream. We, uh, several other speakers have talked about domino effects. I wanted to just help you understand the effects in our community. Um, we rely on the delivery of the MNI CVP um, water to blend with our groundwater to be delivered to our urban customers in the Hollister area. Our groundwater has a high natural hardness that if it is used exclusively um, for MNI purposes, it drives our customers to use uh, to the use of water softeners. This in turn degrades the wastewater quality. Um, to the point that the domestic wastewater treatment facilities can't meet their waste discharge requirements. It also makes the recycled water from the treatment plants unusable due to the high salt content from the groundwater and the softeners. It's taken us 15 years to convince homeowners in our community to get rid of water softeners. If we have to begin delivering water to our urban users that has a high percentage of groundwater, they're likely to go back to water softeners. So limits on our M&I water will negatively impact all the work that's been done to get the wastewater facilities in compliance in terms of their waste discharge requirements. And it will significantly impact our recycled water program. So just thank you for consideration about impacts um, to the community such as ours as you weigh these, these critical issues. And like others, I don't envy your position and thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Singleton. Really appreciate the, the good comments and flags and look forward to continued engagement with your community and others um, around just our, our general and response around drought, but also certainly any knock-on effects from decisions that this board makes. So thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call up uh, Lon Martin, who will be followed by Gary Bobker. Good afternoon, board uh, chair and board. Good afternoon. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak before you today. Um, I represent, I'm the general manager for San Luis Water District, and which is a district here on the west side of the valley, starting essentially at the San Luis Reservoir and following uh, the I-5 corridor uh, for about 30 miles. Some of the most productive agricultural land in the valley, and we have some of the most efficient farmers you'll ever see in California. As you all know, our CVP allocation has been reduced to zero. And um, we recognize that the entire state is, is going to be impacted with this drought and the decisions, the very difficult decisions the board and, and other leadership agencies such as DWR 
and the Bureau have to make. We, we completely recognize that. And, and we want to make sure um, that we are participating in the solution. And um, we have about 90 family farmers, uh, including um, Mr. Del Bosque is one of our farmers. We have 89 other folks like him uh, that have started with a dream and, and continue and hope that they can continue to farm in some of the most productive ground in the San Joaquin Valley. For example, uh, what San Luis Water District farmers have done to date is compared to the drought in 2014 and 15, um, our farmers have been def deficit irrigating to the tune of 14%. So um, what our farmers have done is they've invested in agronomic practices, real-time ET and soil monitoring. So they have actually improved their efficiencies. Um, and that's what we've learned from 2014 and 15. Now, what makes that more critical is that precise operations and the is the timing in which they receive water. So because they're, they're operating their farms uh, so precisely that they're, they're irrigating um, literally uh, to the hour uh, so that they get the right amount of water to the crops uh, to maximize the efficiency of their operations. And this leads me to the fact that um, most of the rescheduled water that was in San Luis Reservoir uh, that we saved and brought into this next year, most of the landowners are going to exhaust that supply come August. So they've been um, using their supply, preparing for this this year, using it very efficiently. But this is where the North of Delta transfers uh, are going to be extremely important uh, for the Valley contractors and specifically San Luis Water District. What's unique about San Luis Water District is we don't necessarily have the backstop like other districts do with groundwater. Because we're on the side slope of the coastal uh, range, we're above the groundwater elevations and um, not that there was once groundwater here, it's just the location in which due to our elevation and the soil profile, groundwater doesn't exist. So we're um, solely uh, dependent on, on surface water, including two of our communities, San Luis Hills and uh, the disadvantaged community of Santa Nella. So although we know that there must be a balance and, and we know that these transfers are, are both important for the temperature management plan uh, for the fall run and winter run, and wanna make sure that those transfers can maximize the temperature benefit. But also we're hoping that through uh, the improved modeling through DWR and the USBR and um, better science, that we could start moving some of that water in August. Uh, timing it when uh, our landowners are starting to run out of water from the San Luis Reservoir. Um, we're hoping most of that water can be held in Shasta and, and be moved uh, when it can provide the maximum temperature benefit for, for the salmon run. So the, the delicate balance that we're talking about, uh, most uh, there's going to be several landowners that once they get through this harvest, they're gonna let their trees die. And they can let their trees die for a multitude of reasons, but some of them are gonna let their trees die because they don't have any more water for the rest of the year. So it would be really important if we can start moving that water so at least these landowners can get the final crop. Um, and so that's really important to allow them to get the final crop off their orchards some of the orchards will be let to die because they've aged out and they need to uh, uh, transition their orchards, but some of them will lose their orchards because of the lack of water and we'd sure like to get them the last crop possible. And um, I, I think as Mr. Dabosky explained, we want to do our benefit by being as efficient and creative as possible and uh, devising solutions um, and uh, 
to, to benefit the environment. And we're not all about ag, but we're here to make sure that both the environment can um, receive as much benefit as possible. And if you have any questions, I'm willing to answer those. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin. I do appreciate your, your good uh, thoughts and contributions to today's uh, discussion. And again, the balancing uh, here that we're all collectively uh, called to do, but um, thank you. Uh, much appreciated. Thanks for the time. Thank you as well. Uh, next, we have Gary Bobker, who will be followed by uh, Chris Schutz. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, I'm Gary Bobker. I'm the program director at the Bay Institute. Uh, there's three main points I want to make today. The first is that, you know, it's important to remember the history here. Um, in 2014 and 2015, uh, the board relaxed Delta water quality standards ostensibly uh, because they were assured that that would help uh, reserve water upstream for cold water uh, pool and protect upstream fish and wildlife habitat. In fact, um, the failure to maintain temperature control wasn't just a failure of methodology. Uh, it was also a result of the decision to deliver uh, much of the water that should have been held back to Sacramento Valley contractors. And as a result, uh, you know, we lost two classes of winter run and probably spring run uh, and saw record or near record low levels uh, in Delta resident native species. So um, it's important to remember that as we look at what we're doing here uh, this year. Second point I want to make is, you know, so, so let me draw two maybe a little oversimplified, but you know, three minutes, um, two lessons from 2014 and 2015 that I wanna emphasize. The first is that ecosystem resilience is at an all time low. I think Director Bonham did a good job of describing um, the situation for salmonids that extended to uh, actually fish and aquatic resources throughout the system, especially in the estuary. Um, and that's a result not just of coming out of several years of drought, it's a result of bad management decisions that were made in the, during the drought that I think we all acknowledge. Um, and it's a result of the failure of the board to update the basic protections um, uh, you know, through the Bay Delta plan, because what we're failing to do is to provide the conditions for the populations to rebound and regain their resilience when conditions are good. And all those come together to mean that we're in a pretty bad situation. The second lesson is that, you know, there are limits to what you can do with discretionary approach. I mean, we all, uh, I mean, I, I think that the efforts of agencies and water uh, users to uh, try and, you know, contribute and reach uh, agreements, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't discount that or look down on it, but frankly, um, you know, reducing uh, Sacramento settlement contractors from, you know, 75 to 60 is, you know, that's, that doesn't actually, it, it shows that it's, it's a modest drought for some and an extreme drought for others, and that there are boundaries within discretionary uh, approaches of what agencies think they can do according to their contractual obligations, whether they're right or not, is not the point, that's the way they, they operate. Whereas the board under its public trust authority, its Clean Water Act authority, its water rights permitting authority, et cetera, um, has the ability to look beyond contractual obligations uh, to, uh, to those efforts, to those measures that are necessary to protect beneficial uses. So that leads us to my third point. So what do we do now? Um, and I think that the board really has to exercise its authority uh, and not rely on some of these discretionary approaches. Um, ensure that uh, water that is saved for upstream storage is actually saved uh, at the magnitude that needs to be saved at and, uh, and track and you track the progress. So in other words, the uh, reference earlier to uh, end of September storage targets that um, are, you know, in between 1.5 million and 1.9 million acre feet, um, you know, is something that is necessary to preserve salmon and uh, release targets that are geared to meet whatever that end of September target is. I think that's one thing the board needs to really consider. I think secondly, uh, you've really got to get moving with curtailments and make sure that um, actions to reduce deliveries 
um, reduce exports to um, minimum public health and safety standards, et cetera, which they are now, um, uh, are in effect, uh, if you're gonna consider any waivers to water quality standards in the Delta. Um, and thirdly, um, you need to really get started with, uh, get started with and complete the update of the Bay Delta plan and implement it so that we are not back in this situation every year because the, few, the, the years that we have where we have decent conditions are our chance to rebound these populations. And right now we do not have the regulations in place, the protections in place that allow that to happen. So until that isn't happens, we're gonna be back doing this every year. So I'll end my comments by saying that, um, you know, I appreciate the complexity of this situation and there certainly are a lot of nuances, you know, um, to any choice that you make. And I appreciate the board's, um, you know, interest in encouraging cooperation and collaboration among the parties. But at the end of the day, uh, the board has a statutory responsibility to protect wildlife beneficial, uh, to protect all beneficial uses uh, of water. And in terms of fish and wildlife beneficial uses, while, while all beneficial uses are being impacted, fish and wildlife beneficial uses are actually in danger of being extinguished. And if that happens, you failed. Please don't. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Bobker. Do appreciate that. Um, and no, when it comes to, I think we, we said earlier, you know, all these activities that we're doing are affecting a system. And we're wanting to make ensure that we have the accounting in place so that we understand how it's beating big targets like in care, like carryover targets on the three main reservoirs and really building these collective actions building toward that resilience toward another dry year next year. And, and it is, to your point, really important and discussion already all amongst us about how do we continue to assess that system. And especially as we move into the actual reality of the way the system reacts, understand what, what's happening and how do we continue to try to meet uh, what are these important targets up there in a way that again minimizes um, the, the direct impact to any one sector or space, but in totality, helps us really uh, push this system into the 21st century where we really need it to be and accounting for uh, dry conditions going into the next year. So thank you. Um, next, we have Chris Schutz, who will be uh, followed by Ben uh, Eichenberg. Mr. Schutz, uh, you should be invited to unmute. There we are. I have Good been, thank you. Um, Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. Chris Schutz with the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance. Like Mr. Obiji, I'm feeling like I have an awful lot of things to say and it's hard to choose where to start. Um, unlike Mr. McGuire, I am a veteran of the 2014 and 2015 meetings uh, at the board and, and went through an awful lot. It seems like we're doing many of the same things we did then. Um, I'm just gonna choose some things and, and um, see what I can do with those. Um, first point is reclamation is, has limited its option and yours by over delivering water to settlement contractors in particular in April and May. The releases from Shasta have been far in excess in the last couple of months of what the values that it showed in the May 5th temperature management plan. So, that leaves the board in a difficult position and, it, and in a position where it needs to make decisions quickly. Um, they will be painful. They will be less painful the sooner you make them. Um, and so, so please make them. <laughs> um, reclamation is not going to make the call on who to cut back the board needs to make the call. Uh, it needs to make an immediate interim call to stop the bleeding of Shasta releases. And it needs to make a long-term call very, very soon. And the reason the settlement contractors need to be cut back is not because they're bad people who haven't done good things. It's because they're the ones who are getting much of the little water that's available this year. Um, CSPA and its partner 
organizations have developed a comprehensive temperature management plan for the shafts of Trinity Division. We're completing the write-up of it. We hope to have it to you by the end of the week. Um, it's close to the uh, uh, delivery and, and storage values that um, Mr. Obiji and Ms. Willinger discussed uh, from the NIMS run, um, 6,000 CFS, about 1.5 million acre feet, maybe a little less on the releases. It also looks very carefully at Trinity. I think Trinity is something that's been overlooked considerably in these discussions. Um, it's sort of the, the less important reservoir, but we've heard a lot about how bad things are on the Klamath and in the Trinity this year. And there's a lot of people who are relying on what little we can do with managing Trinity water to make things better um, for another very important um, series of fisheries. Finally, I wanna go back to something that Ms. Firestone said earlier um, about looking at things for the longer term. Um, a lot of what we've heard today has been about how bad it is and, and how bad it's gotten in the last um, several months. But we saw this coming in 2020. Um, there was water in 2020, at least in the Central Valley and its reservoirs to manage. And a lot of water was delivered and the carryover storage required that was left um, has proved to be really insufficient. So I think we really need to rethink and revisit what it's going to take to prepare for this changing climate and hydrology. And we haven't actually done good enough, in my opinion, um, with the previous hydrology. Um, we've left it to the discretion of the projects uh, to determine what they're gonna do. I, I didn't, wasn't aware as Ms. Namath stated that, that they'd increased their target for Oroville, but we're still in a pretty bad situation this year. Um, I've been calling for many years in many venues um, for numeric carryover storage targets. And I think it's really important that it's time to look at those. Um, I also think in the longer term, we need to really carefully look at allocations to various parties in non-critical years and whether those are sustainable. Um, in the first year of a uh, first dry year following a wet year, um, can we continue to deliver as much water as we have, having seen what happens? And the last point I'm gonna make is in general, um, in the operation of the projects and in, in, in water in California, there's been this notion that um, water, uh, the requirements are requirements and, and good water management means to skate on the edge of those requirements. And I think what we're seeing with HABs in particular, but also with many of the other um, uh, aquatics and um, uh, both both bio, both plants and um, and fisheries, is that that type of management and that kind of way of thinking of things is um, is not adequate to the kinds of protections that need to happen in order to um, to keep our ecosystems going. There isn't a clear line that says, if you release this much, you're gonna have HABs. If you're gonna release that much, you're not. And so that type of thinking of, of releasing exactly to the right amount um, needs to change somewhat. And there has to be a way of uh, managing a, uh, a reserve or a um, uh, thinking about it more holistically so that you can't just uh, assume that because you've met the requirement, everything's going to be okay. Um, thanks very much, and um, we'll try to have you something by the end of the week. Thank you, Mr. Schutz. I really appreciate uh, you tracking these issues and your contributions. Thank you. Uh, next is Ben Eichenberg.
You should be invited to unmute here momentarily. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, yeah. Or maybe good evening at this point, Chaskaval and, and board members. Um, my name is Ben Sun's going down. <laughs> I'm, oh, wow. uh, I'm speaking on behalf of San Francisco Baykeeper, our more than 5,000 members and supporters. Um, Chaskaval, you've mentioned striking an incredibly difficult balance, but uh, I feel that it should be pointed out that balance was already struck when we established water quality standards um, within D1641, the related decisions and temperature management decisions when all those were made, um, balancing was a, a central um, consideration. So to rebalance now, especially in the middle of a crisis means picking winners and losers. Um, and the losers here are overwhelmingly the environment and the communities in the Delta. Even worse is the use of the crisis to abrogate legitimizing public regulatory processes and disenfranchise those hardest hit. The tone that's being struck, nobody could have seen this coming, just falls flat better to confront reality. We did not prepare adequately. So at least let's follow the first rule of holes. When you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Following the theme of confronting reality, we have to acknowledge the current management by the Bureau of Reclamation is designed, is designed to kill salmon. Dam releases at Keswick peaked at about 9,400 CFS on May 11th, remained above 9,000 CFS as of two days ago. Releases have been ramping up since April 20th. Instead of conserving water in a time of scarcity, the Bureau is releasing more. There's releasing as much as they can get away with. Modeling done as of April 27th didn't show releases that high until June or July, if at all. Has the Bureau modeled this operational scenario or are they just a rogue agency? Another example of the Bureau going rogue is the fact that it has been releasing high temperature water in a misguided attempt to conserve cold water storage. As a result, they may well succeed in wiping out winter run salmon. Adult fish pre-spawn mortality is spiking due to the high temperatures. Temperatures at Clear Creek were above 57 degrees, which can be deadly for adult fish, according to EPA guidance, 24 hours a day from April 30th all the way to May 15th. It's only slowly dropping back down and only at night. At Bend Bridge, that started on April 28th and remains above 57 degrees now. At Keswick, it started on April 30th and didn't drop until May 12th. The Bureau is a perpetual bad actor, so we can no longer act surprised when they once again make mistakes that result in the need for drastic actions like TUCPs. Just a couple more points to make. Um, you know, all of this is taking us back to the same mistakes the board made during the last drought through the TCPs and, and salinity barriers. We can, we can trace any problems that came from that and we, can, we know that they're gonna come from the TUCPs and salinity barriers now. It's unfair and unconscionable the state board is asking Delta communities and the environment to take this hit when 5% of the state water project allocation is going to DWR and senior water rights holders are getting millions of acre feet more than their water rights should give them in these circumstances. Failing to cut deliveries to water users such as MET with record storage while allowing potential fisheries and HAB impacts is not an appropriate use of water. Temperature predictions for the American River are 74 to 75 degrees. That's lethal for overwintering steelhead. Um, and as, as other speakers have said, we'll need at least 1.5 million acre feet of storage at Shasta to protect some salmon at least, uh, preferably more storage than that. But we, we need to be careful not to end up doing more harm than good. Is that, that, that theme has been hit a couple times, but the truth is there's no participation trophy here. If the state board doesn't do enough, it won't be enough and we'll lose both fish and communities. Everything you need to know, you know right now. You don't need more time. I understand that you wanna meet all needs, but unless you actually meet the needs of the fish, they will die. And unless you meet the freshwater flow criteria, we'll have massive harmful algal blooms. We have the data to, to know those as, as scientific certainties. And we wouldn't be in this situation if we had prepared for drought. Executive Director Sobek just wrote a memo to the Bureau of Reclamation saying they appeared to be preparing to violate standards in large part because they failed to prepare for drought. And if the board had adopted phase two water quality control plan standards or to otherwise constrained the Bureau's withdrawals, we wouldn't be in such a hard situation now either. In closing, um, I hope we can we can learn some of these lessons and um, 
you know, as Mr. Bobker pointed out, uh, utilize the trust um, uh, entrusted to the State Water Board by the California Constitution. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Eichenberg. I appreciate your comments today. Uh, next, we have Lewis Baer, who will be followed by David Guy. Hello, Chairman Escobar. I uh, seem to be unable to turn on my camera. Oh, it's okay. No, no, we're in the least. We can hear you well. Okay. Oh, yeah, oh there you God. are now. Good to Great. see you. All right. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Chairman Escobar and members of the board for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I wanted to speak on behalf of the Sac River Settlement Contractors, and uh, I wanted to just share with you some of the things that we have done. And sorry. Um, starting last fall, um, this drought did not start for us this spring, or we didn't get surprised. Last fall, we knew storage was low, and we agreed to um, delay the diversions for flood up um, for Pacific Flyway and rice straw decomposition so that the Bureau could reach minimum releases, um, which has resulted in a, a beneficial carryover storage over what would have happened otherwise. In the spring, uh, we, uh, we realized that we were going to be cut by 25%, and we followed land um, to make that happen. We also saw that the system was strained and we agreed to reduce diversions by an additional 10% and we followed land to make that happen. We also followed land to provide transfers so that junior water right holders with permanent crops um, would have water to, to, to make it work through this year without deep cuts and, and, and pain. Finally, when we saw that there was an additional uh, change in the hydrology in the spring, we agreed to do the only thing that we had left to do, and that was to turn on our final groundwater wells. Um, we don't have a lot of groundwater, much like the rest of the state. We're, we're very different. We've had senior water rights, and we, we just simply don't have wells. All of our wells are on to keep our crops alive at this point. Any additional cuts will mean drying up of crops and uh, drying up of the wetlands in the Sacramento Valley in the home of the Pacific Flyway. So I, I'm a little more optimistic than maybe some of the, the speakers before me. I do think that there is a way um, for us all to proceed forward um, without dramatic uh, reactions. Um, this is possible um, because of the, uh, the cooperation, the sacrifices that water users have taken on, the risks um, that we have compiled a series of actions that are all interdependent. Um, and with that, I believe we'll be able to put together an operation scenario that although will be difficult for everybody, including fisheries, including species in the Sacramento Valley, um, including our disadvantaged communities, um, we will be able to work our way through this year. However, there is kind of a breaking point to all of those things and pushing beyond that will change the pain factor for what I see as a small incremental improvement um, in some of those areas. I ask that you please keep in mind the temperature dependent mortality modeling results um, and keep those in perspective. It's unfortunate, but we don't have the information necessary to create models that accurately forecast temperature dependent mortality with the precision that some of the modeling results would suggest. I think Barry Tom was referring to this and suggesting that we look at incremental improvements versus absolute numbers. <sighs> Sorry. Um, the fact is the data that we calibrate these models to would be lucky to be within 10%. The monitoring isn't possible. Um, and then we have unknowns like last year's uh, thiamine or suspected thiamine deficiency that produced data points that we're calibrating to that add to the uncertainty. But I do believe these models are very useful. I think we can use them as guides and we should. I personally am very invested in salmon recovery, like I know so many of us on this phone are. I'm a water district manager and an agricultural engineer, but I spend every day working on salmon recovery in the Sacramento Valley and building partnerships, partnerships around that. The potential for salmon recovery in the Sacramento Valley is squarely dependent on implementation of the fishery agent salmon recovery plan. 
and not small tweaks to survival in one life stage or one salmon run on one river in an extremely hostile year. Success of the recovery plans require partnerships like the one we have worked so hard on in the Sacramento Valley over the last decade. A decision by the state board or its staff that doesn't reflect an understanding of the realistic benefits and the significant trade-offs is exactly how you will unwind these partnerships necessary for revolutionary change, frankly. You risk driving us all back to our binaries and courtrooms and derailing these salmon recovery efforts and forcing the fish to suffer another decade or more, missing the real opportunity to change the future of salmon. I ask you to make sure that you understand that those implications are real. I also urge you to follow up with water rights. There are folks that, uh, you know, I've heard folks talk about Sac River Settlement Contractor water rights. Well, we don't just have water rights. We paid for Shasta. We also have storage water rights. And that's what we're relying on in years today. And that's why we paid for the reservoir for the last 50 years. So we urge that you work on curtailments for those that don't have those rights. And there are many. With that, I'd like to, uh, to share with you that, uh, you know, many of these comments today are, are fairly generic, but we have been working on detailed approaches for this year that, uh, that I referred to earlier that I think kind of thread the needle um, to minimize pain across the board. Um, we will share those with you in a letter tomorrow in written form so that you have those for reference. So with that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bear. much appreciated. Uh, next, we'll go to Mr. David Guy. Uh, and Thad Bettner, I believe, is now on the platform with us. So uh, we'll go ahead and have Thad go uh, after Mr. David Guy. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Esquivel, uh, members of the board. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to share some ideas today. Um, I'm David Guy with the Northern California Water Association. Great to be with you here today. Um, I think the theme today that we're all looking for is how do we find balance? We're all searching for balance in a uh, challenging year like uh, this. And let me just uh, first kind of give you a view from the ground in the Sacramento Valley on, on what is happening. Um, the cities and the rural communities, as you know, are all uh, conserving water. Many of them have switched to uh, groundwater pumping. Uh, they're sharing water across communities. And of course, they're asking citizens to uh, conserve water in every way they know how. Uh, the farms in the Sacramento Valley uh, have anywhere from about zero to probably 50 to 55% of their water supplies, uh, depending on which part of the valley you're in. Uh, but uh, all the communities are suffering. Uh, some have switched to groundwater pumping. Uh, they're recycling water, they're sharing water, they're transferring water. And there's hundreds of thousands of acres of idle ground uh, that uh, we will see this year. Uh, fish and wildlife are obviously being challenged this year, um, but I think there's a concerted effort uh, in the Sacramento Valley uh, to uh, focus on salmon. That includes the winter run that you're hearing so much about. Uh, it includes uh, efforts on spring run for uh, Butte Creek, Mill and Deer Creek that I think are uh, really uh, making some good progress. And of course, uh, we're all very excited for the uh, Pacific Flyway actions this fall in a very challenging year. And I really appreciated the governor's proclamation uh, kind of giving a shout out for uh, that. Uh, Todd Manley, I believe, will share some more thoughts on some of the fish and wildlife efforts. I also just uh, would note that I know there's been a lot of direction uh, today about the Sacramento River settlement contractors. And boy, I mean, for anybody that knows the Sacramento River settlement contractors, and you just heard from Lewis, um, and you'll hear from Thad as well, but boy, they've been the leaders in my view in the flyway. They deliver water to the refuges. They delivered water to the rice lands that uh, are obviously the food source for the Pacific Flyway. And they've really been the leaders in salmon recovery actions uh, across the life cycle of the salmon. And so uh, I think for folks who are interested in the Sacramento, Sacramento River settlement contractors, please come up and visit. I think uh, come out on the ground, let's walk the, the ditches, let's uh, look at what's uh, really going out on the ground and let's not look at it from afar. I think it's important to get out on the ground and see what they're actually doing before uh, uh, suggesting that they do something uh, different. Uh, bottom line is the managers are all searching for balance in these kinds of years, uh, managing water for multiple benefits, much like the state water board. Uh, we're looking for the same thing. Uh, we're not trying to point the finger at anybody saying there should be winners or losers. 
we're trying to serve water for all of these purposes in a very uh, challenging year. And that's what I think the, we have to roll up our sleeves and do. I would just uh, offer in general that uh, I think the governor's proclamation last week and the previous one as well uh, provided a really nice roadmap in our view for some of the voluntary measures that we think can uh, really help us get through this year. And I think there is a important role for the state water board, obviously. Um, several of you have used the word backstop, last resort. I think there is a very important regulatory integrated program that you've mentioned, and we uh, hope that you will utilize this, but we hope is what you'll really do with that is to inspire water managers to be better, to be more creative, to think outside the box. And I think there's a lot of things in the proclamation that talk about that. The drinking water provisions, obviously, in paragraph 10, the water transfer provisions in paragraph three talk about not only utilizing that water for uh, cold water pool management, but also then helping uh, with uh, important needs throughout the state. Uh, the flexible operations in the Delta that you're going to be uh, working with uh, DWR and the Bureau on. And then, of course, the Pacific Flyway provisions as well. And then on the Sacramento River temperature issue, I think uh, the paragraph 14 in the initial uh, proclamation, I think, said it well, that let's work together to solve the problem. Let's preserve fish the best we can, but let's also balance water supply needs. And I think that's what the folks are really uh, working towards. Um, and there's, we're, I think we're going to find that sweet spot but it's gonna take some, uh, some hard work. Uh, we also think the water rights process is very important and uh, looking forward to your workshop on Friday. Appreciate the progress that's being made there. But I think it's important to also note that in 2015, you had already issued a curtailment notice by May 1 of 2015, just a, a note. And uh, we uh, obviously encourage you to think about that as you head into this workshop. And we hope there'll be some follow-up uh, right after that. I think the sanctity of the water rights process is critical in years like uh, this. And then obviously careful management of storage going forward, something I know that everybody's focused upon. And I think let's maximize the use of our storage this year. I think for all of these multiple benefits, um, and then obviously we need to be thinking about next year, but California has an amazing way of recharging its storage reservoirs over time if we uh, give it an opportunity to do it. I would just close that I think the uh, governor's uh, plan for 5.1 billion is really a great catalyst for some of the thinking that we're hearing today and we'll be hearing in the future. We're very excited by that. We're working on ridge top to river mouth water management, as you all know, and that includes things like floodplains, headwaters, health and forest management, sustainable groundwater management, and things like sites reservoir that we think would sure be nice to have in a year uh, like uh, 2021. So we really uh, thank you for kind of encouraging this conversation. Hopefully you'll inspire us all to be better at what we're doing. I think there's a lot of good creative thinking going on around the state right now and we look forward to uh, being part of that so thank you for your your thoughtful discourse today yeah likewise thank you mr guy i appreciate the comments and the commonality in focusing in on the water rights system and the real need to have a robust water rights system that actually helps us adapt to climate change and i think uh, there also a discussion obviously of resourcing that water rights system and hopefully uh, a common ally for that as well also appreciate the uh, flag on parts of the eo very familiar language. And so I um, think we did a, a good job uh, in totality amongst us and making sure that we both had the authorities here, but also set the right message around how we're going to be engaging. And so thanks for that flag. It's appreciated. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Thad Bettner. Mr. Bettner, thank you for, uh, for joining us here. Apologies. I know it's we've gone long here and, and uh, just appreciate you uh, joining us. No, and I thank you, Chair Esquivel and board members. I apologize for stepping away for a few minutes. I had to host a uh, technical meeting talking about temperature. So again, apologies, and I don't. I know it is getting late, so I'll keep my comments brief. Um, I just did want to first just start out and just continue to echo our commitments to what we talked about um, in the temperature workshop um, last month. Um, you know, we've continued to take actions to um, reduce diversions. Um, as Lewis Bear reported, we've started up an emergency groundwater program to try and add additional local supplies um, in coordination with reclamation to um, further decrease diversions. Um, you know, we are doing everything we can to try um, and assist in, in uh, temperature management and, and benefiting the species. So again, we just reiterate our commitment to doing that. Um, um, and as a matter of fact, last Friday, we had an emergency board meeting uh, just to get that CEQA process going for on, on our groundwater program. So 
Um, again, taking all the steps that we can. Um, we continue to stay uh, committed to providing you better and new information. So, you know, working with your staff on improved modeling and new scenarios, again, for temperature management, um, we, we remain committed to that. And Lewis report, reported we'll be uh, providing a letter tomorrow that would summarize more of that information, which we shared to the technical meeting that we just had. Um, I think just for, for us, you know, sharing with you, I guess, you know, again, we would ask, and you've heard this already, is that, you know, you'd please um, implement the water right priority system as it was reported that, you know, there's over a thousand CFS of excess diversion happening. Um, that's coming out of storage. And, you know, certainly somebody just spoke about increases out of Shasta and, and that wasn't us. I mean, we've been staying on our schedule or below our schedule, but certainly those just other water users diverting water that reclamation had to make up, make up out of storage. And unfortunately, you know, that's impacting storage and, and temperature. So, you know, just implore you to expedite the water right process, you know, and look forward to the workshop on Friday. Um, you know, just ask and implore you that again, as we provide more technical information to your staff that they'd be sharing that with you. Um, so you can remain as current as possible because, you know, things um, continue to change. And again, I, I think we remain optimistic. We know that you have tough decisions to make, but anyway, we can be helpful to providing you information, assistance, questions, you know, please let us know. Again, we want to be solution oriented here. Um, you know, I know you mentioned the win-win thing and it is a tough year to have something like that, but again, the more we can bring, you know, all the information, we, we hope it would in, inform those decisions. So again, thank you for your time and the long day you've had. Oh, thank you as well. I really appreciate the continued engagement, of course, and look forward to uh, what are going to be just a lot more discussions this uh, summer and into uh, the time ahead. So thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call Todd Manley, who will be followed by uh, Lee Bergfeld. Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon <laughs> or evening, whatever it is now. Uh, Chair Esquivel, you guys have had a long day today. Uh, and thanks to you and the members of the board. Uh, I am Todd Manley, I'm with the Northern California Water Association. And as uh, David mentioned, uh, I would like to take uh, the opportunity uh, to discuss the range of voluntary water management activities being implemented in the Sacramento Valley to benefit fish and wildlife during this dry year. It's important to note, uh, as we heard earlier, that all surface water supplies in the Sacramento Valley have been significantly reduced this year. And uh, during a dry year, it is easy to develop a singular focus on impacts to a specific water use or even a single species. But water managers in the region are managing the resource for multiple benefits and must look for opportunities as well as trade-offs that result from water management decisions. In addition to working hard to serve water to cities, rural communities, and farms, the water resources managers throughout the Sacramento Valley are creatively managing and making limited water supplies available to help ensure water for fish and wildlife. For salmon, the water managers in coordination with the state and federal agencies and conservation partners are implementing actions this year to benefit all four runs of Chinook salmon, including managing water in the reservoirs to preserve cold water pool, deploying release schedules to benefit incubating salmon and also providing for additional beneficial purposes downstream and continuing work with our partners to implement the Sacramento Valley Salmon Recovery Program, which includes efforts in all reaches of the rivers and includes improving spawning and rearing habitat on the upper reaches, enhancing migratory corridors in the middle reaches and floodplain reactivation in the lower reaches of the river. On Butte Creek, where more than two decades ago, a comprehensive program was implemented to promote salmon recovery, we are seeing a remarkable return of spring run Chinook this year. Um, we are working with Ducks Unlimited and California Trout to seek improvements to Weir One and additional project to further enhance fish passage on the creek this year. For birds in the Pacific Flyway, some of this has been discussed. Um, water districts will continue to deliver surface water to the national wildlife refuges and the state wildlife areas this year. Um, and although the rice acreage planted this year is down 150,000 acres as a result of the curtailments and actions to help manage cold water, we are working to maximize habitat on the remaining rice ground. And water suppliers and landowners are preparing to pump groundwater if we do not see fall precipitation. We are encouraged that this initiative to pump groundwater was prioritized in the recent governor's emergency proclamation. So in, to wrap up, um, this is going to be a difficult year. Um, it is our hope that these proactive and collaborative efforts will help to maximize benefits for fish and wildlife, as well as farms and local communities. So thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Manley. Appreciate uh, the comments and contribution today. Thank you. Uh, Lex, I believe Lee Bergfeld is not uh, on the platform with us. So I think next is uh, Lenore Kitts. And Lenore is on both uh, via phone and computer, and we've invited Lenore to unmute in either of those platforms. And so far, no takes. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kitz. If um, we, we can come back to you if you're able to um, unmute, and uh, thank you. So next, then we'll go to Barbara Berrigan Perea. Hi. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, there's a yes. little bit of an echo. Hi. Let me uh, get rid of the echo. Hi. I'm sorry. I was uh, I'm multitasking. I'm on another call at the same time. So thank you for taking um, my call. I've been actually waiting most of the day. And I'm a family farmer and wanted to kind of give a more personal perspective about what the cutbacks are doing and what we see. So I, I prepared some remarks. I'll just read them. Thank you, Ms. Kitts. And so, I'm just uh, sorry, uh, uh, Ms. Barbara uh, uh, Berry and Priya, we'll, we'll come back to you. Thank you, Ms. Kitts was uh, there oh, and she just okay. unmuted. I'll so hang on, hang on. No, no, it's okay. Thank you can continue on. Thank you, Ms. Kitts. Oh, you, would you like me to continue? Yes, okay. yes, please. Sorry. All right, all right. So here they are. So, uh, so you know my name, Lenore Kitts. So I'm calling in to talk to you. This is the first time I've ever called. Uh, just in an effort to broaden the discussion about how the cutbacks are impacting, impacting small family farms and also the natural ecosystem in Sacramento Valley. So in this, I first wanna echo Lorraine Marsh's remarks this morning about the importance of looking for collaborative solutions that help all parties to survive this entire drought cycle. So my family grows rice. We've been doing so on the same tract of land north of Sacramento for about a century. Many of my neighbors have been farming for an even longer period of time, stretching back to the 19th century. So our long historical relationships with the sand and the water give us a unique perspective on big weather events, such as the really serious drought that we're all in now. Our relationship with the land is more than just economic. Although we have to strive to keep our livelihoods viable in order to maintain farming operations from one year to the next, we also balance the commercial pressures with our long-term goal to maintain the land and water on which we depend. So as custodians of these resources, we are, we are actually very vigilant about the type of practices we adopt. We try to observe what works well and what does not from one year to the next. And like other farmers, rice growers constantly seek to innovate and become more efficient with our use of water in particular, as witnessed by a variety of efforts being developed now by the rice industry to help protect the salmon runs. So uh, my family has followed about 70% of our production this season due to the water shortage. We've been warned that additional cutbacks will threaten the crop in the only field we've been able to plant thus far, but that we will plant. Thus, we uh, would like to urge the members of the board to keep in mind how more cutbacks could harm not only rice production across the Sacramento Valley, but also the natural ecosystem that our fields sustain. So my family's farm is home to more than 100 different species, bird species and other wildlife, including several endangered and threat, threatened species, such as the sandhill crane, um, tricolored blackbird, and both golden and bald eagles. Meanwhile, the giant garter snakes come out of their winter dens each year to live on the levees in our rice fields during the summer growing season. A variety of shorebirds, shorebirds also nest to raise their young in rice. A biologist from the Natural Resources Conservation Service has informed us that a diminishing water supply sets the stage for the spread of diseases that decimate bird populations, as others have already commented today. When large tracts of rice fields are fallowed, as they are now, water suffers since it lacks nutrition on which it relies. In turn, as the nesting habitat shrinks, diseases like avian cholera can erupt and spread. Adult populations shrink in size, and young birds weaken, and the chain reaction can impact other species as well, like the uh, birds of prey, eagles, and so on, that hunt waterfall on our land. 
Each winter, thousands of waterfowl arrive on our farm to feed in our fields after they are harvested in the fall. I've been told that 70% of all snow geese in the Pacific Flyway head directly to the rice fields of the Sacramento Valley, from Alaska, Canada, and even as far away as Russia. The sights and sounds of this mass winter migration never cease to amaze us. For all these reasons, we, we want to implore the members of your board to take measures that allow family farms to survive this difficult season and the next season. Helping family farms benefits the agricultural workforce, that's clear. The domestic food supply and security, that's very clear. But also the natural ecosystem, we are not enemies. It would support the state of California's mandate to protect a number of endangered and threatened species like those we have on our farms. I'd like to close by emphasizing that family farms like ours really do consider ourselves as custodians of the land that we care for. Because my grandfather and father shared this belief, it is now my turn to watch over our land and water on behalf of my elderly mother and siblings. In your vote, I thus urge you to factor in our concerns and to consider how your decisions will impact the health of family farms in the Sacramento Valley in the long run. Thank you for taking my comments. Thank you so much for your time uh, today, Ms. Kitts, and for sticking with us here and providing us uh, your, your good comment. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, we can go to Barbara uh, Berrigan Perea, uh, who will be followed by Barry Nelson. All right, can you hear me? We can, good afternoon or evening, I guess. Yes, good evening. Um, thank you for your attention and for your long day. You heard from our community this morning extensively. I can't stress it enough when you are thinking about how you balance things in the state. The Delta has not recovered from the last drought. Conditions for our environmental justice communities have worsened every year since that last drought. And nothing changes, never, not for us. In our 2016 testimony <clears throat> to, the, to this board for uh, California Water Fix, we said that significant reductions in runoff due to dry soil conditions in the Sierra and increased evaporation were conditions that were just around the corner. We are kind of flabbergasted with what we heard this afternoon. If our scrappy little group could figure that this was coming, we don't understand why the Department of Water Resources and the Bureau of Reclamation didn't plan for a potential quick lo loss of snowpack. We don't understand why they didn't begin escalating or scaling up programs for enhanced protection of our watersheds back in 2017. What I feel like I'm hearing today is a rehash of what we have known for years, recast as surprise. Uh, the, you know, in addition, the Delta cannot be the source for fixing groundwater shortages in the San Joaquin Valley as it was during the last drought. Surface water cannot fix decades of overplanting and over pumping of groundwater for crops that cannot be sustained, permanent crops. We understand that DWR and the Bureau of Rec almost lost control of salinity at the pumps a couple weeks ago. It would have ruined water quality for exports. That's why we ended up with the new Malonis releases. Similar mistakes were made in 2014 and the Delta water quality protection uh, issues never rise to the same level of importance as making sure that the system isn't lost for exports. That's just like 2014 and 2015. We're the ones who are gonna be left with the stagnant polluted water and salt barriers while exports continue. Worse, the governor's drought package, everyone's talking about all its great features. It did not provide for any enhanced funding for water quality testing, warning signs to put up so that we can protect people from staying away from polluted waters or HABS tracking in a bigger and more significant way. The programs that Director Nemeth re, uh, referred to today within your own agencies are really underfunded. They need to be scaled up because this isn't just a temporary drought. We are moving into an era of permanent dry conditions. Last, I wanna say that protecting the Delta is not about self-interest only. Protecting the largest estuary on the West Coast of the Americas 
is not only a state interest, it's a national interest. Caring about environmental justice communities means more than talk. It means taking actions that make environmental health a priority, offering equal treatment in the present, and compensating for the environmental damage of the past. We have not seen any of that yet. So we just want to urge this board that it, it's not just balancing, there is a past that has to be corrected for. And we want to know when our water quality conditions are truly going to matter. Thank you for the chance to comment. I know it's been a long day. We appreciate it. Thank you as well. I appreciate the good comments and contribution here. Uh, as always, thank you. Uh, next, we have Barry Nelson, who will be followed by Molly Colton, because I believe Lorraine Marsh is not on the platform with us. Hello, Chair Esco, Barry Nelson. Can you hear me? I can't. Oh, there's my video starting. Yes, we can. Good, uh, good evening. Good to see you, Mr. Nelson. <laughs> thank you, uh, Chair Esco and board members. Barry Nelson with Golden State Salmon Association. I'm just going to speak today about Shasta temperature control if I had more time. And if it were earlier in the day, I'd talk about the Bay Delta update plan process, but here we are. Um, uh, the conversation we're having here today is painfully familiar. Um, Chuck Bonham pointed out, reminded you of uh, the massive fish kill below Shasta Dam in 2014 and 2015. Um, at the Golden State Salmon Association, we saw that fish kill coming. We knew that the optimistic models from the Bureau were inaccurate. We knew um, that voluntary efforts had failed to prevent it. The explanation at the time was that the event was unprecedented. State agencies said that they learned from this painful experience. It was widely seen as perhaps the greatest single regulatory failure during the last drought. But here we are today facing exactly the same problem. We have seen this before. We know the solution. Uh, the solution is monthly release caps from Shasta Dam. The modeling to date suggests that uh, 6,000 CFS is probably the, the, the appropriate cap. Um, there may be new modeling um, that we haven't seen yet. Uh, and that a carrier storage requirement of somewhere around 1.47 million acre feet, as Doug Obiji mentioned earlier today, uh, is probably a reasonable target. Um, I would remind folks that we formerly had a carrier storage target under the federal biological opinions before they were eliminated. It was far higher than uh, the number suggested today, uh, the number that I just mentioned. Um, that, to be clear, that level will result in a bad year for winter run salmon and a bad year for fall run salmon and a bad uh, year for our industry in the future, but it would not represent complete destruction. Um, uh, that carryover storage level will also give us a modest reserve in case next year is dry and we have to think about that as well. We urge you to act as soon as possible. We urge you to act this week. Um, every day of irresponsibly high releases, the risk to the uh, species, to the listed run, to the fall run, the most important uh, uh, river in the state for the salmon fishing industry, those risks grow. The impacts to our industry are already severe. Before this potential fish kill happens, um, um, GSSA is hearing on a weekly, on a daily basis of fishermen who are trying to decide if they have to sell their boats. Fishermen who are afraid of bankruptcy. Fishermen who are worried about the impacts of a bad salmon season following a bad crab, se crab season. Um, fishermen who are feel that they are forced to fish when they're allowed to fish by the season we see this year in more and more risky conditions where they're literally risking their lives. Fishermen who are wondering if the state board will act to protect their entire industry uh, to protect a foreseeable environmental and economic disaster. Um, this would require a modest reduction in releases and deliveries. We know that's painful. Um, we also know that that growers have alternatives to make it through droughts. Fishermen do not, fishermen and fishing industries may not make it through the conditions we face if the state board doesn't act. Uh, the, the alternative path to taking action is a massive fish kill of a state and federally listed species and a near complete loss 
of fall run naturally spawning salmon in the Sacramento River, the most important river in the state. Would remind folks that um, fishermen have seen their season cut by more than 60% to ensure that enough salmon return to spawn. Fishermen are, are, are feeling a lot of pain uh, because of conditions we're facing today. No one has suggested a 60% reduction in irrigated acreage in the Central Valley. That's unthinkable, but that's what the fishing community is feeling this year. And unless the State Board acts, um, they could face more dire conditions in the future. We're simply urging the State Board to ensure that all parties share the responsibility to ensure that we maintain and do not kill off salmon runs in our salmon fishing industry. I'd like to close by just speaking briefly about the call by many to solve these problems through collaborations and agreements. I strongly support that approach. So does the Golden State Salmon Association. I've been part of approaches along those lines for 30 years. Um, they have great value and we appreciate the water districts and the users that have come to the table productively as part of those voluntary efforts. But those voluntary efforts do not always substitute for regulatory action. We remind the board that no one asked the fishing industry if we would volunteer for nearly all of the next generation of naturally spawned salmon in the Sacramento River to be killed. No one asked Barbara Berrigan Perea if the Delta would volunteer to suffer from the harmful algal blooms they're likely to see this summer. We urge the State Board not, in this case, not to wait for a voluntary negotiated solution to emerge. We do not believe that an adequate solution will emerge through those discussions. The board has run out of time to wait. We urge you to act as the regulatory agency that you are. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Appreciate your time and comments today. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Molly Colton. I think our last speaker here will be Justin Fredrickson. Hello, Chair and members of the board. My name is Molly Colton and I'm speaking on behalf of Sierra Club California. I'll keep my comment short, it's been a long day. I'm here to urge you all and the administration to prioritize the needs of communities and ecosystems in the Delta during this increasingly severe drought that California is facing. The governor's drought declaration has severe implications for the Delta. One of those implications is the waiving of water code section 13247. This allows for violations of Delta water quality standards and temporary urgency change petitions or TUCPs. Unfortunately, the approval of those TUCPs will detriment Delta communities and the ecosystems that rely on freshwater flows through the Delta. Please consider these impacts on vulnerable communities and do everything you can to mitigate them. Thank you for your time today. Thank you as well, Ms. Colton. And next then we have Justin Fredrickson. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Okay. We can. Uh, good afternoon, good uh, Chairman Escobel and uh, members of the board. Appreciate. I'm Justin Fredrickson. I'm here for the uh, California Farm Bureau. And I wanted to make sort of a general statement, kind of sort of big picture, and then I'll um, zoom in on in response to some of the comments made earlier in the day. And I'm going to, this is a prepared statement, so I hope it's not too boring. Um, the general statement I wanted to make is, uh, that a year like this should be an urgent wake-up call. Our system is too tight. Our system is too fragile. Our system is too vulnerable. Speaking to the new normal alluded to by board member Firestone after the lesson of 2014 and 15 and the lesson of this year, we as a state are now too vulnerable to the threats of recurring drought and shrinking snowpack. In a year like this, let's be honest, nobody is wasting water. It's tight all over and we're all just trying to get through. We're all in this together. There's a very clear, uh, very clearly an urgent need in the interest of all water users and all Californians to come together and begin as quickly as possible to build a resilient system. There is no water category that does not benefit from such resilience. Central to building such resilience is an ability to capture and store water in wet years to tide us through and dry. We need more pots of water north more pots of water south, more pots of water underground, and also more flexibility connectively and collectively uh, north to south and east to west. We need to find the will to re-envision, reinvent, and adapt our system. California and California farmers beyond a doubt, doubt are adaptable, resor resourceful, and tough, but we need policies and institutions, processes and strategic societal investments to help make this transition. 
this generation of leaders will set the, the direction irrevocably for where we go from here as a state. It's time for leadership and vision now or never. There's no time to waste. That's the general statement. Um, now, switching uh, topics in response to some of the um, calls earlier in the day to uh, cut um, regulatorily cut uh, reduced deliveries to uh, some of the most senior of uh, senior water users in the system. I just I wanted to offer a few more thoughts. Um, as you know, in terms of water surface, many uh, farmers around the state are at zero or will soon be at zero, making hard decisions and faced with a very frightening year. The reality is that the water delivered that uh, to users like the Sacramento River Settlement Contractors and San the San Joaquin River Exchange Contractors is a lifeline, not only to these most senior of users, but also to the rest of the system through the built-in flexibility of water transfers. This is not misplaced water, it's vital water to make a year like this just barely survivable. The operators of these systems and the resource agencies know this system and are working closely together like the rest of us just doing their best to get through. The TUCP already teed up before the board is the established mechanism to conduct some of the delicate balancing that you mentioned, Chair, uh, Chairman Esquivel. And that's not a binary cho choice, it's a complex and nuanced one and there's no magic wand. It's also a public process. It's a tough year and there are no villains here. We're all doing our best very clear uh, and very, very clearly collaboration, not punitive measures provide the best way to get through a crisis like this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fredrickson. I appreciate your, your comments here and uh, bringing us home a bit on uh, the public comment uh, portion of things. So thank you. Okay, so I, think, I think that brings us to the end of comments then for the item. I know that was a lot. Um, I know there it still leaves um, uh, things uh, still undecided. You heard, I think we have a really just a, I think less than a two week window here really to land these various parts. It's really, again, not any one component, the TUCPs or uh, curtailments or where we um, leave targets for our major reservoirs, but how it all fits together and how we're able to communicate how it all is additive. These actions are building toward both uh, better circumstance for this uh, difficult summer, but dif uh, but certainly also in preparation, as you've heard, of a, a dry year next, next year, which um, would be catastrophic for many of these systems. So we have to begin to already uh, be looking at our challenge in that frame. Fellow board colleagues, I don't have too much more to add at this point of the day. Um, you know, I, I do appreciate that um, we're, we're having to make a determination here on Sacramento River temperature management um, that will have to be done here probably before, uh, definitely before we meet again on June 1st. And uh, because as we've said here, um, it's not just the relaxation of environmental standards, the TUCPs and, and, and the need for an accounting of where that water goes in the system and accruing to these, these goals and targets that we're setting. Um, but how in totality, all these things landing at the same time, because we don't have, unfortunately, the time or um, uh, or, or it would benefit at all our discussion if we somehow parsed out a discussion on Sacramento River temperature management amongst all this activity that's going on right now. Um, and so I think for my, my, to my mind, what I do wanna make sure is that the modeling that the NIMP Science Center is doing does get out publicly. So we do have confidence amongst everyone what we're dealing with. It sounds like we're receiving a letter tomorrow from the Sacramento River temperature, or Sacramento settlement contractors regarding temperature management. It'll be great to see what is all in there. I think what we have all said is we're we're needing to make some 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 big goals here because of the difficulty of, of the system that we find ourselves. I would just remind everyone as well that part of the, the 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 difficulty here certainly is how far in the year we already are, but also that. Um, the temperature management plan is received now from the board uh, and water transfers, et cetera. All this, all this movement in the system, there was a before April moment and then an after where an, a whole of, again, over 500,000 acre feet appeared in the projects. And so I think from, to my mind, it's why this, this does kick us into a different space and why, you know, for everyone, and I know the difficulty on the system is where does that leave? both you know, a lot of obligations and agreements that were there based on a hydrology that isn't there anymore and how we're gonna balance out that system. Um, yeah, I, I, guess I will actually stick to what I just said and I, I guess I don't have too much more to add. 
but just uh, do open up to my fellow board colleagues. Here's the opportunity to, you know, give some direction as well to our, our folks as they're engaging with all the state agencies. Um, this is our collective space in decision making. Uh, but I've done my best these last weeks to try to shepherd along and, and create the space here um, for what I hope is uh, just our, our best shot. And again, it's as wet as it's going to be right now. The, it doesn't get any easier any day or week from here. And so um, we're all needing to best assess, know there's no perfect tool and, and uh, find where we land and start to, to manage uh, in real time in the, the, the days and weeks and months ahead. Colleagues, anything further? Vice Chair, I invite you, yes. please. I don't know what I did, but I've got a pin. I, I think I, there we go. I think I clicked something incorrectly. Um, thank you, Chair Esquivel. I just want to thank you um, and your leadership. Of course, we don't all know exactly, uh, you know, all the shuttle diplomacy that's been going on um, over the last week. Um, and of course, we're not um, able to speak to each other. So I, I just do want to use this opportunity to be very um, um, general in my comments, let's just say that, which is what I was attempting to do earlier as well. Um, so again, thank you for your leadership. And I want to thank all the agencies for spending a lot of time on this. My main concern um, has already been addressed in that we don't have any one piece of this standing out on its own that is not considering the other components. And so the, the integration uh, is exactly uh, what I was hoping for, and I'm very much appreciative of that. But I also want to use this as an opportunity that we can't use, you know, at another time to just uh, continue to raise um, some concerns that I have, specifically um, on temperature. Um, I, th th getting the modeling information out, I think, would be helpful. I'm anxious to read the letter from the settlement contractors. Um, and really am just hopeful that we can add in that additional piece of where there are incremental um, changes in the targets, what that means on um, mortality, recognizing that these are, these are models. We don't have accurate models, so there's going to be a range. I'm not looking for anything precise. So I, I concur with what you've said there, but you know, really wanting to just better understand those ranges and where that fits in the context of um, redirected impacts to other beneficial uses. Um, I am particularly um, uh, anxious to see what the um, whole, the, the uh, delay in transfers means um, at, for fall run and also the ability for uh, that water to actually be utilized um, as a uh, uh, lawn um, from the uh, San Luis um, Water District and uh, Joe Del Bosque mentioned. And so those are areas that um, I'm anxious to hear more about. I continue to be concerned about the call on Friant, even though I've been told that it doesn't appear that there would be a call on Friant just because of those, um, the, the potential there for the um, uh, sort of cascading effects um, on um, the exchange contractors, refuge water supplies, um, groundwater, overdraft, and drinking water, loss of wells. So it sounds like um, it's okay in that area, but I, it's such an important um, issue with potentially devastating impacts. That's something that I'd like to look at. And then lastly, um, on the issue of, I believe the NIMPS letter refers to targets. Director Bonham referred to targets. I think others did as well. And um, uh, I'd be concerned about an actual requirement. Um, so that's just something that I'd like to flag um, in light of the fact that, um, again, we're not in an area where we can entirely count on precision um, and potential for enforcement and other issues. And uh, with targets, you know, maybe we can get more on the table from those that could submit additional voluntary measures. So those are my thoughts. I think today was it was long, but it was really helpful. I took a lot of notes and I look forward to further updates. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Really appreciate the, the good thoughts. And, and to my mind, um, just to flag, you know, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of rearranging going on in the system because of this hole that was found, right? And, and what it means for then the operation of the projects, what was assumed to be things like meeting environmental standards. And I wanna just make sure we're, we're very understanding and aware, what are those impacts already? And then as opposed to what, what impact is further generated by where we leave Shasta in that system. And I think the difficulty is it's not that precise of a system, but I think the importance here, particularly for us around the consequence of our balancing is like what's what in there? Because I think I've heard at least different things. So, um, you know, just a little exactness, I think from everybody. And again, I think this gets back to the desire to have the better accounting so that we know what's happening in the system. How is it that these activities, both on the curtailment, relaxation of environmental standards, which, you know, as Chuck said for, you know, that and uh, salinity barriers aren't, you know, they're not desired in here, but we're all saying these are things we're having to do in order to meet these big goals, like keep more up, uh, not just for this year, but for next year in Shasta, but also Oroville and Folsom. And it's yeah. really kind of driving toward that. So. Yeah. And, and I'm sorry, but there was one, two things that I forgot to mention. One is just a plea to everybody, please uh, bring us your ideas to the workshop on Friday. Um, I, I, I think our staff is doing a really good job, but um, there's a lot of really um, bright folks out there that have been working on uh, water rights and curtailments for a number of years. So whether it's voluntary agreements or different approaches, um, I, I'm convinced that we need to move quickly in this area. So um, looking for good suggestions. And then uh, the other piece, uh, which was also why I, I had mentioned uh, the issue of targets, um, temperature, if we were in silos, which I'm so glad we're not, but if we were looking at temperature management on strictly on the temperature issues, but we're trying to look more broadly on carryover storage being better prepared next year. And so again, you know, wanting to really, um, if we were to confine things, then, you know, maybe just on temperature, maybe I'd feel more comfortable with an actual requirement, but because we're looking at broader issues, you know, beyond temperature, uh, I think I'd be more comfortable in the space of targets. Thank you for that extra time. Of course, no, thank you, Vice Chair, appreciate it. Board Member McGuire. Yeah, uh, thank you. <clears throat> it certainly has been a, a long day, um, but very, am I too loud? Oh, but um, <laughs> it, it's been a long day, but um, certainly a lot of very helpful insight and information and, and context from everybody, from the agencies, from stakeholders. And I thank you for all of that and for sticking around with us. Um, I'll, I'm predominantly, I concur with Vice Chair Diadamo's comments and her concerns just about wanting to better understand uh, redirected impacts, uh, wanting to better understand um, temperature mortality ranges and just the uncertainty inherent in the decisions that we um, imminently have to make here. I think it is important just to, for sake of transparency, to have all that out there um, so everyone can see it. Um, and then just with, with the last comment there on um, carryover targets versus um, requirements, I'm, you know, that's an area that I, I need to understand better um, in terms of, you know, our authorities and where we need to be um, taking action. Um, I think with regard to temperature, you know, that's certainly one um, where, um, you know, as we're looking at temperature management, we have um, made historical water rights orders in that area. Um, we've established rules. And so our decision is predominantly on that, in that space about protecting the fishery, um, about, you know, managing temperatures. Um, I share all the concerns about carryover, about thinking about next year, about the likelihood that this could be another, uh, a third dry year. Um, and all these impacts could just, I think, um, Paul Sousa mentioned it could be, you know, a factor of 10 worse uh, next next year. And I I can appreciate the um, the urgency then and, and you know and, and um, the need to carefully think through, you know, not just Shasta, but all the reservoirs in the system. And um, you know, what carryover storages are appropriate for for those contingency measures. And I think we even heard today about Friant uh, about how there's temperature concerns on that reservoir. And actually I don't really think about 
the temperature issues on, on Frank, but that's something that I put a pin in to, to get a little bit better understanding of the trade-offs that might be there if there's, for example, a call on Fran or other actions that might add um, concerns to that reservoir. So I want to also just talk about our, our staff for a second, and I just want to say um, thank you uh, to everyone who I know is active. Probably um, even right now while we're, we're talking here, they're probably working on a lot of these issues that we're discussing. And I know that um, you've all been working late nights and weekends and putting in exhaustive amounts of effort. And um, I really appreciate all of your contributions so far. And I know we have a long ways to go, but I just, I didn't want today to pass without you, you know, me acknowledging uh, the work that you're doing and all the contributions that, you know, we, our board members, we rely on our staff of 2000 plus to give us your expertise and uh, insight. And, um, you know, so much of what you do is just really critical to us, you know, making ultimately our, our decisions, which are, are hard in and of themselves. Um, so that's my accolade. And then my ask is um, there's clearly a, a consensus around needing to be incredibly proactive in making decisions about curtailments this year. And what I heard is in particular, I think in the Sacramento water, River watershed, I'm a little uh, less clear about the San Joaquin River uh, watershed at this point. Um, I appreciate the need for transparency and that these things take time and that there's a public workshop on Friday. Um, my ask is just that as soon as reasonably feasible after that date, um, whatever that nearest date is, that we have our data, um, our, our facts in place, and we're co reasonably confident that the method is sound, um, we need to take action. And I just want to leave it at that. And I know, um, you know different dates in June have been bandied about, um, but everything that I've seen has suggested that it could be in any, t any time. So um, then, you know, I also just wanted to mention that the back on Sac Sacramento River temperature management, uh, it sounded like CSPA actually is also preparing a comment letter. Um, so I, I look forward to both, you know, the Sacramento River Settlement Contractors letter as well as CSPA. <clears throat> and in particular, the comments about um, the trade-offs with managing the Trinity system, um, that, that, that is a component of um, water rights order 90-5 and so you know that's the area that I want to better understand here um, and not lose sight of the those you know other redirected impacts and trade-offs that we might have to make um, just recognizing the the really um, equally critical concerns in the climate river basin this year as well and uh, the last comment I'll make is just on <clears throat> I appreciate all the commenters on discussing harmful algal blooms and their concerns about their pro proliferation and how, yes, in all likelihood, we're going to see more of those this year. We've been witnessing this as climate change has continued to progress. Um, and just an acknowledgement that there's, there are some knobs here. I mean, there's, there's flows, um, there's temperature, which we have some modest control over at some certain times, but not, not all the time. We can't control air temperature. Um, and then there's what the water quality components, which are nutrient sources. And so that's the other piece I will say that, you know, the board, um, our you know, staff is looking at moving forward with, you know, policy enhancements down the road. You know, these are longer term actions, but we are looking at this. Obviously, you know, resources are, have been an issue there as well, but <clears throat> um, it, you know, is certainly going to be a focus area going forward. So I think I'll leave it at that for, for now. And thank you all. Thank you, board member, for your good comments and just echo your thanks. Um, I've been uh, reticent and I mean, I've been needing, I wasn't reticent, I would say, I've been needing to um, to make sure and thank as well. And um, so thank you for, for making sure to acknowledge what is an incredible amount of work that goes on behind the scenes, both to make this uh, meeting happen as smooth as they possibly can, but also uh, just the actual work on the policy side for us. So echo your thanks and thank you for acknowledging. Board member Firestone. Um, yeah, I am not going to be as articulate as everybody else. I'm pretty fried because I found this incredibly um, helpful for me. Um, and I think I uh, just really appreciate the time that um, 
you know, folks put in and that leadership put in to come here today to talk about it, that um, stakeholders and leadership have been, and our staff have been putting in to just work through this every day, try and figure out how we're gonna um, respond and understand our options um, and to be able to help us, you know, inform good decisions. I agree that um, I think there's, I, I think we all agree that there's incredible urgency here and that there's, um, you know, I, I do think we need to take actions on curtailments um, as quickly as, as reasonably feasible. Um, I am concerned about, um, uh, I just think we need to be moving forward, um, planning and expecting the worst. And I think um, we need to be prudent in our, and, and relatively conservative in our assumptions on what um, may happen next in terms of um, informing how we how we come down. And I just, I, I think today was great. I mean, I love these public meetings because I just, it is so real how um, the different, just every aspect of our um, our state and users and ecosystems, like we're, this is going to be bad on everybody. Um, and I hear some, like I, I hear also the, well, it's going to be worse for some than for others. Um, but I do think at the end of the day, this is bad. Um, we're going to all have to be figuring out how how we get through it. Um, and I guess I just, you know, keep coming back to what we can do in our part at the water board um, is both, I think, what staff are doing in terms of digging in with everybody, all the other state agencies, um, really digging into the science and models and shared information and talking with folks about what we can do. Um, but also, I think we need to be not afraid to, to use our, um, our authority because that's our responsibility. And I think if we don't, then um, we're gonna be in much worse shape down the road or potentially. Um, and, you know, there's, we're gonna have to mitigate impacts to on, on lots of different levels, no matter what this year. And um, I think we saw, I mean, I, I just appreciate learning for myself more about the all the mitigation and sort of options around ecosystem um, impacts and the sort of compounding nature of things. Um, and also the, uh, you know, I, I know very well that there, there are real um, economic and community and job impacts from, um, from changes that ag has to make. And, um, and water supply impacts that are indirect for communities because I, you know, especially down in the valley, you move to groundwater um, pumping. And those are really real. Um, and uh, I, you know, we're there's gonna be impacts. I just, there's, it's not like um, if we do something different. Um, we're going to avoid all these impacts. And so I just hope that one of the things we can be doing is not just, is, is also coming together to look at what kind of mitigation programs we can provide for our most vulnerable communities and species. Um, because they're going to be impacted the hardest. And um, I think there's things that we can do in the short term while we um, you know, make the kind of conservative and hard decisions that we need to make. And then also um, just really try to accelerate these sort of structural changes in terms of ensuring we can do the accounting, the forecasting, having the, the regulatory tools to be able to take action faster, um, the kinds of structures in place, um, Sigma, I mean, there's, there's a lot we need to really accelerate. Um, and so, yeah, just thanks for everybody. Um, and thanks for uh, just all the leadership also from my fellow board members on this.
And thank you as well. Um, it, it really is our collective leadership space here uh, and, and just thankful for all that uh, each of you brings as a, a unique perspective to I know what is a complicated space for the entire state, let alone for us here, but just appreciate um, the collegiality and the, the attention to the outcomes. Um, and I know there's a lot of false you know, dichotomies that kind of get brought up. It's either or, it always feels like, you know, at least when it comes to us, and you know the the way things are sometimes framed out, um, but um, I know that that's not the spirit we all understand our work to be. And it's actually just for me. And again, there's these big outcomes, and whether it's a regulatory path or a voluntary path, it's all based on the same data and good decision making amongst us all, trying to get to really difficult outcomes. And so, um, just know we're here to continue to be as informed as we possibly can by everyone's uh, positions, interests, and and perspectives and uh, collectively try to just be the best decision makers we can be amongst us. And knowing that particularly in this drought, it's at the local level that incredible decisions are being made already, balancing understanding of, of supplies and resources. And we're here to facilitate a continuum from that local level through the state and the federal government to say, let's, let's manage through this. It is a crisis, um, and it's, but it's indicative of crises we'll continue to face. So let's get to it. Um, and we have a different uh, opportunity. We're in a different century, different generations amongst us in this work, um, some um, from longer in it than others, but I think collectively it's, it isn't just about the opportunity we have to be better decision makers off of 21st century tools and information. And it's not lost on me that, you know, for, I know for, and I heard it as well, that we're actually in a worse place than we were last time and or a feeling like it's just deja vu, but I really do see advancements I really do see just in the tools that this board has in this decision that we didn't have uh, in the last drought. And so, um, and again, it's not perfect and it doesn't spit out some magic solution that doesn't allow for any pain in a year like this, but at least we can do our best job to try to balance out those many different factors. So thank you. And it is just this collective space amongst us um, here as a board, but more importantly as a state that um, we'll do our best and try to get through it. So I, you know, I will, you know, certainly I don't want to speak because I have not asked the directors to come back to the, at our next board meeting, but I think it'll be important to maybe just have a, a touch point, come back and uh, just a, maybe some follow up. But I don't, I, I want to say now, I don't want to surprise those directors and there may be scheduling things, but we'll need to be all continuing to circle back. And I know at this point there is weekly meetings at that director, director level, let alone the staff happening at the work happening at the program level amongst staff um, to feed what are these difficult choices all amongst us. So just thank you again. I'll just, uh, I believe that ends uh, that item. Thank you, drought item number five um, and appreciate everyone's incredible flexibility today as we try to land uh, calendars for the directors and, and also handle uh, other discussions like once through cooling uh, policies and um, informational items on the LA River and urban conservation. And there's a lot and there will continue to be a lot. So I just appreciate everyone. And so then we'll move on now. We'll, we've, we've thankfully, and thank you again, Vice Chair for quickly um, uh, uh, managing uh, the meeting and actually getting our last informational item done before this. So we just have board member reports and the executive director's report, and then we can uh, go all have dinner and have a, a good rest of the evening and day. Board member reports, I, as you can see, I think of this is a lot of what my report would have been. It is just this work that we've been working on. Um, I don't believe I have any uh, public speaking engagements come uh, in, in the last two weeks to really uh, highlight. So just um, that's my report. Thank you. Other board members. I just have one item to report on. Um, last week at Aqualist Conference, um, I chaired a panel of uh, three distinguished uh, guests, uh, Michael George, Alan Lilly, and Eric Ekdahl. And uh, we were there to talk about, actually, this was um, a, a request came my way uh, before we knew um, about the uh, dire situation that we would be in. And so it was uh, quite a timely uh, topic to talk about uh, water rights 
and drought. And so uh, we focused quite a bit on the curtailment issues and then um, the aqua wanted to uh, receive an update. So of course we provided information about Friday's workshop and then um, they were anxious to hear our thoughts about voluntary agreements. And so of course, um, uh, all three speakers did a really good job talking about uh, potential areas for voluntary agreements or um, uh, collaboration at a minimum. So it's a good workshop. Fantastic. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you for doing that. It's, it was uh, it was great to see that that panel actually, um, and I really appreciate your good leadership and and all of that. It is again, I can help but feel that you know what uh, Sigma was to uh, the last drought, certainly water rights in this drought um, continue to hear and uh, appreciate everyone's uh, good focus on the need to have a, a system in place that will continue to work and allow us to adapt to climate change. So thank you, Vice Chair. Other board members? Yeah, I, I, I didn't make any public um, presentations other than my uh, board, uh, state board liaison reports to the Los Angeles region and Manhattan regional boards. And um, I'll ju I just wanted to say that they're both very interested in drought issues. And so part of the discussion was about, you know, they were reacting from the governor's proclamation and just wondering, you know, how, because the regions largely weren't covered in the, in the proclamation and wondering how that then affected their regions and what they should be doing. And so I talked about messaging and some of the things I, I brought up this morning um, about water use efficiency and, and Things, steps that we can all be taking to just get prepared. Um, but just wanted to flag that we have lots of folks at, at the water boards generally that are interested in, in helping and, and doing their part as well. And then uh, one of the board members um, also brought up um, and reminded me of the impacts of ongoing um, unauthorized um, cannabis diversions. Um, and in this case, it was in the Mojave River watershed area it won't get specific, but just that, you know, this, this is an ongoing challenge that we all face. And that program I know has been also challenged with funding and resources, like so many other programs that we have. But I think, um, you know, just thinking about the North Coast area and its drought challenges this year and knowing how many thousands and thousands and thousands of um, cannabis cultivations I know still remain in that area, that's just, um, and, and then in this case was the conversation was about the Mojave River area, but um, those impacts will be seen in streams, especially now in, ta in you know in times of you know dry low flows. I think they will be measurable and noticed. And so just want to flag that I, you know we'll be looking to hear more information about what we can do to address some of those concerns as well. I know there's a lot going on. I get it, um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thinking through uh, our cannabis. Uh, responsibilities as well. Thank you, board member. Uh, let's see, a couple, I I was on a PPIC panel on drought, on are we prepared for the drought? And um, I, you know, it was recorded before the governor's, um, you know, newest drought proclamation. So um, I feel like we should talk about it again now because I think a lot has changed. Um, it's incredible how quickly I, things get stale at I this know. point. I feel like I would highlight very different things um, just a week later. So um, uh, two things, I guess, one, just to highlight, I mean, a huge thing in my mind, um, in addition to drought, has been the budget um, proposal from the governor and specific, I mean, there's so much in there, <laughs> but specifically there was a billion dollars um, for water debt relief um, that was um, proposed by the governor. Uh, also a billion dollars that had been proposed by the Senate prior to that um, for debt relief. Um, and uh, at least in the, the governor's budget, it looks like that would be coming to the state board to administer if, um, if that's in the final budget. So that's a huge deal for us, um, incredibly important and exciting to have, and also something brand new for um, for us to try to figure out um, as a board how to do justice to that kind of funding and need. Um, and then, you know, I think equally um, is 
is the um, investment in um, the, there was so much there, but in particular 1.3 billion for drinking water um, infrastructure, drinking water and wastewater infrastructure, um, particularly for disadvantaged communities, um, just I think really builds off of the good work that um, everyone did on the needs assessment and really trying to highlight um, you know, where needs are and um, what the funding needs are and what the sort of pathway is to actually solving this crisis and being able to have that, I think meant that we can be looking at um, prioritizing that and targeting those investments when we're in this unique time where there's money that can be dedicated to it. So um, ex again, excited for that. And also, um, you know, uh, worrying about the challenge of how to make sure we can we can do justice to that um, commitment and need and um, uh, so those are those are really top of mind in addition to drought. Um, I, one thing I didn't mention, um, but I just wanted to bring up because I've been asking staff about it. Um, but it just it's probably in relation to the drought item that we just discussed, but is really looking at. Um, uh, reporting enforcement and water rates reporting enforcement to make sure that we do have adequate data and not just enforcement of exist, you know, existing requirements. Did you file a report? Also improving the quality of that and just making sure that we have that data as a state, not just as an agency, but as a state. Um, I think this I also just feel like you, you know, for me personally, I look at what um, is happening in the urban uh, water sector um, and just feeling like we need to have, you know, a similar level of accounting in um, throughout the state in terms of water use. And I just, I, I feel like that's really urgent and given where we are today and what we know this is, um, this new normal is, I just don't see how we can do our job and manage the state without that kind of data. And I think we need to do everything we can to make sure that we're getting it as a state. So I've been really interested in and, and appreciate the work that staff has been doing and just trying to um, dig through what we have, uh, look at how to get there. And um, yeah, so that, that, those are things I'll highlight. <laughs> Thank you so much, board member. Yeah, I think, you know, for all the sobering information, certainly that and discussion that we had today, um, we're also in this incredible moment where we have generational reinvestment happening in our water systems and the governor's budget is a down payment for what is a national discussion around how we how we transition our water systems. How do we actually uh, prepare them for the reality of the climate that they're in now um, and do so quickly because we were already behind the ball I think as some had indicated, even in the last century. Um, and so we're, we're, we're accounting for an aging infrastructure and a climate that doesn't exist anymore. And those investments are just, we're, they're, they're a slight silver lining should, certainly to this. And I think that it should drive the sort of the, the real imperative and, and sense of urgency to continue to make those investments and see the water sector as critical at the federal level as transportation and other things that receive this, this important investment uh, societally because we need them, these systems. So anyway, thank you. And thank you for letting me just crib and add on top too. Um, Executive Director Sobek, I think that brings us to item number 10, your, your Executive Director's Report, which is always incredibly thorough. Um, it's, also, it's also dated, even though it was only put together a few days ago. Um, I mean, I just think this has been one of those one of those weeks, and thank you, Board Member uh, Firestone, for bringing up the budget item. It's kind of, it, it says something about the urgency of our drought work that we didn't mention the three, you know, close to three billion dollars that the Water Board is maybe getting in the May revise, or well, at least in the in the government's uh, in the governor's budget. Um, we went from really frantic, prep, you know, um, preparing the budget materials. Um, last week, it was announced by the governor um, on Friday, and then the legislative hearing started today. There was a, a hearing this morning in the Senate, a tomorrow in the Assembly. Um, so there has not been 
um, a moment's a moment's pause. Um, you you guys are absolutely right. That's sort of the good news story of of what the board's work is going to be this summer. But it's coming at exactly the same time um, that we really have to redirect a lot of resources to um, the drought work. It is going to put a burden on um, staff throughout the state board um, this some especially this summer as we're standing up these new big programs and trying to be responsive and getting ahead of drought, because we all know that responding to emergencies, the more you can do up front, the better. Um, we're probably already, we've already lost that race in a lot of important ways. So um, it's really gonna be important for all of us, both staff and with guidance from you all to figure out how to best prioritize um, our work and make sure that we, um, you know, are, we're, we're successful um, on both fronts, both responding to drought and getting these important, really fantastic and important financial resources out to um, the people of California. Um, and um, so we're going to be working on that. I, and I'm just going to leave you with saying that we're going to try to figure out ways to keep you updated in a, on all of these matters in, an, in, in a, as efficient a manner as possible. Obviously, we're going to have to touch base one on one on a lot of issues. But for some of the, there's a lot going on. We'll try to have a section in the, um, the monthly executive director's report where we pull together um, um, drought related items. We'll try to have, um, we do have a standing um, drought info item at every board meeting. We'll try to bring you some quick um, updates on things that are going on <clears throat> so that you can be kept current. Um, we'll try to have some regular internal um, updates for you as well. And then obviously we will try to respond to any um, specific specific items for individual board members that aren't covered in those more general communications. So thank you for being patient during um, what was a pretty busy week or two for staff. Thank you as well. I know there's just an incredible amount going on. So just double, double up on uh, board member McGuire's thanks of just everybody uh, just really pulling in incredible ways and sacrificing weekends, sacrificing Mother's Days um, and uh, really helping us all um, just do what we need to do. And so and it's appreciated and not lost uh, that that's it's in a significant ask that we um, we make of our folks and just appreciate it. OK. I think that that's that's the end of our agenda. And so I think that brings us to the end of, of our day here. I just want to thank everyone again for their work, uh, patience. It has been a long day, but uh, we've gotten a, long done, a lot done and a lot of discussion uh, taking place. And so our next board meeting will be on June 1st. Um, and so uh, at that, and I will, I will, I want to make sure and just flag that the temporary urgency change petitions and the Sacramento River temperature management plan are, those are, are signed and, and administered at the executive director level. There's no vote that the board takes on those. We will be taking votes uh, when we institute curtailments. That is something that needs to come to us for a vote. So um, we will come back on June 1st, as you have, as I, I think we communicated clearly, these things need to be wrapped up before then. So uh, do know that a lot of work will be going on before that next board meeting. I think it's important to come back and communicate where everything is and more importantly, uh, how we continue to, to see the summer ahead and just bring everyone along in that decision-making. So please do uh, get letters to us regarding the plan, temperature management plan, the temporary urgency change petitions, and uh, engage in our curtailment process and workshop on Friday, um, where again, we're, we're trying to move quickly, but we're moving quickly with public comment and input as best we can, because we really, we depend upon that as decision makers, everybody's contribu contribution to that shared space of ours. So thank you. And Chair Escobar. Yes, I, please, Vice Chair. I, I just thought I'd uh, mention uh, the curtailments would only come to us for a vote if we adopted a regulation. True, yes, that's the, that's yes, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, when it comes to the board's emergency regulation authorities that were granted through the executive order, that's when the board would have to adopt something that is different than our process otherwise, which we're moving quickly and through. So thank you uh, again, and thank you for that uh, clarification, important vice chair. And uh, we'll all see you then uh, June 1st and have plenty of discussion to see you even before then. So thanks again to everybody. Have a good rest of your evening and we will see you in two weeks. Uh, this meeting's adjourned. Thanks all. Thank you, Mr. Lawfer.